Section 1 of Short Science Fiction Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler, Lake Placid, Florida. The Blind Man's World by Edward Bellamy. 1898. The narrative to which this note is introductory was found among the papers of the late Professor S. Erasmus Larrabee, and, as an acquaintance of the gentleman to whom they were bequeathed, I was requested to prepare it for publication. This turned out a very easy task, for the document proved of so extraordinary a character that, if published at all, it should obviously be without change. It appears that the professor did really, at one time in his life, have an attack of vertigo, or something of the sort, under circumstances similar to those described by him, and to that extent his narrative may be found on fact. How soon it shifts from that foundation, or whether it does at all, the reader must conclude for himself. It appears certain that the professor never related to anyone, while living, the stranger features of the experience here narrated. But this might have been merely from fear that his standing as a man of science would be thereby injured. The Professor's Narrative At the time of the experience of which I am about to write, I was Professor of Astronomy and Higher Mathematics at Abercrombie College. Most astronomers have a specialty, and mine was the study of the planet Mars, our nearest neighbor, but one in the sun's little family. When no important celestial phenomena in other quarters demanded attention, it was on the ruddy disk of Mars that my telescope was oftenest focused. I was never weary of tracing the outlines of its continents and seas, its capes and islands, its bays and straits, its lakes and mountains. With intense interest I watched from week to week of the martial winter of the advance of the polar ice cap toward the equator, and its corresponding retreat in the summer, testifying across the gulf of space as plainly as written words to the existence on that orb of a climate like our own. A specialty is always in danger of becoming an infatuation, and my interest in Mars at the time of which I write had grown to be more than strictly scientific. The impression of the nearness of this planet, heightened by the wonderful distinctness of its geography as seen through a powerful telescope, appealed strongly to the imagination of the astronomer. On fine evenings I used to spend hours, not so much critically observing as brooding over its radiant surface, till I could almost persuade myself that I saw the breakers dashing on the bold shore of Kepler land and heard the muffled thunder of avalanches descending the snow-clad mountains of Mitchell. No earthly landscape had the charm to hold my gaze of that far-off planet, whose oceans, to the unpractised eye, seem but darker, and its continents lighter, spots and bands. Astronomers have agreed in declaring that Mars is undoubtedly inhabitable, by beings like ourselves, but, as may be supposed, I was not in a mood to be satisfied with considering it merely habitable. I allowed no sort of question that it was inhabited. What manner of beings these inhabitants might be I found a fascinating speculation. The variety of types appearing in mankind even on this small earth makes it most presumptuous to assume that the deisons of different planets may not be characterized by diversities far profounder wherein such diversities, coupled with a general resemblance to man, might consist, whether in mere physical differences or in different mental laws, the lack of certain of the great passional motors of men or the possessions of quite others, were weird themes of never-failing attractions for my mind. The El Dorado visions with which the virgin mystery of the New World inspired the early Spanish explorers were tame and prosaic compared with the speculations which it was perfectly legitimate to indulge when the problem was the conditions of life on another planet. It was the time of the year when Mars is most favorably situated for observation, and, anxious not to lose an hour of the precious season, I had spent the greater part of several successive nights in the observatory. 
I believed that I had made some original observation as to the trend of the coast of Kepler land between Lagrange Peninsula and Christie Bay, and it was to this spot that my observations were particularly directed. On the fourth night other work detained me from the observing chair till after midnight. When I had adjusted the instrument and took my first look at Mars, I remember being unable to restrain a cry of admiration. The planet was fairly dazzling. It seemed nearer and larger than I had ever seen it before, and its peculiar ruddiness more striking. In thirty years of observations, I recall, in fact, no occasion when the absence of exhalations in our atmosphere has coincided with such cloudlessness in that of Mars as on that night. I could plainly make out the white masses of vapor at the opposite edges of the lighted disk, which are the mists of its dawn and evening. The snowy mass of Mount Hall over against Kepler land stood out with wonderful clearness, and I could unmistakably detect the blue tint of the ocean of Delarue which washes its base, a feat of vision often, indeed, accomplished by stargazers, though I had never done it to my complete satisfaction before. I was impressed with the idea that if I ever made an original discovery in regard to Mars, it would be on that evening, and I believed that I should do it. I trembled with mingled exultation and anxiety, and was obliged to pause to recover my self-control. Finally, I placed my eye to the eyepiece and directed my gaze upon the portion of the planet in which I was especially interested. My attention soon became fixed and absorbed much beyond my want when observing, and that in itself applied no ordinary degree of abstraction. To all mental intents and purposes, I was on Mars. Every faculty, every susceptibility of sense and intellect, seemed gradually to pass into the eye and become concentrated in the act of gazing. Every atom of nerve and willpower combined in the strain to see a little, and yet a little, and yet a little, clearer, far, deeper. The next thing I knew I was on the bed that stood in a corner of the observing room, half raised on an elbow, and gazing intently at the door. It was broad daylight. Half a dozen men, including several of the professors and a doctor from the village, were around me. Some were trying to make me lie down, others were asking me what I wanted, while the doctor was urging me to drink some whiskey. Mechanically repelling their offices, I pointed to the door and ejaculated, President Bixby, coming, giving the impression to the one idea which my dazed mind at that moment contained. And sure enough, even as I spoke, the door opened, and the venerable head of the college, somewhat blown with climbing the steep stairway, stood on the threshold. With a sensation of prodigious relief, I fell back on my pillow. It appeared that I had swooned while in the observing chair the night before, and had been found by the janitor in the morning, my head fallen forward on the telescope, as if still observing but my body cold, rigid, pulseless, and apparently dead. In a couple of days I was all right again, and should soon have forgotten the episode but for a very interesting conjecture which had suggested itself in connection with it. This was nothing less than that, while I lay in that swoon, I was in a conscious state outside and independent of the body, and in that state received impressions and exercised perceptive powers. For this extraordinary theory I had no other evidence than the fact of my knowledge in the moment of awakening that President Bixby was coming up the stairs. But slight as this clue was, it seemed to me unmistakable in its significance. That knowledge was certainly in my mind on the instant of arousing from the swoon. It certainly could have not been there before I fell into the swoon. I must therefore have gained it in the meantime. That is to say, I must have been in a conscious, percipient state while my body was insensible. If such had been the case, I reasoned that it was altogether unlikely that the trivial impression was to President Bixby had been the only one which I had received in that state. It was far more probable that it had remained over in my mind 
on waking from the swoon merely because it was the latest of a series of impressions received while outside the body these impressions were of a kind most strange and startling seeing that they were those of a disembodied soul exercising faculties more spiritual than those of the body i could not doubt the desire to know what they had been grew upon me till it became a longing which left me no repose it seemed intolerable that i should have secrets from myself that my soul should withhold its experiences from my intellect i would gladly have consented that the acquisitions of half my waking lifetime should be blotted out if so be in exchange i might be shown the record of what i had seen and known during those hours of which my waking memory showed no trace none the less for the conviction of its hopelessness but rather all the more as the perversity of our human nature will have it the longing for this forbidden lore grew on me till the hunger of eve in the garden was mine constantly brooding over desire that i felt to be vain tantalized by the possession of a clue which only mocked me my physical condition became at length affected my health was disturbed and my rest at night was broken a habit of walking in my sleep from which i had not suffered since childhood recurred and caused me frequent inconvenience such had been in general my condition for some time when i awoke one morning with the strangely weary sensation by which my body usually betrayed the secret of the impositions put upon it in sleep of which otherwise i should often have suspected nothing in going into the study connected with my chamber i found a number of freshly written sheets on the desk astonished that any one should have been in my rooms while i slept i was astounded on looking more closely to observe that the handwriting was my own how much more than astounded i was on reading the matter that had been set down the reader may judge if he shall peruse it for these written sheets apparently contained the longed-for but despaired of record of those hours when i was absent from my body they were the lost chapter of my life or rather not lost at all for it had been no part of my waking life but a stolen chapter stolen from that sleep memory on whose mysterious tablets may well be inscribed tales as much more marvellous than this as this is stranger than most stories it will be remembered that my last recollection before waking in my bed on the morning after the swoon was of contemplating the coast of kepler land with an unusual concentration of attention as well as i can judge and that is no better than any one else it is the moment that my bodily power succumbed and i became unconscious that the narrative which i found on my desk begins even had i not come as straight and swift as the beam of light that made my path a glance about would have told me to what part of the universe i had fared no earthly landscape could have been more familiar i stood on the high coast of kepler land where it trends southward a brisk westerly wind was blowing and the waves of the ocean of de Labu were thundering at my feet while the broad blue waters of christie bay stretched away to the southwest against the northern horizon rising out of the ocean like a summer thunderhead for which i at first mistook it towered the far distant snowy summit of mount hall even had the configuration of land and sea been less familiar i should none the less have known that i stood on the planet whose ruddy hue is at once the admiration and puzzle of astronomers its explanation i now recognized in the tint of the atmosphere a colour incomparable to the haze of indian summer except that its hue was a faint rose instead of purple like the indian summer haze it was impalpable and without impeding the view bathed all objects near and far in a glamour not to be described as the gaze turned upward however the deep blue of space so far overcame the roseate tint that one might fancy he were still on earth as i looked about me i saw many men women and children they were in no respect dissimilar so far as i could see to the men women and the children of the earth save for something almost childlike in the untroubled serenity of their faces 
unfurrowed as they were by any trace of care, of fear, or of anxiety. This extraordinary youthfulness of aspect made it difficult indeed, save by careful scrutiny, to distinguish the young from the middle-aged, maturity from advanced years. Time seemed to have no tooth on Mars. I was gazing about me, admiring this crimson-lighted world, and these people who appeared to hold happiness by a tenure so much firmer than men's, when I heard the words, You are welcome, and, turning, saw that I had been accosted by a man with the stature and bearing of middle age, though his countenance, like the other faces which I had noted, wonderfully combined the strength of a man's with the serenity of a child's. I thanked him, and said, You do not seem surprised to see me, though I certainly am to find myself here. Assuredly not, he answered. I knew, of course, that I was to meet you today. And not only that, but I may say I'm already in a sense acquainted with you, through a mutual friend, Professor Edgerly. He was here last month, and I met him at that time. We talked of you and your interest in our planet. I told him I expected you. Edgerly, I exclaimed. It is strange that he has said nothing of this to me. I met him every day. But I was reminded that it was in a dream that Edgerly, like myself, had visited Mars, and on awakening had recalled nothing of his experience, just as I should recall nothing of mine. When will man learn to interrogate the dream soul of the marvels it sees in its wanderings? Then he will no longer need to improve his telescopes to find out the secrets of the universe. Do your people visit the earth in the same manner? I asked my companion. Certainly, he replied. But there we find no one able to recognize us and converse with us as I am conversing with you, although myself in the waking state. You, as yet, lack the knowledge we possess of the spiritual side of the human nature which we share with you. That knowledge must have enabled you to learn much more of the earth than we know of you, I said. Indeed it has, he replied. From visitors such as you, of whom we entertain a concourse constantly, we have acquired familiarity with your civilization, your history, your manners, and even your literature and languages. Have you not noticed that I am talking with you in English, which is certainly not a tongue indigenous to this planet? Among so many wonders I scarcely observed that, I answered. For ages, pursued my companion, we have been waiting for you to improve your telescopes so as to approximate the power of ours, after which communication between the planets would be easily established. The progress which you make is, however, so slow that we expect to wait ages yet. Indeed, I fear you will have to, I replied. Our opticians already talk of having reached the limits of their art. I do not imagine that I spoke in any spirit of petulance, my companion resumed. The slowness of your progress is not so remarkable to us as that you make any at all. "'burdened as you are by a disability so crushing "'that if we were in your place, "'I fear we should sit down in utter despair.' "'To what disability do you refer?' I asked. "'You seem to be men like us.' "'And so we are,' was the reply. "'Save in one particular. "'But there the difference is tremendous. "'In doubt otherwise like us, "'you are destitute of the faculty of foresight.' without which we should think our other faculties well-nigh valueless. Foresight, I repeated. Certainly you cannot mean that it is given to you to know the future. It is given not only to us, was the answer, but so far as we know, to all other intelligent beings of the universe except yourselves. Our positive knowledge extends only to our system of moons and planets and some of the nearer foreign systems and it is conceivable that the remoter parts of the universe may harbor other blind races like your own. But it certainly seems unlikely that so strange and lamentable a spectacle should be duplicated. One such illustration of the extraordinary deprivations under which a rational existence may still be possible ought to suffice for the universe. But no one can know the future except by inspiration of God, I said. 
all our faculties are by inspiration of god was the reply but there is surely nothing in foresight to cause it to be so regarded more than any other think a moment of the physical analogy of the case your eyes are placed in the front of your heads you would deem it an odd mistake if they were placed behind that would appear to you an arrangement calculated to defeat their purpose does it not seem equally rational that the mental vision should range forward as it does with us illuminating the path one is to take rather than backward as with you revealing only the course you have already trodden and therefore have no more concern with but it is no doubt a merciful provision of providence that renders you unable to realize the grotesqueness of your predicament as it appears to us but the future is eternal i exclaimed how can a finite mind grasp it our foreknowledge implies only human faculties was the reply it is limited to our individual careers on this planet each of us foresees the course in his own life but not that of other lives except so far as they are involved with his that such a power as you describe could be combined with merely human faculties is more than our philosophers has ever dared to dream i said and yet who shall say after all that it is not in mercy that god has denied it to us if it is a happiness as it must be to foresee one's happiness it must be most depressing to foresee one's sorrows failures yes and even one's death for if you foresee your lives to the end you must anticipate the hour and manner of your death is it not so most assuredly was the reply living would be a very precarious business were we uninformed of its limit your ignorance of the time of your death impresses us as one of the saddest features of your condition and by us i answered it is held to be one of the most merciful foreknowledge of your death would not indeed prevent your dying once continued my companion but it would deliver you from the thousand deaths you suffer through uncertainty whether you can safely count on the passing day it is not the death you die but these many deaths you do not die which shadow your existence poor blindfolded creatures that you are cringing at every step in apprehension of the stroke that perhaps is not to fail till old age never raising a cup to your lips with the knowledge that you will live to quaff it never sure that you will meet again the friend you part with for an hour from those whose hearts no happiness suffices to banish the chill of an ever-present dread what idea can you form of the godlike security with which we enjoy our lives and the lives of those we love you have a saying on earth tomorrow belongs to god but here tomorrow belongs to us even as today to you for some inscrutable purpose he sees fit to dole out life moment by moment with no assurance that each is not to be the last to us he gives a lifetime at once fifty sixty seventy years a divine gift indeed a life such as yours would i fear seem of little value to us for such a life however long is but a moment long since that is all you can count on and yet i answered though knowledge of the duration of your lives may give you an enviable feeling of confidence while the end is far off is that not more than offset by the daily growing weight with which the expectation of the end as it draws near must press upon your minds on the contrary was the response death never an object of fear as it draws near becomes more and more a matter of indifference to the moribund it is because you live in the past that death is grievous to you all your knowledge all your affections all your interests are rooted in the past and on that account as life lengthens it strengthens its hold on you and memory becomes a more precious possession we on the contrary despise the past and never dwell upon it memory with us far from being the morbid and monstrous growth it is with you is scarcely more than a rudimentary faculty we live wholly in the future and the present what with foretaste and actual taste our experiences whether pleasant or painful are exhausted of interest by the time they are past 
the accumulated treasures of memory which you relinquish so painfully in death we count no loss at all our minds being fed wholly from the future we think and feel only as we anticipate and so as the dying man's future contracts there is less and less about which he can occupy his thoughts his interest in life diminishes as the ideas which it suggests grow fewer till at last death finds him with his mind a tabula rasa as with you at birth in a word his concern with life is reduced to a vanishing point before he is called on to give it up in dying he leaves nothing behind and the after death i asked is there no fear fear of that surely was the reply it is not necessarily for me to say that a fear which affects only the more ignorant on earth is not known at all to us and would be counted blasphemous moreover as i have said our foresight is limited to our lives on this planet any speculation beyond them would be purely conjectural and our minds are repelled by the slightest taint of uncertainty to us the conjectural and the unthinkable may be called almost the same but even if you do not fear death for itself i said you have hearts to break is there no pain when the ties of love are sundered love and death are not foes on our planet was the reply there are no tears by the bedsides of our dying the same beneficent law which makes it so easy for us to give up life forbids us to mourn the friends we leave or them to mourn us with you it is the intercourse you have had with friends that is the source of your tenderness for them with us it is the anticipation of the intercourse we shall enjoy which is the foundation of fondness as our friends vanish from our future with the approach of their death the effect on our thoughts and affections is as it would be with you if you forgot them by lapse of time as our dying friends grow more and more indifferent to us we by operation of the same law of our nature become indifferent to them till at last we are scarcely more than kindly and sympathetic watchers about the beds of those who regard us equally without keen emotions so at last god gently unwinds instead of breaking the bands that bind our hearts together and makes death as painless to the surviving as to the dying relations meant to produce our happiness are not the means also of torturing us as with you love means joy and that alone to us instead of blessing our lives for a while only to desolate them later on compelling us to pay with a distinct and separate pang for every thrill of tenderness exacting a tear for every smile there are other partings than those of death are these two without sorrow for you i asked assuredly was the reply can you not see that so it must needs be with beings freed by foresight from the disease of memory all the sorrow of parting as of dying comes with you from the backward vision which precludes you from beholding your happiness till it is past suppose your life destined to be blessed by a happy friendship if you could know it beforehand it would be a joyous expectation brightening the intervening years and cheering you as you traverse desolate periods but no not till you meet the one who is to be your friend do you know of him nor do you guess even then what he is to be to you that you may embrace him at first sight your meeting is cold and indifferent it is long before fire is fairly kindled between you and then it is already time for parting now indeed the fire burns well but henceforth it must consume your heart not till they are dead or gone do you fully realize how dear your friends were and how sweet was their companionship but we we see our friends afar coming to meet us smiling already in our eyes years before our ways meet we greet them at first meeting not coldly not uncertainly but with exultant kisses in an ecstasy of joy they enter at once into the full possession of hearts long warmed and lighted for them we meet with that delirium of tenderness with which you part and when to us at last the time of parting comes it only means that we are to contribute to each other's happiness no longer we are not doomed like you in parting 
to take away with us the delight we brought our friends, leaving the ache of bereavement in its place, so that their last state is worse than their first. Parting here is like meeting with you, calm and unpassioned. The joys of anticipation and possession are the only food of love with us, and therefore love always wears a smiling face. With you he feeds on dead joys, past happiness, which are likewise the sustenance of sorrow. No wonder love and sorrow are so much alike on earth. It is a common saying among us that, were it not for the spectacle of the earth, the rest of the worlds would be unable to appreciate the goodness of God to them, and who can say that this is not the reason the piteous sight is set before us? You have told me marvelous things, I said, after I had reflected. It is, indeed, but reasonable that such a race as yours should look down with wondering pity on the earth. And yet, before I grant so much, I want to ask you one question. There is known in our world a certain sweet madness, under the influence of which we forget all that is unwanted in our lot, and would not change it for a god's. So far is this sweet madness regarded by men as a compensation, and more than a compensation, for all their miseries that if you know not love as we know it, if this loss be the price you have paid for your divine foresight, we think ourselves more favored of God than you. Confess that love, with its reserves, its surprises, its mysteries, its revelations, is necessarily incompatible with a foresight which weighs and measures every experience in advance. Of love surprises we certainly know nothing, was the reply. It is believed by our philosophers that the slightest surprise would kill beings of our constitution like lightning, though of course this is merely theory, for it is only by the study of earthly conditions that we are able to form an idea of what surprise is like. Your power to endure the constant buffetings of the unexpected is a matter of supreme amazement to us, nor, according to our ideas, is there any difference between what you call pleasant and painful surprises. You see, then, that we cannot envy you these surprises of love which you find so sweet, for to us they would be fatal. For the rest, there is no form of happiness which foresight is so well calculated to enhance as that of love. Let me explain to you how this befalls. As the growing boy begins to be sensible of the charms of woman, he finds himself, as I dare say it is with you, preferring some type of face and form to others. He dreams oftenest of fair hair, or maybe of dark, of blue eyes or brown. As the years go on, his fancy, brooding over what seems to it the best and loveliest of every type, is constantly adding to this dream face, this shadowy form, traits and lineaments, hues and contours, till at last the picture is complete, and he becomes aware that on his heart thus subtly has been depicted the likeness of the maiden destined for his arms. It may be years before he is to see her, but now begins with him one of the sweetest offices of love, one to you unknown. Youth on earth is a stormy period of passion, chafing in restraint or rioting in excess. But the very passion whose awakening makes this time so critical with you is here a reforming and educating influence, to whose gentle and potent sway we gladly confide our children. The temptations which lead our young men astray have no hold on a youth of our happy planet. He hoards the treasures of his heart for its coming mistress. Of her alone he thinks, and to her all his vows are made. The thought of license would be Tresop to his sovereign lady, whose right to all the revenues of his being he joyfully owns. To rob her, to abate her her high prerogatives, would be to impoverish, to insult himself. For she is to be his, and her honor, her glory are his own. Through all this time that he dreams of her by night and day, the exquisite reward of his devotion is the knowledge that she is aware of him as he of her, and that in the inmost shrine of a maiden heart his image is set up to receive the incense of a tenderness that needs not to restrain itself through fear of possible cross or separation. 
in due time their converging lives come together the lovers meet gaze a moment into each other's eyes then throw themselves each on the other's breast the maiden has all the charms that ever stirred the blood of an earthly lover but there is another glamour over her which the eyes of earthly lovers are shut to the glamour of the future in the blushing girl her lover sees the fond and faithful wife in the blithe maiden the patient pain consecrated mother on the virgin's breast he beholds his children he is prescient even as his lips take the first fruits of hers of the future years during which she is to be his companion his ever present solace his chief portion of god's goodness we have read some of your romances describing love as you know it on earth and i must confess my friend we find them very dull i hope he added as i did not speak at once that i shall not offend you by saying we find them also objectionable your literature possesses in general an interest for us in the picture it presents of the curiosity inverted life which the lack of foresight compels you to lead it is a study especially prized for the development of the imagination on account of the difficulty of conceiving conditions so opposed to those of intelligent beings in general but our women do not read your romances the notion that a man or woman should ever conceive the idea of marrying a person other than the one whose husband or wife he or she is destined to be is profoundly shocking to our habits of thought no doubt you will say that such instances are rare among you but if your novels are faithful pictures of your life they are at least not unknown that these situations are inevitable under the conditions of earthly life we are well aware and judge you accordingly but it is needless that the minds of our maidens should be pained by the knowledge that there anywhere exists a world where such travesties upon the sacredness of marriage are possible it is however another reason why we discourage the use of your books by our young people and that is the profound effect of sadness to a race accustomed to view all things in the morning glow of the future of a literature written in the past tense and relating exclusively to things that are ended and how do you write of things that are past except in the past tense i asked we write of the past when it is still the future and of course in the future tense was the reply if our historians were to wait till after the events to describe them not alone would nobody care to read about things already done but the histories themselves would probably be inaccurate for memory as i have said is a very slightly developed faculty with us and quite too indistinct to be trustworthy should the earth ever establish communications with us you will find our histories of interest for our planet being smaller cooled and was peopled ages before yours and our astronomical records contain minute accounts of the earth from the time it was a fluid mass your geologists and biologists may yet find a mine of information here in the course of our further conversation it came out that as a consequence of foresight some of the commonest emotions of human nature are unknown on mars they for whom the future has no mystery can of course know neither hope nor fear moreover every one being assured that he shall attain to and what not there can be no such thing as rivalship or emulation or any sort of competition in any respect and therefore all the brood of heart burnings and hatreds engendered on earth by the strife of man with man is unknown to the people of mars save from the study of our planet when i asked if there were not after all a lack of spontaneity of sense of freedom in leading lives fixed in all details beforehand i was reminded that there was no difference in that respect between the lives of the people of earth and of mars both alike being according to god's will in every particular we knew that will only after the event they before that was all for the rest god moved them through their wills as he did us so that they had no more dents of compulsion in what they did than we on earth have in carrying out an anticipated line of action in cases where our anticipations chance to be correct 
of the absorbing interest which the study of the plan of their future lives possessed for the people of Mars, my companion spoke eloquently. It was, he said, like the fascination to a mathematician of a most elaborate and exquisite demonstration, a perfect algebraical equation, with the glowing realities of life in place of figures and symbols. When I asked if it never occurred to them to wish their futures different, he replied that such a question could only have been asked by one from earth. No one could have foresight or clearly believe that God had it, without realizing that the future is as incapable of being changed as the past. And not only this, but to foresee events was to foresee their logical necessity so clearly that to desire them different was as impossible as seriously to wish that two and two make five instead of four. No person could ever thoughtfully wish anything different, for so closely are all things, the small with the great, woven together by God that to draw out the smallest thread would unravel creation through all eternity. While we had talked, the afternoon had waned, and the sun had sunk below the horizon, the roseate atmosphere of the planet imparting a splendor to the cloud coloring, and a glory to the land and seascape never paralleled by an earthly sunset. Already the familiar constellations appearing in the sky reminded me how near, after all, I was to the earth, for with the unassisted eye I could not detect the slightest variation in their position. Nevertheless, there was one wholly novel feature in the heavens, for many of the host of asteroids which circle in the zone between Mars and Jupiter were vividly visible to the naked eye. But the spectacle that chiefly held my gaze was the earth, swimming low on the verge of the horizon. Its disk, twice as large as that of any star or planet as seen from the earth, flashed with a brilliancy like that of Venus. It is indeed a lovely sight, said my companion, although to me always a melancholy one from the contrast suggested between the radiance of the orb and the benighted condition of its inhabitants. We call it the blind man's world. As he spoke, he turned toward a curious structure which stood near us, though I had not before particularly observed it. What is that? I asked. It is one of our telescopes, he replied. I'm going to let you take a look, if you choose, at your home and test for yourself the powers of which I have boasted. And having adjusted the instrument to his satisfaction, he showed me where to apply my eye to what answered to the eyepiece. I could not repress an exclamation of amazement, for truly he had exaggerated nothing. The little college town which was my home lay spread out before me, seemingly almost as near as when I looked down upon it from my observatory windows. It was early morning, and the village was waking up. The milkmen were going their rounds, and workmen, with their dinner pails, were hurrying along the streets. The early train was just leaving the railroad station. I could see the puffs from the smokestack, and the jets from the cylinders. It was strange not to hear the hissing of the steam, so near I seemed. There were the college buildings on the hill the long rows of windows flashing back the level sunbeams. I could tell the time by the college clock. It struck me that there was an unusual bustle around the buildings, considering the earliness of the hour. A crowd of men stood about the door of the observatory, and many others were hurrying across the campus in that direction. Among them I recognized President Bixby, accompanied by a college janitor. As I gazed, they reached the observatory, and, passing through the group about the door, entered the building. The president was evidently going up to my quarters. At this, it flashed over me quite suddenly that all this bustle was on my account. I recalled how it was that I came to be on Mars, and in what condition I had left affairs in the observatory. It was high time I were back there to look after myself. Here abruptly ended the extraordinary document which I found that morning on my desk. 
That is the authentic record of the conditions of life in another world which it purports to be, I do not expect the reader to believe. He will no doubt explain it as another of the curious freaks of somnambulism set down in the books. Probably it was merely that. Possibly it was something more. I do not pretend to decide the question. I have told all the facts of the case, and I have no better means of forming an opinion than the reader. Nor do I know, even if I fully believed it the true account it seems to be, that it would have affected my imagination much more strongly than it has. That story of another world has, in a word, put me out of joint with ours. The readiness with which my mind has adapted itself to the martial point of view concerning the earth has been a singular experience. The lack of foresight among the human faculties, a lack I had scarcely thought of before, now impresses me, ever more deeply, as a fact out of harmony with the rest of our nature, belying its promise, a moral mutilation, a deprivation arbitrary and unaccountable. The spectacle of a race doomed to walk backward, beholding only what has gone by, assured only of what is past and dead, comes over me from time to time with a sadly fantastical effect which I cannot describe. I dream of a world where love always wears a smile, where the partings are as tearless as our meetings, and death is king no more. I have a fancy, which I like to cherish, that the people of that happy sphere, fancied though it may be, represent the ideal and normal type of our race, as perhaps it once was, as perhaps it may yet be again. End of section one. Section two of twenty short science fiction stories by various authors. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Zen by Jerome Bixby Because they were so likable and intelligent and adaptable, they were vastly dangerous. It's difficult, when you're on one of the asteroids, to keep from tripping, because it's almost impossible to keep your eyes on the ground. They never got around to putting portholes in spaceships, you know, unnecessary when you're flying by GB, and psychologically inadvisable. Besides, so an asteroid is about the only place, apart from Luna, where you can really see the stars. There are so many stars in an asteroid sky that they look like clouds, like massive, heaped-up silver clouds floating slowly around the inner surface of a vast ebony sphere that surrounds you and your tiny foothold. They are near enough to touch, and you want to touch them, but they are so frighteningly far away, and so beautiful. There's nothing in creation half so beautiful as an asteroid sky. You don't want to look down, naturally. I had left the Lucky Pierre to search for fossils. I'm David Coons, the Lucky Pierre's paleontologist. Somewhere off in the darkness on either side of me were Joe Hargraves, gadgeting for mineral deposits, and Ed Reese, hopefully on the lookout for something alive. The lucky Pierre was back of us, her body out of sight behind a low black ridge, only her gleaming nose poking above like a porpoise coming up for air. When I looked back, I could see, along the jagged rim of the ridge, the busy reflected flickerings of the bubble camp the techs were throwing together. Otherwise, all was black, except for our blue-white torch beams that darted here and there over the gritty rocky surface. The twenty-nine of us were ETI, Team 17, whose assignment was the asteroids. We were four years and three months out of Terra, and we'd reached Vesta right on schedule. Ten minutes after landing, we had known that the clod was part of the crust of Planet X, or Sorn, to give it its right name, one of the few such parts that hadn't been blown clean out of the solar system. That made Vesta extra special. It meant settling down for a while. It meant a careful, months-long scrutiny of Vesta's every square inch and a lot of her cubic ones, especially by the life scientists. Fossils, artifacts, animate life, 
a surface chunk of sorn might harbor any of these, or all. Some we tackled already had a few. In a day or so, of course, we'd have the one-man beetles and crew boats out, and the floodlights orbiting overhead, and Vesta would be as exposed to us as a molecule on a microscreen. Then work would start in earnest. But in the meantime, and as usual, Hargraves, Reese, and I were out prowling, our weighted boots clomping along in darkness. Captain Feldman had long ago given up trying to keep his science-minded charges from galloping off alone like this. In spite of being a military man, Feld's a nice guy. He just shrugs and says, Scientists, when we appear brightly at the airlock, waiting to be let out. So the three of us went our separate ways, and soon were out of sight of one another. Ed Reese, the biologist, was looking hardest for animate life, naturally. But I found it. I had crossed a long rounded expanse of rock, lava, wonderfully colored, and was descending into a boulder cluttered pocket. I was nearing the bottom of the chunk, the part that had been the deepest beneath Sorn's surface before the blow up. It was the likeliest place to look for fossils. But instead of looking for fossils, my eyes kept rising to those incredible stars. You get that way particularly after several weeks of living in steel, and it was lucky that I got that way this time, or I might have missed the zen. My feet tangled with a rock. I started a slow, light gravity fall, and looked down to catch my balance. My torch beam flickered across a small, red-furred teddy bear shape. The light passed on. I brought it sharply back to the target. My hair did not stand on end, regardless of what you've heard me quoted as saying. Why should it have, when I already knew Yurt so well? Considered him, in fact, one of my closest friends. The Zen was standing by a rock, one paw resting on it, ears cocked forward, its stubby hind legs braced, ready to launch it into flight. Big yellow eyes blinked unemotionally at the glare of the torch, and I cut down its brilliance with a twist of the polarizer lens. The creature stared at me, looking ready to jump halfway to Mars or straight at me if I made a wrong move. I addressed it in its own language, clucking my tongue and whistling through my teeth, Sa Zen. In the blue-white light of the torch, the Zen shivered. It didn't say anything. I thought I knew why. Three thousand years of darkness and silence. I said, I won't hurt you, again speaking in its own language. The Zen moved away from the rock, but not away from me. It came a little closer, actually, and peered up at my helmeted, mere-glassed head, unmistakably the seat of intelligence, it appears, of any race anywhere. Its mouth, almost human shape, worked. Finally words came. It hadn't spoken except to itself for three thousand years. You are not Zen, it said. Why, how do you speak Zenakia? It took me a couple of seconds to untangle the squeaking syllables and get any sense out of them. But what I had already said to it were stock phrases that Yurt had taught me. I knew still more, but I couldn't speak Zenakia fluently by any means. Keep this in mind, by the way. I barely knew the language, and the Zen could barely remember it. To save space, the following dialogue is reproduced without mumblings, blank stares, and what did you says. In reality, our talk lasted over an hour. I am an Earthman, I said. Through my earphones when I spoke, I could faintly hear my own voice as the Zen must have heard it in Vesta's all but non-existent atmosphere. Tiny, metallic, cricket-like. Earthman? I pointed at the sky, the incredible sky. From out there, from another world. I thought about that for a while. I waited. We already knew that the Zens had been better astronomers at their peak than we were right now, even though they'd never mastered space travel. So I didn't expect this one to boggle at the notion of creatures from another world. It didn't. Finally it nodded, and I thought, as I had often before, how curious it was that this gesture should be common to Earthmen and Zen. So, Earthmen, it said, and you know what I am. 
When I understood, I nodded too. Then I said, yes, realizing that the nod wasn't visible through the one-way glass of my helmet. I am last of Zen, it said. I said nothing. I was studying it closely, looking for the features which Yurt had described to us, the lighter red fur of arms and neck, the peculiar formation of flesh and horn on the lower abdomen. They were there. From the coloring, I knew this Zen was a female. The mouth worked again, not with emotion I knew, but with the familiar act of speaking. I have been here for, for, she hesitated, I don't know, for five hundred of my years. For about three thousand of mine, I told her. And then blank astonishment sank home in me, astonishment at the last two words of her remark. I was already familiar with the Zen's enormous intelligence, knowing yurt as I did. But imagine thinking to qualify years with my when just out of nowhere a visitor from another planetary orbit pops up. And there had been no special stress given the distinction, just clear, precise thinking, like yurt's. I added, still a little odd, we know how long ago your world died. I was a child then, she said. I don't know what happened. I have wondered. She looked up at my steel and glass face. I must have seemed like a giant. Well, I suppose I was. This, what we are on, was part of Sorn. I know. It was, she fumbled for a word. Was it atom explosion? I told her how Sorn had gotten careless with its hydrogen atoms and had blown itself over half of creation. This the ETI's teams had surmised from scientific records found on Eros, as well as from geophysical evidence scattered throughout the other bodies. I was a child, she said again after a moment. But I remember, I remember things different from this. Air, heat, light, how do I live here? Again I felt amazement at its intelligence. And it suddenly occurred to me that astronomy and nuclear physics must have been taught in Sorn's elementary schools, else that my years and atom explosion would have been all but impossible. And now this old, old creature, remembering back three thousand years to childhood, probably to those elementary schools, remembering, and defining the differences in environment between then and now, and more, wondering at its existence in the different now. And then I got my own thinking straightened out. I recalled some of the things we had learned about Zen. Their average lifespan had been 12,000 years or a little over. So the Zen before me was, by our standards, about 25 years old. Nothing at all strange about remembering, when you are 25, the things that happened to you when you were seven. But the Zen's question, even my rationalization of my reaction to it, had given me a chill. Here was no cuddly teddy bear. This creature had been born before Christ. She had been alone for three thousand years, on a chip of bone from her dead world beneath a sepulchre of stars. The last and greatest Martian civilization, the Lahari, had risen and fallen in her lifetime and she was twenty-five years old. How do I live here? she asked again. I got back to my own framework of temporal reference, so to speak, and began explaining to a Zen what a Zen was. I found out later from Yurt that biology, for the reasons which follow, was one of the most difficult studies. So difficult that nuclear physics actually preceded it. I told her that the Zen had been, all the evidence indicated, the toughest, hardest, longest-lived creatures God had ever cooked up, practically independent of their environment, no special ecological niche, just raw, stubborn, tenacious life, developed to a fantastic extreme, a greater force of life than any other known, one that could exist almost anywhere under practically any conditions even floating in mid-space, which, asteroid or no, this Zen was doing right now. The Zens breathed all right, but it was nothing they'd had to do in order to live. 
it gave them nothing their incredible metabolism couldn't scrounge up out of rock or cosmic rays or interstellar gas or simply do without for a few thousand years if the human body is a furnace then the zen's body is a feeder pile maybe that i thought was what evolution always worked toward please will you kill me the zen said i'd been expecting that two years ago on the bleak surface of eros yurt had asked ingstrom to do the same thing but i asked why although i knew what the answer would be too the zen looked up at me she was exhibiting every ounce of emotion a zen is capable of which is a lot and i could recognize it but not in any familiar terms a tiny motion here a quiver there but very quiet and still for the most part and that was the violent expression restraint yurt after two years of living with us still couldn't understand why we found this confusing difficult aliens or being alien i've so often tried to do it myself the zen said softly but i can't i can't even hurt myself why do i want you to kill me she was even quieter maybe she was crying i'm alone five hundred years ertman not too long i'm still young but what good is it life when there are no other zen how do you know there are no other zen there are no others she said almost inaudibly i suppose a human girl might have shrieked it a child i thought when your world blew up and you survived now you're a young three thousand year old woman uneducated afraid probably crawling with neurosis even so in your thousand-year terms young lady you're not too old to change will you kill me she asked again and suddenly i was having one of those eye-popping third-row center views of the whole scene the enormous beautiful sky the dead clod vesta the little creature who stood there staring at me the brilliant ignorant human-like alien old young creature who was asking me to kill her for a moment the human quality of her thinking terrified me the feeling you might have waking up some night and finding your pet puppy sitting on your chest looking at you with wise eyes and white fangs gleaming then i thought of yurt smart friendly yurt who had learned to laugh and wisecrack and i came out of the heebie-jeebies i realized that here was only a sick girl no tiny monster and if she were as resilient as yurt well it was his problem he'd probably pull her through but i didn't pick her up i made no attempt to take her back to the ship her tiny white teeth and tiny yellow claws were harder than steel and she was i knew unbelievably strong for her size if she got suspicious or decided to throw a phobic tizzy she could scatter shreds of me over a square acre of vesta in less time than it would take me to yelp will you she began again i tried shakily hell no wait here then i had to translate it i went back to the lucky pierre and got yurt we could do without him even though he had been a big help we taught him a lot he'd been a child at the blow-up too and he taught us a lot but this was more important of course when i told him what had happened he was very quiet crying perhaps just like a human being with happiness cap feldman asked me what was up and i told him and he said well i'll be blessed i said yurt are you sure you want us to keep hands off just go off and leave you yes please feldman said well i'll be blessed yurt who spoke excellent english said bless you all i took him back to where the female waited from the ridge i knew the entire crew was watching through binox i set him down and he fell to study her intently i'm not a zen i told her giving my torch full brilliance for the crew's sake but yurt is here do you see i mean do you know what you look like she said i can see enough of my own body to and yes yurt i said here's the female we thought we might find take over 
Yurt's eyes were fastened on the girl. What do I do now? she whispered worriedly. I'm afraid that something only a Zen would know, I told her, smiling inside my helmet. I'm not a Zen. Yurt is. She turned to him. You will tell me? If it becomes necessary. He moved closer to her, not even looking back to talk to me. Give us some time to get acquainted, will you, Dave? And you might leave some supplies and a bubble at the camp when you move on, just to make things pleasanter. By this time he had reached the female. They were as still as space, not a sound, not a motion. I wanted to hang around, but I knew how I'd feel if a Zen, say, wouldn't go away if I were the last man alive and had just met the last woman. I moved my torch off them and headed back for the Lucky Pierre. We all had a drink to the saving of a great race that might have become extinct. Ed Reese, though, had to do some worrying before he could get down to his drink. What if they don't like each other? he asked anxiously. They don't have much choice, Captain Feldman said, always the realist. Why do homely women fight for jobs on the most isolated space outposts? Reese grinned. That's right. They look awful good after a year or two in space. Make that twenty-five by Zen standards or three thousand by ours, said Joe Hargraves, and I'll bet they look beautiful to each other. We decided to drop our investigation of Vesta for the time being and come back to it after the honeymoon. Six months later, when we returned, there were twelve hundred Zen on Vesta. Captain Feldman was a realist, but he was also a deeply moral man. He went to Yurt and said, It's indecent. Couldn't the two of you control yourselves at least a little? Twelve hundred kids! We were rather surprised ourselves, Yurt said complacently. But this seems to be how Zen reproduce. Can you have only half a child? Naturally, Feld got the authorities to quarantine Vesta. Good God, the Zen could push us clear out of the solar system in a couple of generations. I don't think they would, but you can't take such chances, can you? End of Section 2 Section 3 of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Clean and Wholesome Land by Ralph Sholto Utopia had been reached. All the problems of mankind had been solved. It was the perfect state. If you doubted it, you died. While Professor Cargill lectured from the rostrum, Neil Pardew prowled the dark auditorium. This, he knew, was the place to find them. Here was where they whispered and plotted and schemed, feeling safe in this pure, hard core of patriotism. Safe because Cargill was the director of education in the new state, just as Pardew was the director of public security. Safe because Cargill's lectures were given before a command audience, with attendance strictly mandatory. The insistence was not really necessary, of course. The people would have come to hear Cargill regardless. He was a compelling, magnetic personality. Even now his great voice was booming out. And upon this anniversary of the new state, we can look out with great pride upon a clean and wholesome land. With strong emotion, we can look upon the physical manifestation of our glorious principles that only through self-effacement through fantic love for the state, can the individual come to complete physical and mental fruition. Upon this anniversary, we see our enemies, both within and without, broken and completely subjugated. This was the place they whispered and schemed and plotted. Pardo prowled the aisles, his eyes piercing the darkness, spotting them, cataloging them. And thus he came upon Emil Hillerman, his deputy of vital intelligence sitting dutifully in the end seat of a middle aisle. Hillerman's thick lips hung lax, his eyes squinted laboriously as he sought to follow the thread of Cargill's lecture. Pardo tapped Hillerman on the shoulder. The latter started guiltily. He whirled and sought to identify Pardo in the semi-darkness. Pardo said, 
Please step outside with me. I have some questions. There was fear in Hillerman's bearing as he got clumsily to his feet and followed Pardo. But none of Cargill's speech was missed. A battery of loudspeakers carried it even into the foyer where Pardo stopped and turned on Hillerman. He regarded the man through cold, calculating eyes. He seemed to be both enjoying Hillerman's discomfort and also listening to Cargill's booming words. These pale weaklings, these traitors with twitching muscles and twitching minds, who skulked in dark places, have been finally and decisively defeated, even their vaunted leader. What have you been doing? Pardo asked, relative to Carl Leinster. The frightened Hillerman licked his fat lower lip as he sought for words. Everything, everything possible. But Leinster is clever. You know that. You know that yourself. Pardo's eyes bored into those of the intelligence director. They were noted for their icy penetration, but upon this night they were like steel knives. It was as though he surveyed Hillerman from behind the bulwark of some new and hostile information. Even as he stared, Cargill was booming from the rostrum. Carl Leinster, their peerless leader, and Cargill's voice crackled with the inflection of pure contempt. A degenerate, a dope addict, whose greatness lay only in the realms of his sensual dreams. A weak, pitiful figure bereft of followers, cringing alone in. When Pardo spoke, his voice held a new sharpness to complement the new ice in his eyes. He said, In half an hour I'm attending a meeting of the council. They will want a report. What about Leinster? Hillerman looked quickly to right and left, then back at his chief. He hesitated as though fearing the consequences of what he was about to reveal. You know of the Wyckoff chemical transformation process. Certainly I know of it, Pardo blazed. What about it? I, I, but Hillerman seemed to lose the courage he'd screwed up to continue in this direction. He straightened and a little of the hangdog servility dropped away. I'm doing all that is humanly possible to apprehend Leinster. All that any man could do. The secret jails are full. My interrogators work night and day. Even a superficial check on my records would show that more has been done in the last six months and is being done now than... Pardue raised an impatient hand, opening a gap of silence into which the voice of Cargill poured. Land in which the voice of dissenter is not heard, in which Leinster and men of his despicable ilk are forever crushed and beaten. Pardue was scowling. Almost unconsciously, he had held the pause, with hand upraised, until Cargill finished his passage. As Cargill stopped for breath, Pardo jerked his hand down sharply, completing the gesture. I have no time for any more of this, and I resent having to seek you out. Next time report to my office as is proper and keep me posted as to your activities. Next... Pardo eyed Hillerman for one blank moment and allowed the threat to reflect clearly that possibly there would not be any more next times. Then he turned and strolled swiftly from the foyer. Cargill's voice had hardly faded when he picked it up again on his car radio. It was a foregone conclusion that every radio in the land would be tuned to the lecture. So great was Cargill's popularity that every citizen traveling in a car would wish to hear it and turn on his receiver. It was foolish not to have a radio properly tuned when Cargill spoke. He was saying, and so under the banner of complete solidarity, we will march forward, a solid phalanx against which no force can stand. Now that our own house is swept clean of vermin, rid forever of carrion like Leinster and his ilk, we can... Pardue had traveled swiftly through the streets at high speed reserved for higher servants of the new state. The lesser servants of the new state had learned caution and thus no regrettable deaths or maimings occurred. The lesser servants have grown wary and fleet of foot. Pardot switched off his motor but left his audio blaring. Cargill's voice followed him up the broad steps of the executive building and was just fading out when Pardot was able to pick it up again from the loudspeaker under the great arches. He entered the building and traversed the vast foyer to a niche which housed a private elevator. He entered the lift, deserting it on the ninth floor, 
where he entered an unobtrusive door and joined a group which consisted of the new state's well-guarded pool of power and brains. There was Blanchard of Finance, Keeley, Director of Foreign Education, Masichek, Overlord of the Nation's Larder, and seven others. When Pardot entered, all conversation stopped, and every man looked up from a luxurious overstuffed chair. Pardot must certainly have swelled inwardly with pride at this unconscious tribute. It was well known that he held a key position on the chessboard of politics. His was, in reality, the most important job of all. It was to Pardot that this powerful group of men looked for that which they most treasured, their own personal safety. A chair was waiting for Pardot. He said, "'I'm sorry to be late, gentlemen. I have been on a personal tour of inspection. I'm sure you will forgive me, however. I have a most interesting report.' He seated himself, timing the action so it coincided with the ebb of applause coming over the speaker. Applause from the loyal multitudes who had just heard Professor Cargill end his lecture. As it was now permissible, Blanchard reached under the table and snapped a button. The speaker went silent. An interesting report, Keeley asked. Amazingly so, Pardo said. I have just unearthed a traitor, a traitor in a high place. Every man in the group strove not to react, and this striving was in itself a reaction. Most interesting, Blanchard murmured. Are you ready to name names? That is my intention, but in order to forestall a great many questions, let me give you a complete background. Lederman, ambassador without portfolio, and very close to the man of almost sacred name who never attended these meetings, felt strong enough to evince impatience. The name, man, first name, then the details. Pardue smiled coldly. Very well. The name is Carl Leinster. Lederman sprang from his chair, his face bordering on purple. Is this a joke, Pardo? We all know Leinster is the arc traitor of our times, the leader of the resistance movement. Talk sense. Pardo, not in the least disconcerted, smiled coldly. I'm sorry. Perhaps I should have said Emil Hillerman, my deputy of vital intelligence the man who holds immeasurable power in his two hands. Blanchard was not given to outbursts, but his lips were grim as he said, We're waiting for you to talk sense, Pardo. The confusion comes from your not allowing me to tell it as I wished. There is a gap between Leinster and Hillerman, one which, with your permission, I will fill. Talk, man, talk. You have all heard of Formula 652, known also as the Wyckoff chemical transformation process. There were expressions of both understanding and bewilderment. Noting these, Pardo said, For those of you who haven't made a point of looking into the thing, I'll explain. Wyckoff, in case you don't recall, was a chemical engineer of more than average ability who stumbled onto this formula before he died, most regretfully, four years ago, in 1984. Lederman continued to scowl. We all know each other, Pardo. Call a spade a spade. Wyckoff was a reactionary scoundrel whom you did away with for reasons of security. Precisely, Pardo said. In its essence, the formula is a process for taking over a man's brain, his body, his personality. You mean? Pardo refused to be interrupted. We were of the opinion that Wyckoff, though he and Leinster were great friends, was not able to impart his knowledge to the latter. We took him into custody shortly after he perfected the formula and were fortunate in persuading him to give it to us. But he gave it to Leinster also. We were certain, at the time of his death, that he had not been able to do that. We are still certain. Keeley, with a gesture, requested the floor. I wonder if you could go into a little more detail concerning the formula. For those of us who... Of course, Pardo said. The formula is a combination of six chemicals, and the process of transformation is relatively simple, yet highly dangerous to both subjects involved. It means sure death for the proposed host, if not delicately handled, will also result in death for the usurper. The transformation requires three hours to perform. 
Once completed successfully, the usurper can never return to his own body. It must be destroyed. Also, the mentality of the host vanishes after it is pushed from its original brain tissue through the influence of the formula. Then if Wyckoff didn't give the formula to Leinster, it was stolen from our vaults, or wherever it was kept? Exactly. Certain investigations I have made prove beyond doubt that Leinster got to my deputy Hillerman. I never considered Hillerman very bright, but I thought him to be honest and loyal. Beyond all doubt, with his aid, Leinster stole the formula, possibly got it verbally, and used it to take Hillerman's body from him. Pardot smiled grimly. Therefore, gentlemen, we have a traitor in a high place, my deputy of vital intelligence. Pardot sat silent now, seeming to enjoy the fear he had engendered in his colleagues. Sat silent until Lederman said, You've arrested him, of course. No, I have not. Then get at it, man, get at it. I have no intention of arresting Hillerman. Lederman's eyes widened as did those of the rest of the company. But Blanchard, even under the impact of such a bombshell, had the presence of mind to glance at his watch. Immediately he snapped on the loudspeaker. The voice of Professor Cargill blared forth. And upon this anniversary of the new state, we can look with pride upon a clean and wholesome land. It was the rebroadcast from recordings of Cargill's speech, and no man in his right mind would have refrained from tuning it in because everyone wanted to hear it at least twice. Lederman, almost apoplectic, ignored the speech. Not arresting him? Are you mad? I am quite sane, and the situation is well in hand. Pardo grinned, and there was wickedness in the grin. Wickedness and intelligence. As I said before, Hillerman was not a smart man. His job was too much for him, and I would have been faced soon with the necessity of replacing him regardless. Leinster, on the other hand, is of grade A intellect. But gentlemen, he is frightened, badly frightened in his new environment, and in order to ensure his own safety, is doing an excellent job. Ever since the transformation, that department has gained in efficiency until it now ranks as one of the highest in our entire government. Slowly, Pardot's strategy dawned on the group. Blanchard suddenly smiled. Then Pardot scowled and went on with a new and sudden ferocity. I have the proof, and I have Leinster Hillerman under my palm. So he stays, continues to do a good job for us. But he'll be watched, gentlemen. He won't be able to go to the bathroom without being under surveillance. We will learn a great deal from him. All we need to know. Then you'll arrest him? The boss of the state larder wanted to know. Pardo came to his feet. His fist slammed down on the table. I shall not arrest him, ever. When the time comes, I shall personally shoot him down in the street, like a dog. There will come a day, gentlemen, when you will witness this act of vengeance when I shall make such an example of Leinster Hillerman as the resistance will not forget, a moral crumbling example, I promise you, in which Leinster and his ilk are forever crushed and beaten, the speaker said. Blanchard took the floor. Gentlemen, I am moved to vote thanks and confidence for our colleague, Neil Pardot. The director of public security stood at attention and essayed a sharp military bow, it was a moment of rare triumph. Thank you, gentlemen, he said. An hour later, Leinster Pardo was alone in his apartments. He stripped off his uniform with an air of grim satisfaction. While he undressed, he thought of the martyrs to the cause, the men who had died. He thought of Wyckoff and wished Wyckoff could have had the pleasure of knowing who had usurped the body of Neil Pardo, Pardo the butcher, the infamous Pardo. From the speaker came the third and final rebroadcast of Cargill's speech. A clean and wholesome land. A clean and wholesome land, Leinster murmured, and the tone of his voice was a prayer. End of section three. Section four of twenty short science fiction stories by various authors. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Off Course by Mac Reynolds Shore and Begora, it was a great day for the earth. The first envoy from another world was about to speak. That is, if he could forget that horse for a minute. First on the scene were Larry Dermott and Tim Casey of the State Highway Patrol. They assumed they were witnessing the crash of a new type of Air Force plane and slipped and skidded desperately across the field to within 30 feet of the strange craft, only to discover that the landing had been made without accident. Patrolman Dermott shook his head. They're getting queerer looking every year. Get a load of it. No wheels, no propeller, no cockpit. They left the car and made their way toward the strange egg-shaped vessel. Tim Casey loosened his thirty-eight in his holster and said, Sure, I'm beginning to wonder if it's one of ours. No insignia, and... A circular door slid open at that point, and Damry Tass stepped out, yawning. He spotted them, smiled, and said, Glork. They gaped at him. Glork is right, Dermot swallowed. Tim Casey closed his mouth with an effort. Do you mind the color of his face, he blurted. How could I help it? Damry Tass rubbed a blue-nailed pink hand down his purplish countenance and yawned again. Goramadigan Horps Radium, he said. Patrolman Dermot and Patrolman Casey shot stares at each other. "'Tis double talk he's after giving us," Casey said. Damry Tass frowned. Hamara? he asked. Larry Dermot pushed his cap to the back of his head. That doesn't sound like any language I've even heard about. Damry Task grimaced, turned and re-entered his spacecraft to emerge in half a minute with his hands full of contraption. He held a box-like arrangement under his left arm. In his right hand were two metal caps connected to the box by wires. While the patrolman watched him, he set the box on the ground, twirled two dials and put one of the caps on his head. He offered the other to Larry Dermott. His desire was obvious. Train to grasp a situation and immediately respond in manner best suited to protect the welfare of the people of New York State, Dermot cleared his throat and said, Tim, take over while I report. Hey, Casey protested, but his fellow minion had left. Mandaya, Damry Tass told Casey, holding out the metal cap. Faith, and do I look balmy? Casey told him. I wouldn't be putting that dingus on my head for all the colines in Ireland. Mandaya, the stranger said impatiently. Be jazzus, Casey snorted. You can't. Dermot called from the car. Tim, the captain says to humor this guy. We're going to keep him here until the officials arrive. Tim Casey closed his eyes and groaned. Humor him, he's after saying. Orders it is, he shouted back. Sure, and did you tell him he's in Technicolor? Begora, he looks like a man from Mars. That's what they think, Larry yelled, and the governor's on his way. We're to do everything possible, short of violence, to keep this character here. Humor him, Tim. The merry task snapped, pushing the cap into Casey's reluctant hands. Muttering his protests, Casey lifted it gingerly and placed it on his head. Not feeling any immediate effect, he said, There, to satisfied ye are now? I'm supposing. The alien stooped down and flicked a switch on the little box. It hummed gently. Tim Casey suddenly shrieked and sat down on the stubble and grass of the field. Begora, he yelped. I've been mothered. He tore the cap from his head. His companion came running. What's the matter, Tim? he shouted. Damry Tass removed the metal cap from his own head. Sure, and nothing is after being the matter with him, he said. Evidently the boy's never been a-wearin' of a curret helmet afore. Twill hurt him not at all. You can talk, Dermot blurted, skidding to a stop. Damry Tass shrugged. Faith and why not? As I was after sayin', I shared the curret helmet with Tim Casey. Patrolman Dermot glared at him unbelievingly. You learned the language just by sticking that Rube Goldberg deal on Tim's head? Sure, and why not? Dermot muttered, and with it he has to pick up the corniest brogue west of Dublin. Tim Casey got to his feet indignantly. I'm after resenting that, Larry Dermot. 
Sure, in the way we talk in Ireland is. De Mary Tass interrupted, pointing to a bedraggled horse that made its way to within fifty feet of the vessel. Now what could that be after being? The patrolman followed his stare. It's a horse. What else? A horse? Larry Dermot looked again, just to make sure. Yeah, not much of a horse, but a horse. De Mary Tass sighed ecstatically. And just what is a horse, if I may be so bold as to be askin? It's an animal you ride on. The alien tore his gaze from the animal to look his disbelief at the other. Are you after meaning that you climb upon the creature's back and ride him? Faith now, quit your blarney. He looked at the horse again, then down at his equipment. Bogora, he muttered. I'll share the carrot helmet with the creature. Hey, hold it, Dermot said anxiously. He was beginning to feel like a character in a shaggy dog story. Interest in the horse was ended with the sudden arrival of a helicopter. It swooped down on the field and settled within twenty feet of the alien craft. Almost before it had touched, the door was flung open and the flying windmill disgorged two bestarred and efficient-looking army officers. Casey and Dermot snapped them a salute. The senior general didn't take his eyes from the alien and the spacecraft as he spoke and they bugged quite as effectively as they had those of the patrolmen when they'd first arrived on the scene. "'I'm Major General Browning,' he rapped. "'I want a police cordon thrown up around this, sir, vessel. No newsmen, no sightseers, nobody without my permission. As soon as Army personnel arrives, we'll take over completely.' "'Yes, sir,' Larry Dermot said. "'I've got a report on the radio that the governor's on his way, sir. How about him?' The general muttered something under his breath. Then, when the governor arrives, let me know. Otherwise, nobody gets through. De Mary Tass said, Faith and what goes on? The general's eyes bugged still further. He talks, he accused. Yes, sir, Dermot said. He had some kind of machine. He put it over Tim's head, and seconds later he could talk. Nonsense, the general snapped. Further discussion was interrupted by the screaming arrival of several motorcycle patrolmen, followed by three heavily laden patrol cars. Overhead, pursuit planes zoomed in and began darting about nervously above the field. "'Sure, and it's quite a reception I'm after getting,' Demary Tass said. He yawned. "'But what I'm a wantin' is a chance to get some sleep. Faith, and I've been awake for almost a decal. De Mary Tass was hurried, via helicopter to Washington, where he disappeared for several days, being held incommunicado while White House, Pentagon, State Department, and Congress tried to figure out just what to do with him. Never in the history of the planet had such a furor arisen. Thus far, no newspaper men had been allowed within speaking distance. Administration higher-ups were being subjected to a volcano of editorial heat, but the longer the space alien was discussed, the more they viewed with alarm the situation his arrival had precipitated. There were angles that hadn't at first been evident. Obviously, he was from some civilization far beyond that of Earth's. That was the rub. No matter what he said, it would shake governments, possibly overthrow social systems, perhaps even destroy established religious concepts. But they couldn't keep him under wraps indefinitely. It was the United Nations that cracked the Iron Curtain. Their demands that the alien be heard before their body was too strong and had too much public opinion behind them to be ignored. The White House yielded and the date was set for the visitor to speak before the assembly. Excitement, anticipation, blanketed the world. Shepherds in Sinkang, multimillionaires in Switzerland, fakers in Pakistan, gonchos in Argentine, were raised to a zenith of expectation. Panhandlers debated the message to come with pedestrians. Jinrakisha men argued it with their passengers. Miners discussed it deep beneath the surface. Pilots argued with their co-pilots thousands of feet above. It was the most universally awaited event of the ages. By the time the delegates from every nation, tribe, religion, class,
color, and race had gathered in New York to receive the message from the stars, the majority of Earth had decided that Demary Tass was the plenipotentiary of a super-civilization which had been viewing developments on this planet with misgivings. It was thought this other civilization had advanced greatly beyond Earth's, and that the problems besetting us, social, economic, scientific, had been solved by the super-civilization. Obviously, then, Demary Tass had come, an advisor from a benevolent and friendly people, to guide the world aright. And nine-tenths of the population of Earth stood ready and willing to be guided. The other tenth liked things as they were, and were quite convinced that the space envoy would upset their apple carts. Villiamar Anderson, Secretary General of the UN, was to introduce the space emissary. Can you give me an idea at all of what he's like? he asked nervously. President McCord was upset as the Dane. He shrugged in agitation. I know almost as little as you do. Sir Alfred Oxford protested. But my dear chap, you've had him for almost two weeks. Certainly in that time. The President snapped back. You probably won't believe this, but he's been asleep until yesterday. When he first arrived, he told us he hadn't slept for a decal, whatever that is. So we held off our discussion with him until morning. Well, he didn't wake in the morning, nor the next. Six days later, fearing something was wrong, we woke him. What happened? Sir Alfred asked. The president showed embarrassment. He used some rather ripe Irish profanity on us, rolled over, and went back to sleep. Viljil Moore Anderson asked, Well, what happened yesterday? We actually haven't had time to question him. Among other things, there's been some controversy about whose jurisdiction he comes under. The State Department claims the Army shouldn't. The Secretary General sighed deeply. Just what did he do? The Secret Service reports he spent the day whistling Mother McCree and playing with his dog, cat, and mouse. Dog, cat, and mouse? I say, blurted Sir Alfred. The president was defensive. He had to have some occupation, and he seems to be particularly interested in our animal life. He wanted a horse, but compromised for the others. I understand he insists all three of them come with him wherever he goes. I wish we knew what he was going to say, Anderson worried. Here he comes, said Sir Alfred. Surrounded by FBI men, Demary Tass was ushered to the speaker's stand. He had a kitten in his arms, a Scotty followed him. The alien frowned worriedly. Sure, he said, and what can all this be? Is some ordinance I've been after breaking? McCord, Sir Alfred, and Anderson hastened to reassure him and made him comfortable in a chair. Viljolmar Anderson faced the thousands in the audience and held up his hands but it was ten minutes before he was able to quiet the cheering, stamping delegates from all earth. Finally, fellow Terrans, I shall not take your time for a lengthy introduction of the envoy from the stars. I will only say that, without doubt, this is the most important moment in the history of the human race. We will now hear from the first being to come to earth from another world. He turned and gestured to Damari Tass, who hadn't been paying overmuch attention to the chairman in view of some dog and cat hostilities that had been developing about his feet. But now the alien's purplish face faded into a light blue. He stood and said hoarsely, Faith, and what was that last you said? Viljil Mar Anderson repeated, We will now hear from the first being ever to come to earth from another world. The face of the alien went a lighter blue. Sure, and you wouldn't just be a frightened in a body, would you? You don't claim to tell me this planet isn't after being a member of the Galactic League? Anderson's face was blank. Galactic League? Kushla Makri, Damari Tass moaned. I've gone and put me foot in it again. I'll be after getting cared for this. Sir Alfred was on his feet. I don't understand. Do you mean you aren't an envoy from another planet? Demary Tass held his head in his hands and groaned. An envoy, he's saying, and meself only a second-rate collector of specimens for the Carthus Zoo. 
He straightened and started off the speaker stand. Sure, and I must blast off immediately. Things were moving fast for President McCord, but already an edge of relief was manifesting itself. Taking the initiative, he said, Of course, of course, if that is your desire. He signaled to the bodyguard who had accompanied the alien to the assemblage. A dull roar was beginning to emanate from the thousands gathered in the tremendous hall, murmuring, questioning, disbelieving. Bill Jamar Anderson felt that he must say something. He extended a detaining hand. Now you are here, he said urgently, even though by mistake. Before you go, can't you give us some brief word? Our world is in chaos. Many of us have lost faith. Perhaps. Damari Tass shook off the restraining hand. Do I look daft? But gory, I should have been a known something was queer. All your weapons and your strange ideas. Faith, I wouldn't be surprised if ye hadn't yet established a planet-wide government. Sure, and I'll go still further. Ye probably have wars on this benighted world. No wonder it is ye haven't been invited to join the Galactic League and take your place among the civilized planets. He hustled from the rostrum and made his way, still surrounded by guards, to the door by which he had entered. The dog and the cat trotted after, undismayed by the freer about them. They arrived about four hours later at the field on which he had landed, and the alien from space hurried toward his craft, still muttering. He had been accompanied by a general and by the president, but all the way he had refrained from speaking. He scurried from the car and toward the spacecraft. President McCord said, You've forgotten your pets. We would be glad if you would accept them as. The alien's face faded a light blue again. Faith, and I'd almost forgotten, he said. If I take a creature from his quarantine planet, my name be Nork. Keep your dog and your kitty. He shook his head sadly and extracted a mouse from a pocket. And this amazing little creature as well. They followed him to the spacecraft. Just before entering, he spotted the bedraggled horse that had been present on his landing. A longing expression came over his highly colored face. Just one thing, he said. Faith now, were they pulling my leg when they said you were after riding on the back of those things? The president looked at the woebegone nag. It's a horse, he said, surprised. Man has been riding them for centuries. Demary Tass shook his head. Sure and twould have been my makin' if I could have taken one back to Carthus. He entered his vessel. The others drew back, out of range of the expected blast, and watched, each with his own thoughts, as the first visitor from space hurriedly left Earth. End of Section 4《セクション5 of 20 short science fiction stories by various authors。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Citadel by Algis Boudres。He was looking for a privacy his strange personality needed, and never quite seemed to achieve it. All his efforts were somehow great triumphs of the race and great failures for him. The aging man was sweating profusely, and he darted sidelong glances at the windowless walls of the outer office. By turns, he sat stiffly in a corner chair or paced uneasily, his head swiveling constantly. His hand was clammy when Mead shook it. Hello, Mr. Mead, he said in a husky, hesitant voice, his eyes never quite still, never long on Mead's face, but darting hither and yon his glance rebounding at every turn from the walls, the floor, the ceiling, the closed outer door. Christopher Meade, Assistant Undersecretary for External Affairs, returned the handshake, smiling. Please come into my office, he said quickly. It's much more spacious. Thank you, the aging man said gratefully and hurried into the next room. Meade rapidly opened the windows, and some of the man's nervousness left him. He sank down into the visitor's chair in front of Meade's desk, his eyes drinking in the distances beyond the windows. Thank you, he repeated. 
Meade sat down behind his desk, leaned back, and waited for the man's breathing to slow. Finally he said, "'It's good to see you again, Mr. Holliday. What can I do for you?' Martin Holliday tore his glance away from the window long enough to raise his eyes to Meade's face, and then dropped them to the hands he had folded too deliberately in his lap. "'I'd—' His voice husked into unintelligibility, and he had to begin again. I'd, l "'I'd like to take an option on a new planet,' he finally said. Meade nodded. "'I don't see why not.' He gestured expressively at the star chart papered over one wall of his office. "'We've certainly got plenty of them, but what happened with your first one?' "'It, d d Mr. Holliday, I certainly won't be offended if you prefer to look out the window,' Meade said quickly. "'Thank you.' After a moment, he began again. "'It didn't work out.' he said, his glance flickering back to Meade for an instant before he had to look out the window again. "'I don't know where my figuring went wrong. It didn't go wrong. It was just, just things. I thought I could sell enough subdivisions to cover the payments and still keep most of it for myself, but it didn't work out.' He looked quickly at Meade with a flash of groundless guilt in his eyes. First, I had to sell more than I had intended.' because I had to lower the original price. Somebody'd optioned another planet in the same system, and I hadn't counted on the competition. Then, even after I'd covered the option and posted surety on the payments, there were all kinds of expenses. I couldn't lease the mineral rights. He looked at Meade again, as though he had to justify himself. I don't know how that deal fell through. The company just, just withdrew, all of a sudden. "'Do you think there might have been anything peculiar about that?' Meade asked. "'I mean, could the company have made a deal with the colonists for a lower price after you'd been forced out?' Holliday shook his head quickly. "'No, no, nothing like that. The colonists and I got along fine. It wasn't as though I hadn't put the best land up for sale, or tried to make myself rich. Why, after I had to sell some of the remaining land, I knew it wasn't worth staying any more.' Some of them offered to lend me enough money to keep 50,000 square miles for myself. He smiled warmly, his eyes blank while he focused on memory. But that wasn't it, of course, he went on. I had my original investment back, but I couldn't tell them why I couldn't stay. It was people, even if I never saw them. It was the thought of people, with aircraft and rockets and roads. I understand, Mr. Holliday, Meade said in an effort to spare him embarrassment. Holliday looked at him helplessly. I couldn't tell them that, could I, Mr. Meade? They were good, friendly people who wanted to help me. I couldn't tell them it was people, could I? He wet his dry lips and locked his eyes on the view outside the window. All I want, Mr. Meade, is half a planet to myself, he said softly. He shook his head. Well, it'll work out this time. This time I won't have to sell so much, and I'll have a place to spend what time I've got left in peace. Without this, this... He gestured helplessly in an effort to convey his tortured consciousness of his own fear. Meade nodded quickly as he saw his features nod convulsively. Of course, Mr. Holliday. We'll get you an option on a new planet as quickly as we can. Thank you, Holliday said again. Can... We can we handle it today? I've had my credit transferred to a local bank. Certainly, Mr. Holliday. We won't keep you on Earth a moment longer than absolutely necessary. He took a standard form out of a desk drawer and passed it to Holliday for his signature. I'll be smarter this time, the aging man said, trying to convince himself as he uncapped his pen. This time it'll work out. I'm sure it will, Mr. Holliday, Meade said. Marlow was a beast. He sat behind his desk like a tuskless sea lion crouched behind a rock, and his cheeks merged into jowls and obliterated his neck. His desk was built specially, so that he could get his thighs under it. His office chair was heavier and wider by far than any standard size, its casters rolling on special composition base that had been laid down over the carpeting, for Marlow's weight would have cut any ordinary rug to shreds. His jacket stretched like a pleofilm to enclose the bulk of his stooped shoulders, 
and his eyes surveilled his world behind the embattlemented heaviness of the puffing flesh that filled their sockets. A bulb flickered on his interphone set, and Marlowe shot a glance at the switch beneath it. Secretary, quite contrary, he muttered inaudibly. He flicked the switch. Yes, Mary? His voice rumbled out of the flabby cavern of his chest. Mr. Mead has just filed a report on Martin Holliday, Mr. Secretary. Would you like to see it? Just give me a summary, Mary. Under his breath he whispered, Summary, that mummery, Mary. And a thin smile fell about his lips while he listened. Gave him Carl's Haven for, eh? He observed when his secretary had finished. Okay, thanks, Mary. He switched off and sat thinking. Somewhere in the bowels of the body administrative, he knew, notations were being made and cross-filed. The addition of Carlshaven IV to the list of planets under colonization would be made, and Holiday's asking prices for land would be posted with emigration, together with a prospectus abstracted from the General Galactic Survey. He switched the interphone on again. Ah, uh, Mary... Supply me with a copy of the GenServe on the entire Carlshaven system. Tell Mr. Mead I'll expect him in my office sometime this afternoon. You schedule it, and we'll go into it further. Yes, Mr. Secretary. Will 1515 be all right? 1515's fine, Mary, Marlowe said gently. Yes, sir, his secretary replied, abashed. I keep forgetting about proper nomenclature. So do I, Mary, so do I. Marlow sighed. Anything come up that wasn't scheduled for today? It was a routine question, born of futile hope. There was always something to spoil the carefully planned daily schedules. Yes and no, sir. Marlow cocked an eyebrow at the interphone. Well, that's a slight change anyway. What is it? There's a political science observer from Dovenel. That's more, too, on our map, sir. Who requested permission to talk to you? He's here on the usual exchange program, and he's within his privileges in asking, of course. I assume it's an ordinary thing. What's our foreign policy? How do you apply it? Can you give specific instances and the like? Precisely, Marl thought. For ordinary questions, there were standard answers, and Mary had been his secretary for so long that she could supply them as well as he could. Dovenel, more too, eh? Obviously, there was something special about the situation, and Mary was leaving the decision to him. He scanned through his memorized star catalogs, trying to find the correlation. Mr. Secretary, Marlowe grunted, still here, just thinking. Isn't Dovenil that nation we just sent Harrison to? Yes, sir, on the same exchange program. Marlowe chuckled. Well, if we've got Harrison down there, it's only fair to let their fellow learn something in exchange, isn't it? What's his name? Daly Shoot Clavin, sir. Marlowe muttered to himself. Daly Shoot Clavin? Irish? Corned beef and cabbage? His mind filed it away together with a primary color picture of Jiggs and Maggie. All right, Mary, I'll talk to him, if you can find room in the schedule somewhere. Tell you what. Let him in at 15.30. Meet and I can finish a working example for him. Does that check all right with your book? Yes, sir. There'll be time if we carry over on the Saroi incidents. Saroi's waited six years, four months, and 23 days. They'll wait another day. Let's do that, then. Huh, Mary? Marlow switched off and picked up a report which he began to read by the page block system his eyes almost unblinking between pages. Harrison, eh? He muttered once, stopping to look quizzically at his desktop. He chuckled. At 15.15, the light on his interphone blinked twice, and Marlowe hastily initialed a directive with his right hand while touching the switch with his left. Yes, Mary? Mr. Mead, sir. Okay. He switched off, pushed the directive into his outbox, and pulled the GenServe and the folder on Martin Holiday out of the hold tray. Come in, Chris, he said as Mead knocked on the door. How are you today, Mr. Marlowe? Mead asked as he sat down. Four ounces heavier, Marlowe answered dryly. I presume you're not. Cigarette, Chris? 
Apparently the use of the first name finally caught Meade's notice. He looked thoughtful for a moment, then took a cigarette and lit it. Thanks, Dave. Well, I'm glad that's settled, Marto chuckled, his eyes almost disappearing in wrinkles of flesh. How's Mary? Meade grinned crookedly. Miss Folsom is in fine fettle today. Thank you. Marlow rumpled a laugh. Meade at once made the mistake of addressing the woman as Mary, under the natural assumption that if Marlow could do it, everyone could. Mary, I fear, Marlow observed, lives in more stately times than these. She'll tolerate informality from me because I'm in direct authority over her, and direct authority, of course, is law. But you, Meade, are a young whippersnapper. But that's totally unrealistic, Meade protested. I don't respect her less by using her first name. It's just, just friendliness, that's all. Look, Marlowe said, it makes sense, but it ain't logical, not on her terms. Mary Folsom was raised by a big, tough, tight-lipped authoritarian of a father who believed in bringing kids up by the book. By the time she got tumbled out into the world, all big men were unquestionable authority, and all young men were callow whippersnappers. Sure, she's unhappy about it, inside. But it makes her a perfect secretary for me, and she does her job well. We play by her rules on the little things, and by the world's rules on the big ones, capiche? Sure, Dave, but... Marlowe picked up the folder on holiday and gave Meade one weighty but understanding look before he opened it. Your trouble, Chris, is that your viewpoint is fundamentally sane, he said. Now about holiday. Martin, options, 06-26-8729, 063-108-1004. I didn't get time to read the GenServe on the Carlshaven planets, so I'll ask you to brief me. Yes, sir. What's four like? Good, arable land. A little mountainous in spots, but that's good. Loaded with minerals, industrial stuff, like silver. Some tin, but not enough to depress the monetary standard. Lots of copper. Coal beds, petroleum basins, the works. Self-supporting practically from the start. A real asset to the Union in 56 years. Marlowe nodded. Good. Nice picking, Chris. Now, got a decoy? Yes, sir. Carl's Haven 2's a false E. I've got a dummy option on it in the works, and will be able to undercut Holiday's prices for his land by about 20%. False E, huh? How long do you figure until the colony can't stick on it any longer? A fair-sized one, with lots of financial backing, might even make it permanently. But we won't be able to dig up that many loafers, and naturally, we can't give them that big a subsidy. Eventually, we'll have to ferry them all out, in about eight years, say. But that'll give us enough time to break holiday. Marlowe nodded again. Sounds good. Something else, Meade said. Two's mineral poor. He looked hesitantly at Marlowe. What's up, boy? Well, sir, Meade began, then stopped. Nothing important, really. Marlowe gave him a surprising look full of sadness and brooding understanding. You're thinking he's an old, frightened man, and why don't we leave him alone? Why, yes, sir. Dave. Yes, Dave. You're quite right. Why don't we? We can't, sir. I know that. But it doesn't seem fair. Exactly, Chris. It ain't right, but it's correct. The light on Marlowe's interphone blinked once. Marlowe looked at it in momentary surprise. Then his features cleared, and he muttered, Cabbage. He reached out toward the switch. We've got a visitor, Chris. Follow my lead. He reviewed his information on Devona Lid titular systems while he touched the switch. Ask Scud Clavin to come in, uh, Mary. Daly Shud Clavin was almost a twin for the pictured, typical Devona Lid in Marlowe's library. Since the pictures were usually idealized, it followed that Clavin was an above average specimen of his people. He stood a full eight feet from fetters to crest, and had not yet begun to thicken his toes in compensation for the stoop that marked advancing middle age for his race. 
Marlowe, looking at him, smiled inwardly. No Devonalid could be so obviously superior, and still only a lowly student. Well, considering Harrison's qualifications, it might still not be tit for tat. Meade began to get to his feet, and Marlowe hastily planted a foot atop his nearest shoe. The assistant winced and twitched his lips, but at least he stayed down. Davy shoot Clavin, the Devonalid pronounced in good English. David Marlowe, Secretary for External Affairs, Solar Union, Marlowe replied. Ood Clavin looked expectantly at Meade. Christopher Meade, Assistant Undersecretary for External Affairs, the assistant said, orienting himself. If you would do us the honor of permitting us to stand, Marlowe asked politely. On the contrary, Marlowe, if you would do me the honor of permitting me to sit, I should consider it a privilege. Please do so, Mr. Meade, if you would bring our visitor a chair. They lost themselves in formalities for a few minutes, Marlowe being urbanely correct. Meade following after as best he could through the maze of Devonalid mores. Finally, they were able to get down to the business at hand, Ood Clavin sitting with considerable comfort in the carefully designed chair which could be snapped into almost any shape, Marlowe bulking behind his desk, Meade sitting somewhat nervously beside him. Now, as I understand it, Ood Clavin, Marlowe began, you'd like to learn something of our policies and methods. That is correct, Marlowe and Meade. The Devonalid extracted a block of opaque material from the flat wallet at his side and steadied it on his knee. I have your permission to take notes? Please do. Now, as it happens, Mr. Meade and I are currently considering a case which perfectly illustrates our policies. Ud Clavin immediately traced a series of ideographs on the note block, and Marlowe wondered if he was actually going to take their conversation down verbatim. He shrugged mentally. He'd have to ask him, at some later date, whether he'd missed anything. Undoubtedly, there'd be a spare recording of the tape he himself was making. To begin, as you know, our government is founded upon principles of extreme personal freedom. There are no arbitrary laws governing expression, worship, the possession of personal weapons, or the rights of personal property. The state is construed to be a mechanism of public service, operated by the body politic, and the actual regulation and regimentation of society is accomplished by natural socio-economic laws, which, of course, are both universal and unavoidable. We pride ourselves on the high status of the individual in comparison to the barely tolerable existence of the state. We do, naturally, have ordinances and injunctions governing crimes, but even these are usually superseded by civil action at the personal level. Marlowe leaned forward a trifle. Forgetting exact principles for a moment, Utclavin, you realize that the actuality will sometimes stray from the ideal. Our citizens, for example, do not habitually carry weapons except under extraordinary conditions. But that is a civil taboo rather than a fixed amendation of our Constitution. I have no doubt that some future generation, mores having shifted, will, for example, revive the Code Duello. Ud Clavin nodded. Quite understood. Thank you, Marlowe. Good. Now to proceed. Under conditions such as those, the state and its agencies cannot lay down a fixed policy of any sort and expect it to be in the least permanent. The people will not tolerate such regulation, and with each new shift in social mores, and the institution of any policy is itself sufficient to produce such a shift within a short time. Successive policies are repudiated by the body politic, and new ones must be instituted. Marlowe leaned back and spread his hands. Therefore, he said with a rueful smile, it can be fairly said that we have no foreign policy, effectively speaking. We pursue the expedient, Ud Clavin, and hope for the best. The case which Mr. Meade and I are currently considering is typical. The Union, as you know, maintains a general survey corps whose task it is to map the galaxy, surveying such planets as harbor alien races or seem suitable for human colonization. 
Such a survey team, for example, first established contact between your people and ours. Exchange observation rights are worked out, and representatives of both races are given the opportunity to acquaint themselves with the society of the other. In the case of unoccupied, habitable planets, however, the state's function ceases with the filing of a complete and definitive survey at the Under-Ministry for Immigration. The state, as a state, sponsors no colonies and makes no establishments except for the few staging bases which are maintained for the use of the survey corps. We have not yet found any need for the institution of an offensive service analogous to a planetary army, nor do we expect to. War in space is possible only under extraordinary conditions, and we foresee no such contingency. All our colonization is carried out by private citizens who apply to Mr. Mead here for options on suitable unoccupied planets. Mr. Mead's function is to act as a consultant in these cases. He maintains a roster of surveyed human habitable planets and either simply signs the requested planet or recommends one to fit specified conditions. The cost of the option is sufficient to cover the administrative effort involved, together with sufficient profit to the government to finance further surveys. The individual holding the option is then referred to emigration, which provides copies of a prospectus taken from the general survey report and advertises the option holders asking prices on subdivisions. Again, there is a reasonable fee of a nature similar to ours, devoted to the same purposes. Then the state ceases to have any voice in the projected colonization whatsoever. It is a totally private enterprise, a simple real estate operation, if you will, with the state acting only as an advertising agency, and occasionally as the lesser of suitable transportation from Earth to the new planet. The colonists, of course, are under our protection, maintaining full citizenship unless they request independence, which is freely granted. If you would like to see it for purposes of clarification, you're welcome to examine our file on Martin Holliday, a citizen who is fairly typical of these real estate operators, and who has just filed an option on his second planet. Smiling, Marlowe extended the folder. Thank you. I should like to, Ud Clavin said, and took the file from Marlowe. He leafed through it rapidly, pausing, after asking Marlowe's leave, to make notes on some of the information, and then handed it back. Most interesting, Ud Clavin observed. However, if you'll enlighten me, this man Martin Holliday, wouldn't there seem to be very little incentive for him, considering his age, even if there is the exception of a high monetary return, particularly since his first attempt, while not a failure, was not an outstanding financial success. Marlowe shrugged helplessly. I tend to agree with you thoroughly, Ud Clavin, but, he smiled, you'll agree, I'm sure, that one Earthman's boredom is another's incentive. We are not a rigorously logical race, Ud Clavin. Quite, the Devonalid replied. Marlowe stared at his irrevocable clock. His inner phone light flickered, and he touched the switch absently. Yes, Mary? Will there be anything else, Mr. Secretary? No, thank you, Mary. Good night. Good night, sir. There was no appeal. The day was over, and he had to go home. He stared helplessly at his empty office, his mind automatically counting the pairs of departing footsteps that sounded momentarily as clerks and stenographers crossed the walk below his partly open window. Finally, he rolled his chair back and pushed himself to his feet. Disconsolate, he moved irresolutely to the window and watched the people leave. Washington, aging, crowded Washington, mazed by narrow streets, carrying the burden of the severe, unimaginative past on its grimy architecture, respired heavily under the sinking sun. The capital ought to be moved, he thought, as he'd thought every night at this time. Nearer the heart of the empire, out of this steamy bog, out of this warren. His heavy lips moved into an ironical comment on his own thoughts. 
No one was ever going to move the Empire's traditional seat. There was too much nostalgia concentrated here, along with the humidity. Some day, when the Union was contiguous with the entire galaxy, men would still call Washington an old, out-of-the-way Earth their capital. Man was not a rigorously logical race as a race. The thought of going home broke out afresh, insidiously avoiding the barriers of bemusement which he had tried to erect, and he turned abruptly away from the window, moving decisively so as to be able to move at all. He yanked open a desk drawer and stuffed his jacket pockets with candy bars, ripping the film from one and chewing it on its end, while he put the papers in his briefcase. Finally, he could not delay any longer. Everyone else was out of the building, and the robots were taking over. Metal treads spun along the corridors, bearing brooms, and the robot switchboards guarded the communications of the ministry. Soon, the char robots would be bustling into this very office. He sighed and walked slowly out, down the empty halls where no human eye could see him waddling. He stepped into his car, and as he opened the door, the automatic recording said, Home, please, in his own voice. The car waited until he was settled and then accelerated gently, pointing for his apartment. The recording had been an unavoidable but vicious measure of his own. He'd had to resort to it, for the temptation to drive to a terminal, to an airport, or a rocket field, or a railroad station, anywhere, had become excruciating. The car stopped for a pedestrian light, and a sports model bounced jauntily to a stop beside it. The driver cocked an eyebrow at Marlowe and chuckled, Hey, fatso, which one of you is the Buick? Then the light changed, the car spurted away, and left Marlowe cringing. He would not get an official car and protect himself with its license number. He would not be a coward. He would not. His fingers shaking, he tore the film from another candy bar. Marlowe huddled in his chair, the notebook clamped on one broad thigh by his heavy hand, his lips mumbling nervously while his pencil point checked off meter. Dwell in aching discontent, he muttered. No, not that. He stared down at the floor, his eyes distant. Bitter discontent, he whispered. He grunted softly with breath that had to force its way past the constricting weight of his hunched chest. Bitter dwell. He crossed out the third line, substituted the new one, and began to read the first two verses to himself. We are born of humankind. This is our destiny. To bitter dwell in discontent wherever we may be. To struggle with the burden of that which heals on us. To stake our fresh beginnings when frailer breeds have done. He smiled briefly, content. It still wasn't perfect, but it was getting closer. He continued, To pile upon the ashes of races in decease, such citadels of our kind's own, as fortify no. What are you doing, David? his wife asked over his shoulder. Flinching, he pulled the notebook closer into his lap, bending forward in an instinctive effort to protect it. The warm, loving, sighing voice went on. Are you writing another poem, David? Why, I thought you'd given that up. It's, it's nothing, really, uh, Leonora. Nothing much. Just a, a thing I've had running around in my head. Wanted to get rid of it. His wife leaned over and kissed his cheek clumsily. Why, you big old dear. I'll bet it's for me. Isn't it, David? Isn't it for me? He shook his head in almost desperate regret. I'm, I'm afraid not, uh, snorer. It's about something else, Leonora. Oh, she came around the chair and he furtively wiped his cheek with a hasty hand. She sat down facing him, smiling with entreaty. Would you read it to me anyway, David? Please, dear. Well, it's not, not, not finished yet. Not right. You don't have to, David. It's not important. Not really, she sighed deeply. He picked up the notebook, his breath cold in his constricted throat. All right, he said, the words coming out huskily. I'll read it, but it's not finished yet. If you don't want to. He began to read hurriedly, his eyes locked on the notebook, his voice a suppressed, hoarse, spasmatic whisper. 
Such citadels of our own kind, as fortify no peace, no wall can offer shelter, no roof can shield from pain. We cannot rest, we are the damned, we must go forth again, unnumbered we must. David, are you sure about those last lines? She smiled apologetically. I know I'm old-fashioned, but couldn't you change that? It seems so, so harsh. And I think you may have unconsciously borrowed it from someone else. I can't help thinking I've heard it before somewhere. Don't you think so? I don't know, my dear. You may be right about that word, but it doesn't really matter, does it? I mean, I'm not going to try to get it published or anything. I know, dear, but still. He was looking at her desperately. I'm sorry, dear, she said contritely. Please go on. Don't pay any attention to my stupid comments. They're not stupid. Please, dear, go on. His fingers clamped the edge of the notebook. Unnumbered we must wander, break, and bleed and die. Implacable as the ocean, our tide must drown the sky. What is our expiation? For what primeval crime? That we must go on marching until the crash of time. What hand has shaped so cruelly? What whim has cast such fate? Where is, in our creation, the botch that makes us great? Oh, that's good, darling. That's very good. I'm proud of you, David. I think it stinks, he said evenly. But anyway, there are two more verses. David! Grimly, he spat out the last eight lines. Why are we ever gimleted by empire's irony? Or discontent the cancer price of Earthman's galaxy? Leonora, recoiling from his cold fury, was a shaking pair of shoulders and a mass of lank hair supported by her hands on her face while she sobbed. Are our souls so much perverted, we cannot relent? Or are the stars the madman's cost for his inborn discontent? Good night, Leonora. The light flickered on Marlowe's interphone. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Good morning, Mary. What's up? Harrison's being deported from Davenil, sir. There's a civil crime charged against him, quite a serious one. Marlowe's eyebrows went up. How much have we got on it? Not too much, sir. Harrison's report hasn't come in yet. But the story's on the news broadcasts now, sir. We haven't been asked to comment yet, but immigration has been called by several news outlets, and the Ministry for Education just called here and inquired whether it would be all right to publish a general statement of their exchange students' careful instructions against violating local customs. Marlowe's glance brooded down the mass of papers piled in the tray of his inbox. Give me a tape of a typical broadcast, he said at last. Hold everything else. Present explanation to all news outlets. None now. Statement forthcoming after preliminary investigation later in the day. The ministry regrets this incident deeply and will try to settle matters as soon and as amicably as possible, etc., etc. Okay? Yes, sir. He swung his chair around to face the screen led into a side wall, and colors began to flicker and run in the field almost immediately. He steadied and sharpened, and the broadcast tape began to roll. Dateline Dovenel, Sector 3, Day 183, 2417 GST Your local news reporter on this small planet at the Union's Rim was unable today to locate for comment any of the high officials of this alien civilization directly concerned with the order for the deportation of exchange student observer Hubert Harrison charged with theft and violent assault on the person of a Devonalid citizen. Union Citizen Harrison was unavailable for comment at this time, but Topical News will present his views and other such clues when more ensues. Marlowe grunted. Journalese was getting out of hand again. That last rhyming sentence was sure to stick in the audience's brains. It might be only another advertising gimmick, but if they start doing it with the body of the news itself, it might well be to feed topical enough false leads to destroy what little reputation for comprehensibility they had left. He touched his interphone switch. Uh, Mary, what was the hooper on that broadcast? Under one percent, sir. Which meant that so far, the body politic hadn't been reached. Thank you. Is there anything else coming in? 
"'Not at the moment, sir. "'What's cabbage? "'What's dalish un Claven doing?' "'His residence is the Solar Hotel, sir. "'The management reports that he is still in his room "'and has not reserved space on any form of long-distance transportation. "'He has not contacted us either, "'and there is a strong probability that he may still be unaware of what's happened. "'How many calls did he make yesterday, "'either before or after he was here, and to whom?' "'I can get you a list in ten minutes, sir. "'Do that, Mary.' "'He switched off, sat slapping the edge of his desk with his hand, "'and switched on again. "'Mary, I want the gen serves on the Dovenil area "'to a depth of ten cubic lights.' "'Yes, sir.' "'And get me Mr. Mead on the phone, please.' "'Yes, sir.' "'Marlow's lips pulled back from his teeth as he switched off. "'He snatched a candy bar out of his drawer.' "'tore the film part way off, "'then threw it back in the drawer as his desk phone chimed. "'Here, Chris. Here, Mr. Marlowe. "'Look, Chris, has Holiday left Earth yet?' "'Yes, sir, yes, Dave. Where is he?' "'Luna, en route to Carlshaven. "'He was lucky enough to have me arrange "'for his accidentally getting a ride on a GenServe ship "'that happened to be going out that way, if you follow me,' "'Mead grinned. Get him back. The smile blanked out. I can't do that, Mr. Marlowe. He'd never be able to take it. You should have seen him when I put him on the shuttle. We doped him up with easy rest, and even then his subconscious could feel the bulkheads around him, even in his sleep. Those shuttles are small, and they don't have ports. We can't help that. We need him, and I've got to talk to him first, personally. Meade bit his lip. Yes, sir. Dave. Yes, Dave. Daily Shoot Clavin sat easily in his chair opposite Marlowe. He rested one digit on his notebook and waited. Oot Clavin, Marlowe said amiably, You're undoubtedly aware by now that your opposite number on Dovenil has been charged with a civil crime and deported. The Devonalid nodded. An unfortunate incident, one that I regret personally and which I am sure my own people would much rather not have had happen. Naturally, Barlow smiled. I simply wanted to reassure you that this incident does not reflect on your own status in any way. We are investigating our representative, and will take appropriate action, but it seems quite clear that the fault is not with your people. We have already forwarded reparations and a note of apology to your government. As further reparation... I wish to assure you personally that we will cooperate with your personal observations in every possible way. If there is anything at all you wish to know, even that might, under ordinary conditions, be considered restricted information, just call on us. Ud Clavin's crest stirred a fraction of an inch, and Marlow chuckled inwardly. Well, even a brilliant spy might be forgiven an outward display of surprise under these circumstances. The Devenalid gave him a piercing look, but Marlowe presented a featureless façade of bulk. The secretary chuckled in his mind once more. He doubted if Ud Clavin would accept the hypothesis that Marlowe did not know that he was a spy. But the Devenalid must be a sorely confused being at this point. "'Thank you, Marlowe,' he said finally. "'I am most grateful.' I am sure my people will construe it as yet another sign of the Union's friendship. I hope so, Ud Clavin, Marlowe replied. Having exchanged his last friendly lie, they went through the customary Dovenalid formula of leave-taking. Marlowe slapped his interphone switch as soon as the alien was gone. Uh, Mary, what's the latest on holiday? His shuttle lands at Idlewild in half an hour, sir. All right. Get Mr. Meade, have him meet me out front, and get an official car to take us to the field. I want somebody from immigration to go with us. Call Idlewild and have them set up a desk and chairs for four out in the middle of the field. Call the ministry for traffic and make sure that field stays clear until we're through with it. My ministerial prerogative and no back talk. I want that car in ten minutes. Yes, sir. Mary's voice was perfectly even without the slightest hint that there was anything unusual happening. Marlowe switched off and twisted his mouth. 
He picked up the genserve on the Dovenil area and began skimming it rapidly. He kept his eyes carefully front as he walked out of his office, past the battery of clerks in the outer office, and down the hall. He kept them rigidly fixed on the door of his personal elevator, which, during the day, was human-operated under the provisions of the Human Employment Act of 2302. He met Meade in front of the building and did not look into the eyes of Bussard, the man from immigration, as they shook hands. He followed them down the walk in a sweaty agony of obliviousness and climbed into the car with carefully normal lack of haste. He sat sweating, chewing a candy bar, for several minutes before he spoke. Then slowly, he felt his battered defenses reassert themselves, and he could actually look at Boussard before he turned to Meade. Now then, he rapped out a shade too abruptly before he caught himself. Here's the gen serve on the Dovenel area, Chris. Anything in it you don't know already? I don't think so, sir. Okay, dig me up a habitable planet. Even a long-term false E will do. Close to Dovenel, but not actually in their system. If it is at all possible, I want that world in a system without any rich planets, and I don't want any rich systems anywhere near it. If you can't do that, arrange for the outright sale of all mineral and other resource rights to suitable companies. I want that planet to be habitable, but I want it to be impossible for any people on it to get at enough resources to achieve a technological culture. Can do? Me shook his head. I don't know. You've got about fifteen minutes to find out. I'm going to start talking to Holiday, and when I tell him I've got another planet for him, I'll be depending on you to furnish one. Sorry to pile it on like this, but must be. Meade nodded. Right, Mr. Marlowe. That's why I draw pay. Good boy. Now, uh, Rabbit, Boussard, I want you to be ready to lay out a complete advertising and prospectus program. Straight routine work, but about four times normal speed. The toughest part of it will be following the lead that Chris and I set. Don't be surprised at anything, and act like it happens every day. Yes, Mr. Marlowe. Right. Boussard looked uncomfortable. Uh, Mr. Marlowe. Yes? About this man Harrison. I presume all this is the result of what happened to him on Dovenel. Do you think there's any foundation in truth for what they say he did? Or do you think it's just an excuse to get him off their world? Marlowe looked at him coldly. Don't be an ass, he snorted. Martin Holliday climbed slowly out of the shuttle's lock and moved fumblingly down the stairs, leaning on the attendant's arm. His face was a molted gray, and his hand shook uncontrollably. He stepped down to the tarmac and his head turned from side to side as his eyes gulped in the field's distances. Marlowe sat behind the desk that had been put up in the middle of its emptiness his eyes brooding as he looked at Holliday. Boussard stood beside him, trying nervously to appear noncommittal, while Meade went up to the shaking old man, grasped his hand, and brought him over to the desk. Marlowe shifted uncomfortably. The desk was standard size, and he had to sit far away from it. He could not feel at ease in such a position. His thick fingers went into the side pocket of his jacket and peeled the film off a candy bar, and he began to eat it, holding it in his left hand, as Meade introduced Holliday. "'How do you do, Mr. Holliday?' Marlowe said, his voice higher than he would have liked it, and he shook the man's hand. "'I'm, I'm quite pleased to meet you, Mr. Secretary,' Holliday replied. His eyes were darting past Marlowe's head. "'This is Mr. Boussard, of Immigration, and you know Mr. Meade, of course. Now I think we can all sit down.' Meade's chair was next to Holliday's, and Boussard's was to one side of the desk, so that only Marlowe, unavoidably, blocked his complete view of the stretching tarmac. First of all, Mr. Holliday, I'd like to thank you for coming back. Please believe me when I say we would not have made such a request if it were not urgently necessary. It's all right, Holliday said in a slow, apologetic voice. I, I don't mind. Marlowe winced, but he had to go on. Have you seen the news broadcast recently, Mr. Holliday? The man shook his head in embarrassment. 
No, sir. I've been asleep most of the time. I understand, Mr. Holliday. I didn't really expect you had under the circumstances. The situation is this. Some time ago, our survey ships, working out in their usual expanding pattern, encountered an alien civilization on a world designated more to on our maps, and which the natives called Ovenil. It was largely a routine matter, no different from any other alien contact which we've had. They had a relatively high technology, embracing the beginnings of interplanetary flight, and our contract teams were soon able to work out a diplomatic status mutually satisfactory to both. Social observers were exchanged, in accordance with the usual practice, and everything seemed to be going well. Holliday nodded out of painful politeness, not seeing the connection with himself. Some of his nervousness was beginning to fade, but it was impossible for him to be really at ease with so many people near him, with all of Earth's billions lurking at the edge of the tarmac. However, Marlowe went on as quickly as he could. Today our representative was deported on a trumped-up charge. Undoubtedly, this is only the first move in some complicated scheme directed against the Union. What it is, we do not know yet. But further observation of the actions of their own representative on this planet has convinced us that they are a clever, ruthless people, living in a society which would have put Machiavelli to shame. They are single-minded of purpose, and welding into a tight group whose major purpose in life is the service of the state in its major purpose, which, by all indications, is that of eventually dominating the universe. You know our libertarian society. You know that the Union government is almost powerless, and that the Union itself is nothing but a loose federation composed of a large number of independent nations tied together by very little more than the fact that we are all Earthmen. We are almost helpless in the face of such a nation as the Dovenilids. They have already outmaneuvered us once, despite our best efforts. There is no sign that they will not be able to do so again, at will. We must somehow discover what the Devonalids intend to do next. For this reason, I earnestly request that you accept our offer of another planet than the one you have optioned, closer to the Devonalid system. We are willing, under these extraordinary circumstances, to consider your credit sufficient for the outright purchase of half the planet, and Mr. Boussard here will do his utmost to get you suitable colonists for the other half as rapidly as it can be done. Will you help us, Mr. Holliday? Marlowe sank back in his chair. He became conscious of a messy feeling in his left hand, and looked down to discover the half-eaten candy bar had melted. He tried furtively to wipe his hand clean on the underside of the desk, but he knew Boussard had noticed, and he cringed and cursed himself. Holliday's face twisted nervously. I, I, I don't know. Please don't misunderstand us, Mr. Holliday, Marlowe said. We do not intend to ask you to spy for us, nor are we acting with the intention of now establishing a base of any sort on the planet. We simply would like to have a Union world near the Devonalid system. Whatever Davenil does will not have gathered significant momentum by the end of your life. You will be free to end your days exactly as you have always wished, and the precautions we have outlined will ensure that there will be no encroachments on your personal property during that time. We are planning for the next generation, when Dovenil will be initiating its program of expansion. It is then that we will need an established outpost near their borders. Yes, Holliday said hesitantly. I can understand that. I don't know, he repeated. It seems all right, and as you say, it won't matter during my lifetime, and it's more than I'd really hoped for. He looked nervously at Mead. What do you think, Mr. Mead? You've always done your best for me. Mead shot one quick glance at Marlowe. I think Mr. Marlowe's doing his best for the Union, he said finally, and I know he's fully aware of your personal interests. I think what he's doing is reasonable under the circumstances, and I think his proposition to you, as he's outlined it, is something which you cannot afford to not consider. The final decision is up to you, of course. Holliday nodded slowly, staring down at his hands. Yes, yes, I think you're right, Mr. Meade. He looked up at Marlowe. I'll be glad to help, 
and I'm grateful for the consideration you have shown me. Not at all, Mr. Holliday. The union is in your debt. Marlowe wiped his hand on the underside of the desk again, but he only made matters worse, for his fingers picked up some of the chocolate he had removed before. Mr. Mead, will you give Mr. Holliday the details on the new planet, he said, trying to get his handkerchief out without smearing his suit. He could almost hear Boussard snickering. Holliday signed the new option contract and shook Marlowe's hand. I'd like to thank you again, sir. Looking at it from my point of view, it is something for nothing, at least, while I'm alive. And it's a very nice planet, too, from the way Mr. Meade described it, even better than Carlshaven. Nevertheless, Mr. Holliday, Marlowe said, you have done the Union a great service. We would consider it an honor if you allowed us to enter your planet in our records under the name of Holliday. He kept his eyes away from Meade. Martin Holliday's eyes were shining. Thank you, Mr. Marlowe, he said huskily. Marlowe could think of no reply. Finally, he simply nodded. It's been a pleasure meeting you, Mr. Holliday. We've arranged transportation, and your shuttle will be taking off very shortly. Holliday's face began to bead with fresh perspiration at the thought of bulkheads enclosing him once more, but he managed to smile, and then asked hesitantly, May I, may I wait for the shuttle out here, sir? Certainly. We'll arrange for that. Well, goodbye, Mr. Holliday. Goodbye, Mr. Marlowe. Goodbye, Mr. Boussard. And goodbye, Mr. Meade. I don't suppose you'll be seeing me again. Good luck, Mr. Holliday, Meade said. Marlowe twisted awkwardly in the car's back seat, wiping futilely at the long smear of chocolate on his trouser pocket. Well, he thought, at least he'd given the old man his name on the star maps until Earthmen stopped roving. At least he'd given him that. Meade was looking at him. I don't suppose we've got time to let him die in peace, have we? he asked. Marlowe shook his head. I suppose we'll have to start breaking him immediately, won't we? Marlowe nodded. I'll get at it right away, sir. Dave, does everybody have to hate me? Can't anyone understand? Even you, Creed, even you, Meade. Daly Shoot Clavin stooped and withered, sat hopelessly opposite Marlowe, who sat behind his desk like a grizzled polar bear, his thinning mane of white hair unkempt and straggling. Marlowe, my people are strangling, the old Dovenalid said. Marlowe looked at him silently. The Holiday Republic has signed treaty after treaty with us, and still their citizens raid our mining planets, driving away our own people, stealing the resources we must have if we are to live. Marlowe sighed. There's nothing I can do. We have gone to the Holiday government repeatedly, Udclavin pleaded. They tell us the raiders are criminals, that they're doing their best to stop them, but they still buy the metal the raiders bring them. They have to. Marlowe said. There are no available resources anywhere within practicable distances. If they're to have any civilization at all, they've got to buy from the outlaws. But they are members of the Union, Ud Clavin protested. Why don't you do anything to stop them? We can't, Marlowe said again. They're members of the Union, yes, but they're also a free republic. We have no administrative jurisdiction over them, and if we attempted to establish one, our citizens would rise in protest all over our territory. Then we're finished. Dovenel is a dead world. Marlowe nodded slowly. I'm very sorry. If there's anything I can do, or that the Ministry can do, we will do it. But we cannot save the Devonalid state. Ud Clavin looked at him bitterly. Thank you, he said. Thank you for your generous offer of a gracious funeral. I don't understand you, he burst out suddenly. I don't understand you people. Diplomatic lies, yes. Expediency, yes. But this, this madness, this fanatical, illogical devotion of the state in the cause of the people who will tolerate no state. This, no, this I cannot understand. Marla looked at him, his eyes full of tears. Hood Clavin, he said, you are quite right. We are a race of maniacs. And that is why Earthmen rule the galaxy. For our treaties are not binding, and our promises are worthless. Our government does not represent our people. 
It represents our people as they once were. The delay in the democratic process is such that the treaty signed today fulfills the promise of yesterday. But today the body politics has formed a new opinion, is following a new logic, which is completely at variance with that of yesterday. And Earthman's promise, expressed in words or deeds, is good only at the instant he makes it. A second later, new factors have entered into the old circumstances, and a new chain of logic has formed in his head, to be altered again a few seconds later. He thought suddenly of that poor, claustrophobic devil holiday, harried from planet to planet, never given a moment's rest, and civilizing, civilizing, spreading the race of humankind wherever he was driven. Civilizing with a fervor no hired dummy could have accomplished, driven by his fear to sell with all the real estate agent's talent that had been born in him, selling for the sake of money with which to buy that land he needed for his peace, and always being forced to sell a little too much. Bud Clavin rose from his chair. You are also right, Marlowe. You are a race of maniacs, gibbering across the stars. And know, Marlowe, that the other races of the universe hate you. Marlowe, with a tremendous effort, heaved himself out of his chair. Hate us? He lumbered around the desk and advanced on the frightened Dovinalid, who was retreating backwards before his path. Can't you see it? Don't you understand that, if we are to pursue any course of action over a long time, if we are ever going to achieve a galaxy in which an Earthman can some day live in peace with himself, we must each day violate all the moral codes and creeds which we held inviolate the day before. That we must fight against every ideal, every principle which our fathers taught us, because they no longer apply to our new logic. You hate us. He thrust his fat hand, its nails bitten down to the quick and beyond, in front of the cringing alien's eyes. You poor, weak, single-minded, ineffectual thing. We hate ourselves. End of Section 5 Section 6 of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. McIlvain Star by August Derleth McIlvain sat down to his machine, turned complex knobs, and a message flamed across the void. Old Thaddeus McIlvain discovered a dark star and took it for his own. Thus he inherited a dark destiny. Or did he? Call them what you like, said Tex Harrigan. Lost people or strayed, crackpots or warp geniuses. I know enough of them to fill an entire department of queer people. I've been a reporter long enough to have run into quite a few of them. For example, I said, recognizing Harrigan's mellowness. Take Thaddeus McIlvain, said Harrigan. I've never heard of him. I suppose not, said Harrigan. But I knew him. He was an eccentric old fellow who had a modest income, enough to keep up his hobbies, which were three. He played cards and chess at a tavern called Bixby's on North Clark Street. He was an amateur astronomer, and he had the fixed idea that there was life somewhere outside this planet and that it was possible to communicate with other beings. But unlike most others, he tried it constantly with queer machinery he had rigged up. Well now, this old fellow had a trio of cronies, with whom he played on occasion down at Bixby's. He had no one else to confide in. He kept them up with his progress among the stars and his communication with other life in the cosmos beyond our own, and they made a great joke out of it. From all I could gather, I suppose, because he had no one else to talk to. McIlvain took it without complaint. Well, as I said, I never heard of him until one morning the city editor, it was old Bill Henderson then, called me in and said, Harrigan, we've just got a lead on a fellow named Thaddeus McIlvain, who claims to have discovered a new star. Amateur astronomer up North Clark. Find him and get a story. So I set out to track him down. It was a great moment for Thaddeus McIlvain. He sat down among his friends almost portentously, adjusted his spectacles, and peered over them in his usual manner, 
halfway between a querulous oldster and a reproachful schoolmaster. "'I've done it,' he said quietly. "'Aye, and what?' asked Alexander testily. "'I discovered a new star.' "'Oh,' said Leopold flatly, "'a cinder in your eye. "'It lies just off Arcturus,' McIlvain went on, "'and it would appear to be coming closer.' "'Give it my love,' said Richardson, with a wry smile. "'Have you named it yet? "'Or don't the discoverers of new stars name them any more? "'McIlvain Star, that's a good name for it. "'A hard port of Actorus, with special displays on windy nights.' "'McIlvain only smiled. "'It's a dark star,' he said presently. "'It doesn't have light.' "'He spoke almost apologetically, "'as if somehow he had disappointed his friends.' "'I'm going to try and communicate with it.' "'That's the ticket,' said Alexander. "'Cut for a deal,' said Leopold. "'That was how the news about McIlvain's star was received by his cronies. "'Afterward, after McIlvain had dutifully played several games of Euchre, "'Richardson conceived the idea of telephoning the globe to announce McIlvain's discovery. "'The old fellow took himself seriously,' Harrigan went on. "'and yet he was so damned mousy about it. "'I mean, you got the impression that he had been trying for so long "'that now he hardly believed in his star himself any longer. "'But there it was. "'He had a long, detailed story of its discovery, "'which was an accident, as those things usually are. "'They happen all the time, and his story sounded convincing enough. "'Just the same, you didn't feel that he really had anything.' I took down notes, of course. That was routine. I got a picture of the old man, with never an idea we'd be using it. To tell the truth, I carried my notes around with me for a day or so before it occurred to me that it wouldn't do any harm to put a call into Yerkes Observatory up in Wisconsin. So I did, and they confirmed McIlvain's star. The Globe had the story, did it up in fine style. It was two weeks before we heard from McIlvain again. That night McIlvain was more than usually diffident. He was not like a man bearing a message of considerable importance to himself. He slipped into Bixby's, got a glass of beer, and approached the table where his friend sat, almost with trepidation. "'It's a nice evening for me,' he said quietly. Richardson grunted. Leopold said, "'By the way, Mac,' "'Whatever became of that star of yours, the one the papers wrote up?' "'I think,' said McIlvain cautiously, "'I'm quite sure. I have got in touch with them. "'Only,' his brow wrinkled and furrowed, "'I can't understand their language.' "'Ah,' said Richardson, with an edge to his voice, "'the thing for you to do is to tell them that's your star, "'and they'll have to speak English from now on, "'so you can understand them.' Why, next thing we know, you'll be getting yourself a rocket or a spaceship and going over to that star to set yourself up as king or something. King Thaddeus I, said Alexander loftily. All you star dwellers may kiss the royal foot. That would be unsanitary, I think, said McIlvain, frowning. Poor McIlvain. They made him the butt of their jests for over an hour before he took himself off to his quarters where he sat himself down before his telescope and found his star once more, almost huge enough to blot out Actress, but not quite, since it was moving away from that amber star now. McIlvain's star was certainly much closer to Earth than it had been. He tried once again to contact it with his homemade radio, and once again he received a succession of strange, rhythmic noises which he could not doubt were speech of some kind or other, a rasping, grating speech, to be sure, utterly unlike the speech of McIlvain's own kind. It rose and fell, became impatient, urgent, despairing. McIlvain sensed all this and strove mightily to understand. He sat there for perhaps two hours when he received the distant impression that someone was talking to him in his own language, but there was no longer any sound on the radio. He could not understand what had taken place but in a few moments he received the clear conviction that the inhabitants of his star had managed to discover the basic elements of his language by the simple process of reading his mind, and were now prepared to talk with him. 
What manner of creatures inhabited the earth, they wished to know. McIlvain told them. He visualized one of his own kind and tried to put him into words. It was difficult, since he could not rid himself of the conviction that his interlocutors might be utterly alien. They had no perception of man and doubted man's existence on any other star. There were plant people on Venus, and people on Andromeda, six-legged and four-armed beings which were equal parts mineral and vegetable on Betelgeuse, but nothing resembling man. You are evidently alone of your kind in the cosmos, said his interstellar correspondent. What about you? cried McIlvain with unaccustomed heat. Silence was his only answer, but presently he conceived a mental image which was remarkable for its vividness. But the image was nothing he had ever seen before, of thousands upon thousands of miniature beings, utterly alien to man. They resembled amphibious insects, with thin, elongated heads, large eyes, and antennae set upon a scaled, four-legged body, with rudimentary beetle-like wings. Curiously, they seemed ageless. He could detect no difference among them. All appeared to be the same age. "'We are not, but we rejuvenate regularly,' said the creature with whom he corresponded in this strange manner. "'Did they have names?' McIlvain wondered. "'I am Guru,' said the star's inhabitant. "'You are McIlvain. "'And the civilization of their star?' Instantly he saw in his mind's eye vast cities, which rose from beneath a surface which appeared to bear no vegetation recognizable to any human eye, in a terrain which seemed to be desert, of monolithic buildings, which were windowless and had openings only of sufficient size to permit the free passage of its dwarf dwellers. Within the buildings was evidence of a great and old civilization. You see... McIlvain really believed all this. What an imagination the man had! Of course, the boys at Bixby's gave him a bad time. I don't know how he stood it, but he did. And he always came back. Richardson called the story in. He took a special delight in deviling McVane, and I was sent out to see the old fellow again. You couldn't doubt his sincerity, and yet he didn't sound touched. But, of course, that part about the insect-like dwellers of the star comes straight out of Wells, doesn't it? I put in. Wells and scores of others, said Harrigan. Wells was probably the first writer to suggest insectivorous inhabitants on Mars. His were considerably larger, though. Go on. Well, I talked with McIlvain for quite a while. He told me all about their civilization and about his friend Guru. You might have thought he was talking about a neighbor of his I had only to step outside to meet. Later on I dropped around at Bixby's and had a talk with the boys there. Richardson let me in on the secret. He had decided to rig up a connection to McIlvain's machine and do a little talking to the old fellow, making him believe Guru was coming through in English. He meant to give McIlvain a harder time than ever, and once he had him believing everything he planned to say, they would wait for him at Bixby's and let him make a fool of himself. It didn't work out that way, however. McIlvain, can you hear me? McIlvain started with astonishment. His mental impression of Guru became confused. The voice speaking English came clear as a bell, as if from no distance at all. Yes, he said hesitantly. Well, then, listen to me, listen to Guru. We have now had enough information from you to suit our ends. Within twenty-four hours, we, the inhabitants of Ali, will begin a war of extermination against Earth. But why? cried McIlvain, astounded. The image before his mind's eye cleared. The cold, precise features of Guru betrayed anger. There is interference, the thought image informed him. Leave the machine for a few moments while we use the disintegrators. Before he left the machine, McIlvain had the impression of a greater machine being attached to the means of communication, which the inhabitants of his star were using to communicate with him. McIlvain's story was that a few moments later there was a blinding flash just outside his window, continued Harrigan. 
There was also a run of instantaneous fire from the window to his machine. When he had collected his wits sufficiently, he ran outside to look. There was nothing there but a kind of grayish dust in a little mound, as if, as he put it, somebody had cleaned out a vacuum bag. He went back in and examined the space from the window to the machine. There were two thin lines of dust there, hardly perceptible, just as if something had been attached to the machine and let outside. Now the obvious supposition is naturally that it was Richardson out there, and that the lines of dust from the window to the machine represented the wires he had attached to his microphone while McIlvaine was at Bixby's entertaining his two other cronies. But this is fact, not fiction, and the point of the episode is that Richardson disappeared from that night on. You investigated, of course, I asked. Harrigan nodded. Quite a lot of us investigated. The police might have done better. There was a gang war on in Chicago just at that time, and Richardson was nobody with any connections. His nearest relatives weren't anxious about anything, but what they might inherit, to tell the truth. His cronies at Bixby's were the only people who worried about him. McIlvaine was much as the rest of them. Oh, they gave the old man a hard time, all right. They went through his house with a fine-tooth comb. They dug up his yard, his cellar, and generally put him through it, figuring he was a natural to hang a murder rap on. But there was just nothing to be found, and they couldn't manufacture evidence when there was nothing to show that McIlvaine ever knew that Richardson was planning to have a little fun with him. And no one had seen Richardson there. There was nothing but McIlvaine's word that he had heard what he said he heard. He needn't have volunteered that, but he did. After the police had finished with him, they wrote him off as a harmless nut. But the question of what happened to Richardson wasn't solved from that day to this. People have been known to walk out of their lives, I said, and never come back. Oh, sometimes they do. Richardson didn't. Besides, if he walked out of his life here, he did so without more than the clothing he had on. So much was missing from his effects, nothing more. And McIlvaine? Harrigan smiled thinly. He carried on. You couldn't expect him to do anything less. After all... He had worked out most of his life trying to communicate with the worlds outside, and he had no intention of resigning his contact, no matter how much Richardson's disappearance upset him. For a while he believed that Guru had actually disintegrated Richardson. He offered that explanation, but by that time the dust had vanished, and he was laughed out of face. So he went back to the machine and Guru and the little excursions to Bixby's. "'What's the latest word from that star of yours?' asked Leopold when McIlvaine came in. "'They want to rejuvenate me,' said McIlvaine, with a certain shy pleasure. "'What's that?' asked Alexander sourly. "'They say they can make me young again. "'Like them up there. They never die. "'They just live so long. "'And then they rejuvenate. They begin all over. "'It's some kind of a process they have.' "'And I suppose they're planning to come down and fetch you up there and give you the works, is that it?' asked Alexander. "'Well, no,' answered McIlvaine. "'Guru says there's no need for that. It can be done through the machine. They can work it like the disintegrators. It puts you back to thirty or twenty or whatever you like.' "'Well, I'd like to be twenty-five myself again,' admitted Leopold. "'I'll tell you what, Mac,' said Alexander. You go ahead and try it, then come back and let us know how it works. If it does, we'll all sit in. Better make your will first, though, just in case. Oh, I did, this afternoon. Leopold choked back a snicker. Don't take this thing too seriously, Mac. After all, we're short one of us now. We'd hate to lose you, too. McIlvaine was touched. Oh, I wouldn't change, he hastened to assure his friends. I'd just be younger, that's all. They'll just work on me through the machine, and overnight I'll be rejuvenated. That's certainly a little trick that's got it all over the monkey glands, conceded Alexander, grinning. Those little bugs on that star of yours have made scientific progress, I'd say, said Leopold. They're not bugs, said McIlvaine, with faint indignation. 
They're people, maybe not just like you and me, but they're people just the same. He went home that night filled with anticipation. He had done just what he had promised himself he would do, arranging everything for his rejuvenation. Guru had been astonished to learn that people on earth simply died when there was no necessity of doing so. He had made the offer to rejuvenate McIlvain himself. McIlvain sat down to his machine and turned the complex knobs until he was in rapport with his dark star. He waited for a long time, it seemed, before he knew his contact had been closed. Guru came through. "'Are you ready, McIlvain?' he asked soundlessly. "'Yes, all ready,' said McIlvain, trembling with eagerness. "'Don't be alarmed now. It will take several hours,' said Guru. "'I'm not alarmed,' answered McIlvain. And indeed he was not. He was filled with an exhilaration akin to mysticism, and he sat waiting for what he was certain must be the experience above all others in his prosaic existence. McIlvain's disappearance coming so close on Richardson's gave us a beautiful story, said Harrigan. The only trouble was, it wasn't new when the globe got round to it. We had lost our informant in Richardson. It never occurred to Alexander or Leopold to telephone us or anyone about McIlvain's unaccountable absence from Bixby's. Finally, Leopold went over to McIlvain's house to find out whether the old fellow was sick. A young fellow opened up. "'Where's McIlvain?' Leopold asked. "'I'm McIlvain,' the young fellow answered. "'Thaddeus McIlvain,' Leopold explained. "'That's my name,' was the only answer he got. "'I mean the Thaddeus McIlvain who used to play cards with us over at Bixby's,' said Leopold. He shook his head. "'Sorry, you must be looking for someone else.' "'What are you doing here?' Leopold asked them. "'Why, I inherited what my uncle left,' said the young fellow. "'And sure enough, when Leopold talked to me "'and persuaded me to go around with him to McIlvain's lawyer, "'we found that the old fellow had made a will "'and left everything to his nephew, a namesake. "'The stipulations were clear enough. "'Among them was the express wish that if anything happened to him, "'the elder Thaddeus McIlvain, of no matter what nature,' but particularly something allowing a reasonable doubt of his death, the nephew was still to be permitted to take immediate possession of the property and effects. "'Of course, you called on the nephew,' I said. Harrigan nodded. "'Sure. That was the indicated course in any event. It was routine for both the press and the police. There was nothing suspicious about his story. It was straightforward enough, except for one or two little details.' He never did give us any precise address. He just mentioned Detroit once. I called up a friend on one of the papers there and put him up to looking up Thaddeus McIlvain. The only young man of that name he could find appeared to be the same man as the present inhabitant's uncle, though the description fit pretty well. There was a resemblance then. Oh, sure. One could have imagined that old Thaddeus McIlvain had looked somewhat like his nephew when he himself was a young man. But don't let the old man's rigmarole about rejuvenation make too deep an impression on you. The first thing the young fellow did was to get rid of that machine of his uncle's. Can you imagine his uncle having done something like that? I shook my head but I could not help thinking what an ironic thing it would have been if there had been something to McIlvain's story, and in the process to which he had been subjected from out of space, he had not been rejuvenated so much as sent back in time, in which case he would have no memory of the machine nor of the use to which it had been put. It would have been as ironic for the inhabitants of McIlvain's star, too, they would doubtless have looked forward to keeping this contact with earth open and failed to realize that McIlvain's construction differed appreciably from theirs. He virtually junked it, said he had no idea what it could be used for, and didn't know how to operate it. And the telescope? Oh, he kept that. He said he had some interest in astronomy and meant to develop that if time permitted. So much ran in the family, then. Yes, more than that. Old McIlvain had a trick of seeming shy and self-conscious. So did this nephew of his. Wherever he came from, his origins must have been backward. 
I suspect he was ashamed of them, and if I had to guess, I'd put him in the Kentucky Hill Country or the Ozarks. Modern concepts seem to be pretty well too much for him, and his thinking would have been considerably more natural at the turn of the century. I had to see him several times. The police chivied him a little, but not much. He was so obviously innocent of everything that there was nothing for them in him. And the search for the old man didn't last long. No one had seen him after that last night at Bixby's, and since everyone had already long since concluded that he was mentally a little off-center, it was easy to conclude that he had wandered away somewhere, probably an amnesiac. That he might have anticipated that is indicated in the hasty preparation of his will, which came out of the blue, said Barnval, who drew it up for him. I felt sorry for him. For whom? The nephew. He seemed so lost, you know, like a man who wanted to remember something, but couldn't. I noticed that several times when I tried to talk to him, I had the feeling each time that there was something he wanted desperately to say. It hovered always on the rim of his awareness, but somehow there was no bridge to it, no clue to put it into words. He tried so hard for something he couldn't put his finger on. What became of him? Oh, he's still around. I think he found a job somewhere. As a matter of fact, I saw him just the other evening. He had apparently just come from work, and he was standing in front of Bixby's with his face pressed to the window looking in. I came up nearby and watched him. Leopold and Alexander were sitting inside, a couple of lonely old men looking out, and a lonely young man looking in. There was something in McIlvaine's face, that same thing I had noticed so often before, a kind of expression that seemed to say there was something he ought to know, something he ought to remember, to do, to say, but there was no way in which he could reach back to it. Or forward, I said with a wry smile. As you like, said Harrigan. Pour me another, will you? I did, and he took it. That poor devil, he muttered. He'd be happier if he could only get back to where he came from. Wouldn't we all? I asked. But nobody ever goes home again. Perhaps McIlvain never had a home like that. You'd have thought so if you could have seen his face looking in at Leopold and Alexander. Oh, it may have been a trick of the street light there. It may have been my imagination. But it sticks to my memory, and I keep thinking how alike the two were. Old McIlvain trying so desperately to find someone who could believe him, and his nephew now trying just as hard to find someone to accept him or a place he could accept on the only terms he knows. End of Section 6 Section 7 of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE SUN KING by Gaston de Rowe The people of Parsia forgot their god, and worshipped only murder and sin. But then the virgin Tuche gave birth to a male child. Before the flood, even before Egypt's greatness, the world was divided into three main countries, named Javath, Shem, and Arabinia. There were other less populated lands and places, Europa in the west, Helesta in the north, and the two great lands of the far west, called north and south Gautama. Now, at the juncture of the borders of the three greatest countries, lay a mighty city named Oas. It was the capital city of the Arabian nation called Parsia. Its temple of skulls was the greatest known to any traveler, but the temples built to the god Mazda and his son Ehua Mazda were empty and unadorned. The people had forgotten God. Soki, king of Oas, sent out his armies throughout Javath, China, conquering and slaying, bringing back ever more skulls for the Golgotha temples, more gold and more slaves for the enriching of King Soki. His harem was the greatest of buildings of the mighty city, and his wives beyond man's ability to count. 
Tuche was one of the finest ornaments of the city of Oas. Tuche was slim. Her breasts were two mounds of magic. Her eyes were pools of mystic green depths. Her legs were subtle, sinuous beauty. But Tuche was a virgin, and in all that city of a million sinful souls, she alone held aloof from the sins of the flesh. Which was very strange, for Tuche became big with child, though she had not been with a man. Which came to the ears of Soki, upon his great black throne supported on a tower of human skulls, in his palace of Gran, across from the great Golgotha, which was built entirely of human skulls, the skulls of people conquered by the armies of Persia, over which the city of Oas reigned. Soki shook his big belly under the lion's skin, let slip his serpent-skinned headdress, and let the battle-axe that was his symbol of office drop from his hand as he shook with mirth at the great and thumping lie told by Tuche. I suppose her child was fathered by Mazda, peering into her womb with his all-light. He laughed, Soki, for in Oas it was not the fashion to worship the god Mazda any more. The great skull temples had their priests and their sacrifices, but no more did people bow down in the temples of Mazda, or have anything but ridicule for those few who did still worship in the old way. His serpent-skin headdress and battle-axe scepter, too, were relics from the past, just as the belief in Mazda, but more potent relics by far. With them he was the Sun King, Lord of Battles, Master of Life and Death, Creator of the Universe, Lord of Souls, Maker of the Law, etc. Without them he was just old Soki, getting fatter and more stupid every day. Bring this harlot before me, to see if she can produce a miracle to prove her child is not a common one. If she cannot, she will be stoned to death at once, do you hear? I have no time to be bothered with the lies of every sinning woman who seeks to hide her bastard's origin. Asha, the philosopher who had told his king of the birth of the child, nodded his head sadly and left the presence. Why did kings have to get so blown up as to be inhuman? He sympathized with the girl and her predicament. If it had been his to say, he would have had the child proclaimed divine a thousand times in preference to shedding one drop of her blood. But then he had seen Tu Chi sauntering home from the well with her water jug on her head and her hips the focal point of all eyes in the street. Asha smiled and took his grey-headed, bent, unnoticed figure back down the streets to the house of Tu Che. As he went, he pondered gloomily on the fate of this great city under the heartless and ignorant Soki. Surely something dreadful would happen to Parsia, laying as it did at the juncture of the lands of the three mightiest kingdoms of the world. Japheth, China, Shem, Africa, and Arabinia, any one of them could crush them, did they get themselves organized for it. And Soki preyed upon them all ruthlessly, knowing they could never stop warring interiorly long enough to attack him. Old Asha thought of the future, which his star studies were supposed to give him power to foretell, and of the great flood that was to come and wipe out all the old boundaries and nations. He thought of the peculiar grey-blue sky, which the wise men had taught him bore up within its whirling self-vast oceans of water, waiting for the time to drop the whirling water-shell upon them all. He thought of Europa, the great land in the west, and all her peoples. He thought of Haleste, that mighty and gracious land in the north, and all her beautiful and strong and courageous people. And he thought of the true great lands of the far west, called North and South Gautama. And he was sad, for they were all to die in the great deluge to come. But the time was not yet come. Sadly he pushed among the stalwart copper-colored men of Oas, gazing a little wistfully at the women's proud breasts and the strong young hues of their lovers beside them. If only he were young again, Asha sighed, and knocked upon the low rude door of the house of Tuche. 
the smile of the beautiful Tuche made him welcome, very proud to have the wise man come from the court inquire after her child. "'He worries me, wise Asha,' said Tuche, moving slim and supple, as a panther to sit protectively beside the little cradle of bent ash boughs lashed together with strips of hide. "'He talks like a grown man, and him not yet weaned. Hmm. Old Asha looked down upon the over-large infant solemnly looking back at him. He nearly fainted when the tiny red lips opened, and a strange, small voice, cultured and adult, said, I am not the child you see, but your god, Mazda, speaking through the child's lips. Asha pondered only for a moment, then turned in anger upon the woman, Tuche. I pitied you, harlot because the king has ordered your death if you did not produce a miracle. But I did not think you would hide a man behind the child's cradle to befool me. Old Asha, what do you take me for? Tuche broke into tears, bending her graceful neck and sobbing to hear that the king had decreed death for her. But the peculiar voice came again from the child's mouth. Take me in your arms, Asha. Feeling very foolish, but unable to refuse for some mysterious reason, Asha bent and picked up the child. O oh man, temper thy judgment with patience and wisdom. Asha knew now that it was the child's voice truly, and at last asked, Why do you come in such a weak and helpless guise, O Lord Mazda? I had hoped to see a god appear in stronger shape. Nevertheless, through this helpless child in your arms, this city shall be overthrown, yourself made king of kings, and I shall deliver all the slaves and strike off all the bonds from the old time. Mazda will have this city for his own, or it will be destroyed forever. Now Asha was filled with wonder and asked the babe of many obtruse things, receiving answers beyond his understanding. So at last convinced, he put the babe down, turned to Tuche. Listen, maiden, who in my eyes is without fault. I cannot go to my king and tell him one word of what this child has revealed, for I would only die with both of you as a liar and worse. You must take this child and hide him away from the eyes and the ears of the men of this city. You in your innocence do not understand the ways of kings and courts and warriors and such things. Flee, for if you are here tomorrow, you will die, and your child will die with you. Asha took himself out then, and made his way sadly along the crowded streets to his home. There he packed up a few belongings and left to go into hiding himself, for he knew better than try to tell Soki any such cock-and-bull story. Yet if he went at all to Soki, he had to tell something— and either way someone would be doomed, if not himself. Tuche took up the babe and fled through the city by night to the home of one Kojan, a maker of songs. This man had long made love to her with his poetry and his voice from afar, and she knew he would hide her and protect her. Her heart was in her throat, because she wondered if he would believe in her virtue now that she had had a child, or in her love for him when he felt that another had given her child when he had been denied the privilege. Slender and dark-eyed and handsome he stood in his doorway, looking upon this girl who had come to him with her babe in her arms. A babe by another! His heart was hurt. Tears came unbidden to his eyes as he turned and allowed her to enter. For a long time he could not speak. The shame and the hurt and pride and the strange new sudden emotions in him not suffering him to talk. At last he said, Touche, I love you, and I cannot deny you anything. If you put this shame upon me, I will bear it as my own. Consider this your home, and me as your slave. If I did not love you, I would not bear this, but I do. Touche saw the conflicting emotions upon his face how his dark red lips struggled to remain firm, how his thin, wide nostrils trembled, how his eyes were wet with unshed tears, how his shoulders bowed as with a sudden burden. Oh, my dear Kajan, I have no other friend to whom I can turn, and that I thought of you, 
who has only loved me from afar with your eyes and your soft sad songs should tell you that i bring you no shame or insult this is not the child of another man for i have been with no man ever this is a child of the legends a son of a god in the skies our god mazda he is a miracle as hard for me to believe as for you but it is true Tuche could not stand the unbelieving eyes of Kojan, who thought that Tuche lied, and looked down at the sleeping babe in her arms, saying with a pitiful voice, Please, little stranger who talks like a wise man, wake and tell my Kojan that you are not the son of a man, but the son of one whom no maid could resist or run away from, ever. Tell him, little one and Mazda heard Tuche imploring speech of her child, and made it to speak with his own voice. Kojan, what my mother says is true. I am the child of the All-Light, endowed with powers beyond ordinary men, to accomplish my lord's mysterious purposes here on earth. Do not hold my mother the less for my birth. Kojan sank slowly to his knees, realization stealing over him as he heard the adult words issue from the suckling babe's mouth. The unleashed tears began to pour from his eyes in relief, for he knew now that Tuche might not love him yet as she would when she learned love, but at least she had given herself to no other mortal man. And the miracle of the child of a god there before him lighted up his face as his inward soul so that he took up his flute and lifted his rich deep voice in a joyous song the song of zarathustra for the legend of their people had the name of the babe to come as zarathustra and kojan knew that its name was thus now tuche dwelt for some time in the house of kojan and the songs of kojan were circulated among the singers of the city so that every one knew he sheltered the child of the god mazda in his home the songs of Kojan came at last to the king's ears, and as one of the songs proclaimed Zarathustra as stronger in one finger than all the power of Soki, he let out a great oath and set his soldiers to find Tuche and the babe. But Kojan heard of the search. He took Tuche and her babe out of the gates in the night and went off into the forest and joined a band of Listians who are raisers of goats and a fine, strong people. Now when the search failed to find the babe, Soki proclaimed that every male child of the city, Oas, should be slain if the child was not found. And within a week Soki was sorry, because his own wife gave birth to a little son whose life was already forfeited by royal decree, unless Tuche and her child were found and they were not to be found in all Parisia. Asha, the old philosopher, who had been in hiding all this time, now came out of his hole and went to the king to give him counsel. As Asha progressed through the city, mothers with male children in their arms on all sides were making their way through the streets to the gates to flee the city. For no decree of a king of Oas may be repealed, but is law forevermore. The king sat upon his throne of skulls, gnawing his nails off his fingers, for he had either to slay his own son or say that a law once made by a king could be unmade. If he allowed the law to be thus abused even by himself, such was the nature of his people they would have no respect for him, and might even kill him for a fool who could not enforce his own decrees when they hurt him a little. So it was that when Asha presented himself before the king, Soki asked, What shall I do, O Asha? My son has smiled in my face. Asha was prepared for this, and answered, Thou shalt send me and thy son and thy daughter's son and every male infant to the slaughter pens, and have us all beheaded and cast into the fire. Otherwise it will become true as the infant Zarathustra prophesied. His hand will smite Oa's city, and it will fall as a heap of straw. So the king appointed a day for the slaughter, and ninety thousand male infants were adjudged to death. Kojan, from the safety of the forest, 
made a scornful song about the tyrant of Oas who went to war against babies, and it was sung everywhere in the city, and the king could do nothing about it, for it was cleverly worded, seeming to approve, though in satire only. When the day for the slaughter arrived, there were but a thousand appeared with their babes out of the ninety thousand adjudged to death, all the rest having fled to the forest as had Kojan. The king saw an excuse in this to get out of killing his own son, and stood pondering how to escape his own decree. His wife, Betraj, came before him, holding out her son, saying, Here, O king, take thou thy flesh and blood, and prove the inexorable justice of the king's decrees. But the king said, Let the officers go and collect all the others who have fled beyond the walls, and until are gathered here before me, no matter how long it takes, let the decree be suspended. Now the god Mazda moved the soldiers' minds to see their king had not the backbone to enforce his own decree when it hurt himself, and they, one and all, took up stones and stoned the king to death. Asha, standing stripped for the slaughter, was made king by the clamor of the men who stoned Soki to death. A great voice came out of the sky and announced to the people that God had given them a new and righteous ruler. Asha bowed his head and accepted the task put upon him. The people gave thanks to Mazda the god, and Asha proclaimed him all to the city. Off in the forest, Tuche lifted her eyes to those of Kojan and thanked him for saving her son. And Kojan touched her with his fingertips, and kissed her on the lips, and the child crowed lustily to see their love. These two walked through the forest of the goats, Tuche bringing beauty like a spring breeze with her, and Kojan singing and touching his harp with magic fingers, so that joy and love walked before them, announcing them to the Listians, the people of the forest. When Zarathustra, the infant child the woman bore in her arms, lifted up his piping voice and spoke to these rude wild people, their worship sprang into life, for surely these were gods come to them. And thus all the people gave up the worship of murder and became Zarathustrians. End of section 7《Section 8 of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Disowned by Victor Endersby The sky sagged downward, bellying blackly with a sudden summer rain, giving me a vision of catching my train in sodden clothing after the short cut across the fields, which I was taking in company with my brother Tristan and his fiancée. The sullen atmosphere ripped apart with an electric glare. Our ears quivered to the throbbing sky, while huge drops, jarred loose from the air by the thunder impact, splattered sluggishly, heavily about us. Little breezes swept out from the storm center, lifting the undersides of the long grass leaves to view in waves of lighter green. I complained peevishly. "'Ah, mop up,' said Tristan." "'You've plenty of time, and there's a big oak. "'It's as dry under there as a cave.' "'I think that'll be fun,' twittered Alice, "'to wait out a thunderstorm under a tree.' "'Under a tree?' I said. "'Hardly. "'I'm not hankering to furnish myself as an exhibit "'on the physiological effects of a lightning stroke. "'No, sir.' "'Rats,' said Tristan. "'All that's a fairy tale. "'Trees being dangerous in a thunderstorm.' The rain now beat through our thin summer clothing, as Tristan seized Alice's hand and told her toward the spreading shelter. I followed them at first, then began to lag with an odd unwillingness. I had been only half serious in my objection, but all at once that tree exercised an odd repulsion on me, an imaginary picture of the electric fluid coursing through my shriveling nerve channels grew unpleasantly vivid. Suddenly I knew I was not going under the tree. I stopped dead, pulling my hat brim down behind to divert the rivulet coursing down the back of my neck, calling to the others in a voice rather cracked from embarrassment. 
They looked at me curiously, and Alice began to twit me, standing in the rain while Tristan desired to know whether we thought we were a pair of goldfish. In his estimation, we might belong to the pristine tribe all right, but not to that decorative branch thereof. To be frank, he used the term suckers. Feeling exceptionally foolish, I planted myself doggedly in the soaking grass as Alice turned to dash for the tree. Then the thing happened, the thing which to this hour makes the fabric of space with its unknown forces seem an insecure and eerie garment for the body of man. Over the slight rise beyond the tree, as the air crackled, roar and shook under the thunder blasts, there appeared an object moving in long, leisurely bounds, drifting before the wind, and touching the ground lightly each time. It was about eighteen inches in diameter, globular, glowing with coruscating fires, red, green, and yellow, a thing of unearthly and wholly sinister beauty. Alice poised with one foot half raised and shrieked at Tristan, half terrified, half elated at the sight. He wheeled quickly there under the tree, and slowly backed away as the thing drifted in to keep him company in his shelter. We could not see his face, but there was a stiffness to his figure, indicating something like fear. Suddenly, things I had read rose into my memory. This was one of those objects variously called fireballs, globe lightning, meteors, and the like. I also recall the deadly explosive potencies said to be sometimes possessed by such entities, and called out frantically, Tristan, don't touch it! Get away quickly, but don't disturb the air! He heard me, and as the object wavered about in the comparative calm under the tree, drifting closer to him, started to obey. But it suddenly approached his face, and seized with a reckless terror, he snatched off his hat and batted at it as one would at a pestilent bee. Instantly there was a blinding glare, a stunning detonation, and a violent air wave which threw me clear off my feet and on to the ground. I sat up blindly with my vision full of opalescent lights and my ears ringing, unable to hear, see, or think. Slowly my senses came back. I saw Alice struggling upright in the grass before me. She cast a quick glance toward the tree, then, still on her knees, covered her face and shuddered. For a long time, it seemed, I gazed toward the tree without sight conveying any mental effect whatever. Quite aside from my dazed state, the thing was too bizarre. It gave no foothold to experience for the erection of understanding. My brother's body lay, or hung, or rested, what term could describe it, with his stomach across the underside of a large limb, a few feet above where he had stood. He was doubled up like a hairpin, his abdomen pressed tightly up against this bow, and his arms, legs, and head extended stiffly, straightly, skyward. Getting my scattered faculties and discordant limbs together, I made my way to the tree, the gruesome thought entering my mind that Tristan's body had been transfixed by some downward-pointing snag as it was blown up against the limb, and that the strange stiffness of his limbs was due to some ghastly sudden mortis brought on by electric shock. Dazed with horror and grief, I reached up to his clothing and pulled gently, braced for the shock of the falling body. It remained immovable against the bow. A harder tug brought no results either. Gathering up all my courage against the vision of the supposed snag tearing its rough length out of the poor flesh, I leaped up, grasping the body about chest and hips, and hung. It came loose at once, without any tearing resistance such as I had expected, but manifesting a strong, elastic pull upward, as though someone were pulling it with a rope. As I dropped back to the ground with it, the upward resistance remained unchanged. Nearly disorganized entirely by this phenomenon, it occurred to me that his belt or some of his clothing was still caught, and I jerked sideways to pull it loose. It did not loosen, but I found myself suddenly out from under the tree, 
my brother dragging upward from my arms until my toes almost left the ground. And there was obviously no connection between him and the tree, or between him and anything else but myself, for that matter. At this I went weak, my arms relaxed despite my will, and an incredible fact happened. I found the body sliding skyward through my futile grasp. Desperately I caught my hands clasped together about his wrist, this last grip almost lifting me from the earth. His legs and remaining arms streamed fantastically skyward. Through the haze which seemed to be finally drowning my amazed and tortured soul, I knew that my fingers were slipping through one another, and that in another instant my brother would be gone. Gone where? Why and how? There was a sudden shriek, and the impact of a frantic body against mine, as Alice, whom I'd quite forgotten, made a skyward running jump and clasped the arm frantically to her bosom with both her own. With vast relief, I loosened my cramped fingers, only to feel her silken garments begin to slide skyward against my cheek. It was more instinct than sense which made me clutch at her legs. God, had I not done that! As it was, I held both forms anchored with only a slight pull, waiting dumbly for the next move, quite non compos by this time, I think. "'Quick, Jim!' she shrieked. "'Quick, under the tree! I can't hold him long!' Very glad, indeed, to be told what to do, I obeyed. Under her direction we got the body under a low limb and wedged up against it, where our feet, both now on the ground, we balanced it with little effort. Feverishly, once more at her initiative, we took off our belts and strapped it firmly, whereupon we collapsed in one another's arms, shuddering beneath it. The blasé reader may consider that we here manifested the characters of sensitive weaklings, but let him undergo the like. The supernatural, or seemingly so, has always had the power to chill the hottest blood and here was an invisible horror reaching out of the sky for its prey, without any of the ameliorating trite features which would temper an encounter with the alleged phenomena of ghostland. For a time we sat under that fatal tree, listening to the dreary drench of rain pouring off the leaves, quivering nerve-shaken to the thunderclaps. Lacking one another, we had gone mad, it was the beginning of a mutual dependence in the face of the unprecedented, which was to grow into something greater during the bizarre days to follow. There was no need of words for each of us to know that the other was struggling frantically for a little rational light on the outer catastrophe in which we were entangled. It never once occurred to us that my brother might still be alive, until a long, shuddering groan sounded above us. In combined horror and joy we sprang up. He was twisting weakly in the belts, muttering deliriously. We unfastened him and pulled him to the ground, where I sat on his knees while she pressed down on his shoulders, and so kept him recumbent, both horrified at the insistent lift of his body under us. She kissed him frantically and stroked his cheeks, I feeling utterly without resource. He grew stronger, muttered wildly, and his eyes opened, staring upward through the tree limbs. He became silent and stiffened, gazing fixedly upward with a horror in his wild blue gaze which chilled our blood. What did he see there? What dire otherworld thing dragging him into the depths of space? Shortly his eyes closed, and he ceased to mutter. I took his legs under my arms. The storm was clearing now, and we set out for home with gruesomely buoyant steps the insistent pull remaining steady. Would it increase? We gazed upward with terrified eyes, becoming calmer by degree as conditions remained unchanged. Jim, we can't take him in like this. I stopped. Why not? Oh, because, because, it's too ridiculously awful. I don't know just how to say it. Oh, can't you see it for yourself? In a dim way, I saw it. No cultured person cares to be made a center of public interest, unless on grounds of respect. To come walking in in this fashion, buoyed balloon-like by the body of this loved one, and before the members of a frivolous, gaping house party, 
Ah, even I could imagine the mingled horror and derision, the hysterics among the women, perhaps. Nor would it stop there. Rumors, and heaven only knows what distortions such rumors might undergo, having their source in the incredible, would range our social circle like wildfire. And the newspapers, for our families are established and known, no, it wouldn't go. I tied Tristan to a stile and called up Jack Briggs, our host, from a neighboring house, explained briefly that Tristan had met with an accident, asked him to say nothing, and explained where to bring the machine. In ten minutes he had maneuvered the heavy sedan across the rough wet fields. And then we had another problem on our hands, to let Jack into what had happened without shocking him into uselessness. It was not until we got him to test Tristan's airy buoyancy with his own hands that we were able to make him understand the real nature of our problem. And after that, his comments remained largely gibberish for some time. However, he was even quicker than we were to see the need for secrecy. He had vivid visions of the political capital which opposing newspapers would make of any such occurrence at his party, and so we arranged a plan according to which we drove to the back of the house, explained to the curious who rushed out that Tristan had been injured by a stroke of lightning, and rushed the closely wrapped form up to his room, feeling a great relief at having something solid between us and the sky. While Jack went downstairs to dismiss the party as courteously as possible, Alice and I tied my brother to the bed with trunk straps whereupon the bed and patient plumped lightly but decisively against the ceiling as soon as we removed our weight. While we gazed upward open-mouthed, Jack returned. His faculties were recovering better than ours, probably because his affections were not so involved, and he gave the answer at once. "'Ah, hell,' he said. "'Pull the damn bed down and spike it to the floor.' This we did. Then we held a short but intense consultation." Whatever else might be the matter, obviously Tristan was suffering severely from shock and, for all we knew, maybe from partial electrocution. So we called up Dr. Grosnoff in the nearest town. Grosnoff, after our brief but disingenuous explanation, threw off the bed covers in a businesslike way, then straightened up grimly. "'May I ask,' he said with sarcastic politeness, since when a straitjacket has become first aid for a case of lightning stroke. He was delirious, I stammered. Delirious, my eye. He's as quiet as a lamb, and you've tied him down so tightly that the straps are cutting right into him. Of all the, the... He stopped, evidently feeling words futile, and before we could make an effective attempt to stop him, whipped out a knife and cut the straps. Tristan's unfortunate body instantly crashed against the ceiling, smashing the lathing and plaster, and remaining half embedded in the ruins. A low cry of pain arose from Alice. Dr. Grosnoff staggered to a chair and sat down, his eyes fixed on the ceiling with a steady stare, the odd caricature of a man coolly studying an interesting phenomenon. My brother appeared to be aroused by the shock struggling about in his embedment, and finally sat up. Up, down, I mean. Then he stood on the ceiling and began to walk. His nose had been bruised by the impact, and I noticed with uncomprehending wonder that the blood moved slowly upward over his lip. He saw the window and walked across the ceiling to it upside down. There he pushed the top of the window down and leaned out, gazing up into the sky with some sort of fascination. Instantly he crouched on the ceiling, hiding his eyes, while the house rang with shriek after shriek of mortal terror, speeding the packing of the parting guests. Alice seized my arm, her fingers cutting painfully into the flesh. "'Jim!' she screamed. "'I see it now, don't you? His gravity's all changed around. He weighs up. He thinks the sky's under him.' The human mind is so constructed that merely to name a thing oddly smooths its unwanted outlines to the grasp of the mind. The conception of a simple reversal of my brother's weight, I think, saved us all from the padded cell. That made it so commonplace, such an everyday sort of thing, likely to happen to anybody. 
the ordinary phenomenon of gravitation is no whit more serious in all truth than that which we are now witnessing but we are born to it dr grosnoff recovered in a manner which showed considerable caliber well he grunted that being the case we'd best be looking after him nervous shock possible electric shock and electric burns psychasthenia that's going to be a long-drawn affair bruises maybe a little concussion and possibly internal injury that was equivalent to a ten-foot unbroken fall flat on his stomach and i'll never forgive myself if get me that chair with infinite care and reassuring words the big doctor with our help pulled my brother down the latter frantically begging us not to let him fall again holding him securely on the bed and trying to reassure him grosnoff said straps and ropes won't do his whole weight hangs in them they'll cut him unmercifully take a sheet tie the corners with ropes and let him lie in that like a hammock it took many reassurances as to the strength of this arrangement before tristan was at comparative peace Dr. Grosnoff effected an examination by slacking off the ropes until Tristan lay a couple of feet clear of the bed, then himself lay on the mattress face up, prodding the patient over. The examination concluded. He informed us that Tristan's symptoms were simply those of a general physical shock, such as would be expected in the case of a man standing close to the center of an explosion though from our description of the affair he could not understand how my brother had survived at all the glimmering of an explanation of this did not come until long afterward so far as physical condition was concerned tristan might expect to recover fully in a matter of weeks mentally the doctor was not so sure the boy had gone through a terrible experience and one which was still continuing might continue no one knew how long we were said the doctor up against a trick played by the great sphinx nature and one which so far as he knew had never before taken place in the history of all mankind there is faintly taking shape in my mind he said the beginning of a theory as to how it came about but it is a theory having many ramifications and involving much in several lines of science with most of which I am but little acquainted. For the present I have no more to say than that if a theory of causation can be worked out, it will be the first step toward cure. But it may be the only step. Don't build hopes. Looking Alice and me over carefully, he gave us each a nerve sedative and departed, leaving us with the feeling that there was a man of considerable wider learning than might be expected of a small-town doctor in point of fact we learned that this was the case the specialist has been described as a man who knows more and more about less and less in dr grosnoff's mind the less and less outweighed the more and more tristan grew stronger physically mentally he was intelligent enough to help us and help himself by keeping his mind as much as possible off his condition sometimes by sheer force of will meantime dr grosnoff realizing that his patient could not be kept forever tied in bed had assisted me in preparing for his permanent care at home the device was simple we had just taken his room remodeled the ceiling as a floor and fitted it with furniture upside down most of the problems involved in this were fairly simple the matter of a bath rather stumped us for a while until we hit upon a shower the jets came up from under tristan's feet from the point of view of his perception he told us that one of the strangest of all his experiences was to see the wastewater swirl about in the pan over his head and being sucked up the drain as though drawn by some mysterious magnet my brother and i shared a flat alone so there was no servant problem to deal with but he was going to need care as well as companionship and i had to earn my living for alice it was a case where the voice of the heart chimed with that of necessity and i was best man at perhaps the weirdest marriage ceremony which ever took place on this earth held down in bed with a roped sheet all betraying signs carefully concealed 
Tristan was married to Alice by an unsuspecting domine who took it all for one of those ordinary, though romantic, sick-bed affairs. From the first, Tristan felt better and more secure in his special quarters, and was now able to move about quite freely within his limits, though such were his mental reactions that for his comfort we had to refinish the floor to look like plaster ceiling to eliminate as far as possible the upside-down suggestions left in the room, and to keep the windows closely shaded. I soon found that the sight of me, or anyone else, walking upside down to him, was very painful. Only in the case of Alice did other considerations remove the unpleasantness. Little by little the accumulation of experience brought to my mind the full and vivid horror of what the poor lad had suffered and was suffering. Why, when he had looked out of that window into the sky, he was looking down into a bottomless abyss, from which he was sustained only by the frail plaster and planking under his feet. The whole earth, with its trees and buildings, was suspended over his head, seemingly about to fall at any moment with him into the depths. The sun at noon glared upward from the depths of an inferno, lighting from below the somber earth suspended overhead. Thus the warm comfort of the sun, which has cheered the heart of man from time immemorial, now took on an unearthly, unnatural semblance. I learned that he could never quite shake off the feeling that the houses were anchored into the earth, suspended only by the embedment of their foundations in the soil, that trees were suspended from their roots, which groaned with a strain, that soil was held to the bedrock only by its cohesion. He even dreaded lest, during storms, the grip of the muddy soil be loosened, and the fields fall into the blue. It was only when clasped tight in Alice's arms that the horrors wholly left him. All the reasoning we might use on his mind, or that he himself could bring to bear on it, was useless. We found that the sense of up and down is irradicably fixed by the balancing apparatus of the body. Meanwhile, his psychology was undergoing strange alterations. The more I came to appreciate the actual conditions he was living under, the more apparent it seemed to me that he must have a cast-iron mental stamina to maintain sanity at all. But he not only did that, he began to recover normal strength, and to be irked unbearably by his constant confinement. So it came about that he began to venture a little at time to time from his room, wandering about on the ceiling of the rest of the house. However, he could not yet look out of windows, but sidled up to them with averted face to draw any blinds that were up. As he grew increasingly restless, we all felt more and more that the thing could not continue as it was. Some way out must be found. We had many a talk with Grosnoff, at last inducing him to speak about the still half-formed theory which he had dimly conceived at the first. For many decades, he said, there have been a few who regarded the close analogies between magnetism and gravitational action as symptomatic of a concealed identity between them. Einstein's field theory practically proves it on the mathematical side. Now it is obvious that if gravitation is a form of magnetism, and if so, it belongs to another plane of magnetic forces than that which we know and use, then the objects on a planet must have the opposite polarity from that of the planet itself. Since the globe is itself a magnet, with a positive and negative pole, its attraction power is not that of a magnet on any plane, because then the human race would be divided into two species, each polarized in the opposite to its own pole. When an individual of either race reached the equator, he would become weightless, and when he crossed it, would be repelled into space. Lord, I said, there would be a plot for one of your science fiction writers. I can present you with another, said Dr. Grosnoff. How do we know whether another planet would have the opposite sign to our own bodies? Well, I chuckled, they'll find that out soon enough when the first interplanetary expedition tries to land on one of them. Hmm, grunted the medico. That'll be the least of their troubles. But you said the polarity couldn't be that of a magnet. Then what? 
Don't you remember the common pith ball of your high school physics days? An accumulation of positive electricity repels an accumulation of the negative. If indeed we can correctly use accumulation for negativity, and it is my idea that the earth is the container of a gigantic accumulation of this meta or hyperelectricity which we are postulating, and our bodies contain a charge of the opposite sign. But doctor, the retention of a charge of static electricity by a body in the presence of one of the opposite sign requires insulation of the containing bodies. For instance, lightning is a breaking down of the air insulation between the ground and a cloud. In our case, we are constantly in contact with the earth, and the charges would equalize. Please bear in mind, Jim, that we are not talking about electricity as now handled by man but about some form of it yet hypothetical. We don't know what kind of insulation it would require. We may be constitutionally insulated. And you think the fireball broke down that insulation by the shock to Tristan's system? I asked. The logic of the thing was shaping up hazily, but unmistakably. But then, why don't we frequently see people kiting off the earth as the result of explosions? How do you know they haven't? Don't we have plenty of mysterious disappearances as the result of explosions, and particularly strangely large numbers of missing in a major war? My blood chilled. The world was beginning to seem a pretty awful place. Grosnoff saw my disturbance and placed a reassuring hand on my shoulder. I'm afraid, he said, smiling, that I rather yielded to the temptation to get a rise out of you. That suggestion might be unpleasantly true under special circumstances. But I particularly have an eye out for the special capacities of that weird and rare phenomenon, the fireball. It isn't impossible that the energy of the fireball went into the repolarization rather than into a destructive concussion, hence Tristan's escape. You mean its effect is quantitatively different from that of any other explosion? It may be so. It is known to be an electric conglomeration of some kind, but that's all. Meantime, circumstances weren't going well with us. The financial burden of Tristan's support, added to the strain of the situation, was becoming overwhelming. Tristan knew this and felt it keenly. This brought him to a momentous decision. He looked down at us from the ceiling one day, with an expression of unusual tenseness and announced that he was going out permanently, and to take part in the world again. I've gotten now so I can bear to look out the windows quite well. It's only a matter of time and practice until I can stand in the open. After all, it isn't any worse than being a steel worker or a steeplejack. Even if the worst came to the worst, I'd rather be burst open by the frozen vacuum of interstellar space than to splash upon a sidewalk before an admiring populace. And people do that every day. Dr. Grosnoff, who was present, expressed great delight. His patient was coming along well mentally, at least. Alice sat down trembling. But good Lord, Tristan, I said, what possible occupation could you follow? Oh, I've brooded over that for weeks, and I've come across the Rubicon. I think we're a long way past such petty things as personal pride. Did it ever occur to you that what from one point of view is a monstrous catastrophe, from another is an asset? What in the dickens are you talking about? I asked. I'm talking about the, the, he gulped painfully, the stage. Alice wrung her hands, crying bitterly. Wonderful, splendid, Tristan Le Uber, the world's unparalleled upside-down man. He doesn't know whether he's on his head or his heels. He's always up in the air about something. But you can't upset him. Bodville tonight. The Bodongo brothers. Brilliant Bernese balancers. Archigani. The prima donna of Sealdom. And Tristan Le Uber. The balloon man. He uses an anchor for a parachute. And last, indeed, the Le Uber family will have arrived sensationally in the public eye. There are, Alice raved, Two billion people on the earth today, counting three generations per century. There have been about twelve billion of us in the last two hundred years, 
and out of all those, and all the millions and billions before that, we had to be picked for this loathsome cosmic joke. Just little us, for all that distinction. Why, oh why? If our romance had to be spoiled by a tragedy smeared across the billboards of notoriety, why couldn't it have been in some decent, human sort of way? Why this ghastly absurdity? From time immemorial, said Grosnoff, there have been men who sought to excite the admiration of their fellows, to get themselves worshipped, to dominate, to collect perquisites, by developing some wonderful personal power or another. From Icarus on down, levitation or its equivalent has been a favorite. The ecstatics of medieval times, the Hindu yogis, even the daydreaming schoolboy, have had visions of floating in air before the astounding multitudes by a mere act of will. The frequency of flying dreams may indicate such a thing as a possibility in nature. Tradition says many have accomplished it. If so, it was by a reversal of polarity through an act of will. Those who did it, yogis, believed in successive lives on earth. If they were right about the one, why not the other? Suppose one who had developed that power of will carried it to another birth, where it lay dormant in the subconscious until set off uncontrolled by some special shock. Alice paled. Then Tristan might have been. He might. Then again, maybe my brain is addled by this thing. In any case, the moral is, don't monkey with nature. She's particular. Tristan's vaudeville scheme was not as easily realized as said. The first manager to whom we applied was stubbornly skeptical in spite of Tristan's appearance standing upside down in stilts heavily weighted at the ground ends, and even after his resistance was broken down in a manner which left him gasping and a little woozy, began to reason unfavorably in a hard-headed way. Audiences, he explained, were off levitation acts. Too old, no matter what you did, they'd lay it to concealed wires and yawn. Even if you called a committee from the audience, the committee itself would merely be sore at not being able to solve the trick. The audience would consider the committee a fake or merely dumb. And all that would take too much time for an act of that kind. Oh yeah, I know, it's got me going all right, but I can't think like me about this sort of thing. I got to think like the audience does, or go out of business. After which solid but unprofitable lesson in psychology, we dropped the last vestige of pride and tried a circus sideshow, but the results were similar. Nah, the rubes don't wear celluloid collars anymore. You can't slip wire tricks over on them. But he can do this in a big topless tent, or even out in an open field if you like. Nope, steel rods run up the middle of a rope, has been done before. Steel rods on a rope which the people see uncoiled from the ground in front of their eyes? Well, they'd think of something else then, I'm telling you, it won't go. Sure, people like to be fooled, but they want it to be done right. Yes, I sneered, and a hell of a lot of people have fooled themselves right about this matter too. He looked at me curiously. Say, have you really got something up your sleeve? You'd be surprised. Thus he grudgingly gave us a chance for a tryout, and he was surprised indeed. But on thinking it over, he decided like the vaudeville man. Listen, Tristan said suddenly in a voice of desperation. I'll do a parachute drop into the sky and land on an airplane. Tristan, shrieked Alice in horror. The circus man nearly lost his cigar, then bit it in two. Say, what the... I'll call that right now. I'll get you the plane and shoot if you'll put up a deposit to cover the cost. If you do that, we'll have the best money in the tents. If you don't, I keep the money. If I don't, said Tristan distinctly, I'll have not the slightest need for the money. But the airplane idea was out. We could think of no way for him to make the landing on such a swiftly moving vehicle. Again, Alice solved it. If you absolutely must break my heart and put me in a sanitarium, she sobbed, get a blimp. Of course, and that's what we did, on the first attempt coming unpleasantly close to doing just that to Alice. The blimp captain was obviously skeptical and betrayed signs of a peeve at having his machine hired for a hoax, but money was money, 
and he agreed to obey our instructions meticulously. His tone was perfunctory, however, despite my desperate attempts to impress him with the seriousness of the matter, and that nonchalance of his came near to having dire consequences. The captain was supplied with a sort of boat-hook with instructions to steer his course to reach the parachute ropes as it passed him on its upward flight, and he was seriously warned of the fact that, after the chute reached two or three thousand feet, its speed would increase because of the rarefaction of the air, and in case of a miss, it would become constantly harder to overtake. These directions he received with a scornful half-smile. Obviously, he never expected to see the chute open. We got all set, the blimp circling overhead, Tristan upside down in his seat suspended skyward, a desperately grim look on his face, and Alice almost in collapse. We were all spared the agony of several hundred feet of unbroken fall. The chute was open on the ground, and rose at a leisurely speed, but too fast at that for the comfort of any of us. I don't think the wondering crowd and the dumbfounded circus people ever saw a stranger sight than that chute drifting upward into the blue. We heard nothing of hidden wires, then or ever after. The white circle grew pitifully small and forlorn against the fathomless azure, and suddenly we noticed that the blimp seemed to be merely drifting with the wind, making no attempt to get under or over Tristan. Our hearts labored painfully, had the engines broken down? Alice buried her face against my sleeve with a moan. I can't look. Tell me. I tried to, in a voice which I vainly tried to make steady. All at once the blimp went into frenzied activity. We learned afterwards that its crew of three, the captain included, had been so completely paralyzed by the reality of the event that they had forgotten what they were there for until almost too late. Now we heard the high note of its overdriven engines as it rolled and rocked toward the rising chute. For a moment the white spot showed against its side, then tossed and pitched wildly in the wake of the propellers, as driven too hastily and frenziedly, the ship overshot its mark and the captain missed his grab. I could only squeeze Alice tightly and choke as the aerial objects parted company and the blue gap between them widened. Instantly, avid to retrieve his mistake, the captain swung his craft in a wild careen around and a spiral upward. But he tried to do too many things at a time, make too much altitude and headway both at once. The blimp pitched steeply upward to a standstill, barely moving toward the parachute. Quickly it sloped downward again and gathered speed, nearing the chute, and then making a desperate zoom upward on its momentum. Mistake number three. He had waited too long before using his elevator, and the chute fled hopelessly away just ahead of the up-tilted nose of the blimp. I could only moan, and Alice made no sound or movement. Next we saw the blimp's water ballast streaming earthward in the sun, and it was put into a long, steady spiral in pursuit of the parachute, whose speed, or so it seemed to my agonized gaze, was now noticeably on the increase. The altitude seemed appallingly great. The blimp's ceiling, I knew, was only about twenty thousand, and my brother, even if not frozen to death by that time, would be traveling far faster then than any climbing speed the blimp could make. As his fall increased in speed, the climb of the bag decreased. At last, with a quiver of renewed hope, I saw the blimp narrowing down its spirals. It was overtaking. Smaller and smaller grew both objects, but so did the gap between them. At last they merged, the tiny white dot and the little gray minnow. In one long agony I waited to see whether the gap would open out again. Lord of hosts, the blimp was slanting steeply downward. The parachute had vanished. Then at last I paid some attention to the totally limp form in my arms, and a few minutes later, amid an insane crowd, a pitiful, embarrassed, and nerve-shaking dirigible navigator was helping me lift my heavily wrapped, shivering brother from the gondola, while the mechanics turned their attention to the overdriven engines and racked framing. Did I say, helping me lift? 
such is the force of habit, but verily a new nomenclature would have to come into being to deal adequately with such a life as my poor brother's. Tristan seized my hand. Jim, he said through chattering teeth, I'm cured, and of the awful fear. That second time he missed, I just gave up entirely. I didn't care any longer. And then somehow I felt such a sense of peace and freedom. There weren't any upside-down things around to torture me. No sense of insecurity. I just was, in a great blue quiet. It wasn't like falling at all. No awful shock to meet, no sickness or pain, just quietly floating along from here to there, with no particular dividing line between anywhere. The cold hurt, of course, but somehow it didn't seem to matter, and was getting better when they caught me. But now I can do things you never even imagined. Thus began my brother's real public career. He had arrived. After that he was able to name his own compensation, and shortly during his tours began to sport a private dirigible of his own, which he often used for jumps between stands. He told me jokingly that it was very fitting transportation for him, as his hundred and sixty pound lift saved quite a bit of expense for helium. He developed an astonishing set of tricks. After the jump, he would arrive on the field suspended above the dirigible, doing trapeze tricks. After that, in the show tent, he would go through some more of them, with a few hair raisers of his own invention, one of which consisted of apparently letting go the rope by accident and shooting skyward with a wild shriek, only to be caught at the end of a fine, especially woven piano wire attached to a spring safety belt the cable being in turn fastened to the end of the rope. Needless to say, Alice was unable to wax enthusiastic about any of these feats, though she loyally accompanied him in his travels. She would sit in the tent gazing at him with horrible fascination, and month by month grew thinner and more strained. Tristan felt her stress deeply, but was making money so fast that we all felt that in a short time if not able to finance the recovery of a cure, at least he could retire and live a safer life. And he found his ideal haven of rest in a Pennsylvania coal mine. Thus, the project grew in his mind of buying an abandoned mine and fitting it with comfortable and spacious inverted quarters, environed with fungus gardens, air ferns and the like, plants which could be trained to grow upside down he emerging only for necessary sun-baths. As time went on, I really grew accustomed to the situation, though seeing less and less of Tristan and Alice. During summers they were on tour, and in winter were quartered in Tristan's coal-mine, which had become a reality. One summer day when the circus stopped at a small town where I was taking vacation, I was overjoyed at the opportunity to see them. I timed myself to get there as the afternoon performance was over, but arrived a little early, and went on in to the untopped tent. Tristan waved an inverted greeting at me from his poise on his trapeze, and I watched for a few minutes. There was an odd mood about the crowd that day, largely due to a group of loud-mouthed hillbillies from the back country, the sort of which is so ignorant as to live in perpetual fear of getting something slipped over and so believes everything it is told, looking for something ulterior behind every exterior. Having duly exposed to their own satisfaction the strong man's wooden dumbbells, the snake charmer's rubber serpents, the fat woman's pillows, and the bearded lady's false whiskers, I don't know what they did about the living skeleton, these fellows were now gaping before Tristan's platform and growing hostile as their rather inadequate brains failed to cook up any damaging explanation. Yeah, yelled a long-necked, flap-eared youth suddenly. He's got an iron bar in that rope. They had come too late to see the parachute drop. Tristan grinned and pulled himself down the rope, which of course fell limp behind him. At this the crowd jeered and booed to the hasty youth who became so resentfully abusive of Tristan that one of the attendants pushed him out of the tent. As he passed me, I caught fragments of wrathy words. Wished I'd had a 
Show him whether it's a fake. Tristan closed his act by dropping full length to the end of his invisible wire, then pulled himself down, got into his stilts, and was unfastening the belt when the manager rushed in with a request that he repeat, for the benefit of a special party just arrived on a delayed train. Go on and look at the animals, old man, Tristan called to me. I'll be with you in about half an hour. I strolled out idly, meeting on the way the flap-eared youth, who seemed bent on making his way back into the tent, wearing a mingled air of furtiveness, of triumph, and anticipation. Wondering casually just what kind of fool the lad was planning to make of himself next, I wandered on toward the main entrance, only to be stopped by an appalling uproar behind me. There was a raucous, gurgling shriek of mortal terror, the loud composite, ooh, of a shocked or astonished crowd, a set of fervent curses directed at someone, loud, confused babbling, and then a woman's voice raised in a seemingly endless succession of hysterical shrieks. Thinking that an animal had gotten loose, or something of that kind, I wheeled. Unmistakably, the racket came from Tristan's own tent. Cold dread clutching at my heart, and with lead on my boot soles, I rushed frantically back. At the entrance I was held by a mad onrush of humanity for some moments. When I reached the platform, Tristan was not in sight. Then I noticed the long-necked boy sitting on the platform with his face in his hands, shrieking. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to. Damn it, don't touch me. I thought sure it was fake. I saw a new, glittering jackknife lying on the platform beside the limp, foot-long stub of Tristan's rope. Slowly, frozenly, I raised my eyes. The blue abyss was traceless of any object. End of Section 8 Section 9 of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Circuit Riders by R. C. Fitzpatrick On the board they were just little lights that glowed, but out there in the night of the city jungle they represented human passions, virulent passions, and deadly crimes to be. He was an old man and very drunk. Very drunk or very sick. It was the middle of the day and the day was hot, but the old man had on a suit and a sweater under the suit. He stopped walking and stood still, swaying gently on widespread legs, and tried to focus his eyes. He lived here, around here, somewhere around here. He continued on, stumbling up the street. He finally made it home. He lived on the second floor and dragged himself up the narrow staircase with both hands clutching the railing. But he was still very careful on the paper bag under his arm. The bag was full of beer. Once in the room, he managed to take off his coat before he sank down on the bed. He just sat there, vacant and lost and empty, and drank his beer. It was a hot, muggy August afternoon. Wednesday in Pittsburgh. The broad rivers put moisture in the air, and the high hills kept it there. Light breezes were broken up and diverted by the hills before they could bring more than a breath of relief. In the East Liberty Precinct Station, the doors and windows were wide open to snare the vagrant breezes. There were eight men in the room, a desk sergeant, two beat cops waiting to go on duty, the audio controller, and the Angelus operator, two reporters, and a local book, businessman. From the back of the building, the jail proper, a voice of a prisoner asking for a match floated out to the men in the room, and a few minutes later they heard the slow, exasperated steps of the turnkey as he walked over to give his prisoner a light. At 3.32 p.m., the De Angelis board came alive as half a dozen lights flashed red and the needles on the dials below them trembled in the seventies and eighties. Every other light on the board showed varying shades of pink, registering in the sixties. The operator glanced at the board, started to note the times and intensities of two of the dials in his log, scratched them out, 
then went on with his conversation with the audio controller. The younger reporter got up and came over to the board. The controller and the operator looked up at him. Nothing, said the operator, shaking his head in a negative. Bad call at the ball game, probably. He nodded his head towards the lights on the De Angelis. They'll be gone in five, ten minutes. The controller reached over and turned up the volume on his radio. The radio should not have been there, but as long as everyone did his job and kept the volume low, the captain looked the other way. The set belonged to the precinct. The announcer's voice came on. Ing up, he's fuming. Doc is holding Serrett back. What a beef! Brutog's got his nose not two inches from Frascoli's face. And brother, is he letting him have it? Oh, oh, here comes Gilbert off the mound. He's stalking over. When Gil puts up a holler, you know he thinks it's a good one. Brutog keeps pointing at the foul line. You can see from here the chalk's been wiped away. He's insisting the runner slid out of the base path. Frascoli's walking away, but Danny's going right aft. The controller turned the volume down again. The lights on the De Angelis board kept flickering, but by 3.37 all but two had gone out, one by one. These two showed readings in the high 60s. One flared briefly to 78.2, then went out. Bertach was no longer in the ball game. By 3.41 only one light still glowed, and it was steadily fading. Throughout the long, hot, humid afternoon, the board held its reddish, irritated overtones, and occasional reading flashed in and out of the seventies. At four o'clock, the new duty section came on. The De Angelis operator, whose name was Chuck Maitzik, was replaced by an operator named Charlie Blaney. Nothing to report, Chuck told Charlie. Rhubarb down at the point at the Forbes Municipal Field, but that's about all. The new operator scarcely glanced at the model board. It was that kind of day. He noted an occasional high in his logbook, but most signals were ignored. At 5.14 he noted a severe reading of 87, which stayed on the board. At 5.16 another light came on, climbed slowly through the 60s, then soared to 77 where it held steady. Neither light was an honest red, their angry overtones chased each other rapidly. The De Angelis operator called over to the audio controller. Got us a case of crinkle fender, I think. Where? the controller asked. Can't tell yet, Blaney said. A hothead and a citizen with righteous indignation. They're clear enough, but not too sharp. He swiveled in his chair and adjusted knobs before a large circular screen. Pale streaks of light glowed briefly as the sweep passed over them. There were milky dots everywhere. A soft light in the lower left-hand corner of the screen cut an uncertain path across the grid, and two indeterminate splotches in the upper half of the scope flared out to the margin. Morningside, the operator said. The splashes of light separated. One moved quickly off the screen. The other held stationary for several minutes then contracted and began a steady, jagged advance toward the center of the grid. One inch down, half an inch over, two inches down, then four inches on a diagonal line. Like I said, said Blaney, an accident. Eight minutes later, at 5.32, a slightly pompous and thoroughly outraged young salesman marched through the doors of the station house and over to the desk sergeant. "'Some clown just hit me,' he began. "'With his fist?' asked the sergeant. "'With his car,' said the salesman. "'My car with his car. "'He hit my car with his car.' "'The sergeant raised his hand. "'Simmer down, young feller. "'Let me see your driver's license.' "'He reached over the desk for the man's cards with one hand, "'and with the other he sorted out an accident form. "'Just give it to me slowly.' "'He started filling out the form.' The De Angelis operator leaned back in his chair and winked at the controller. I'm a whiz, he said to the young reporter. I'm a phenom. I never miss. The reporter smiled and walked back to his colleague who was playing gin with the book, businessman. 
the lights glowed on and off all evening but only once had they called for action at ten thirty four two sharp readings of ninety two point two and ninety four even had sent blaney back to his dials and screen he narrowed it down to a four-block area when the telephone rang to report a fight at the Red Antler Grill. The controller dispatched a beat cop already in the area. Twenty-two minutes later, two very large and very obedient young toughs stumbled in, followed by an angry officer. In addition to the marks of the fight, both had a lumbering, off-balance walk that showed that the policeman had been prodding them with his riot club. It was called an electronic persuader. It also doubled as a carbine. Police no longer carried sidearms. He pointed to the one on the left. This one hit me. He pointed to the one on the right. This one kicked me. The one on the left was certain he would never hit another cop. The one on the right knew he would never kick another cop. Book em, the sergeant said. He looked at the two youths. You're going to the can. You want to argue? The youth looked down. No one else said anything. The younger reporter came over and took down the information as the cop and the two toughs gave it to the sergeant. Then he went back to his seat at the card table and took a mini typer from his pocket. He started sending to the paper. You ought to send that stuff direct, the card player said. I scribble too bad, the reporter answered. Bat crap, said the older man. That little jewel can transcribe chicken scratches. The cub scrunched over his mini typer. A few minutes later, he looked up at his partner. What's a good word for hoodlum? The other reporter was irritated. He was also losing at gin. What are you, a Steinbeck? He laid down his cards. Look, kid, just send it, just the way you get it. That's why they pay rewrite men. We're reporters. We report, okay? He went back to his cards. At 11.40, a light at the end of the second row turned pinkish, but no reading showed on the dial below. It was only one of a dozen bulbs showing red. It was still pinkish when the watch was changed. Blaney was replaced by King. Watch this one, Blaney said to King, indicating an entry in the log. It was numbered 820-83059. 78-4-A. I've had it on four times now, all in the high seventies. I got a feeling. The number indicated date, estimated area and relation to previous alerts in the month, estimated intent, and frequency of report. The A meant intermittent. The only last three digits would change. If it comes on again, I think I'd lock a circuit on it right away. The rules call for any continuous reading over 75 to be contacted and connected after its sixth appearance. What about that one? King said, pointing to a 70.4 that was unblinking in its intensity. Some drunk, said Blaney, or a baby with a head cold. Been on there for 20 minutes. You can watch for it if you like. His tone suggested that it to be a waste of time. I'll watch it, said King. His tone suggested he knew how to read the circuit, and if Blaney had any suggestions, he could keep them to himself. Joe Millsop finally staggered home, exhausted. He was half drunk and worn out from being on his feet all day, but the liquor had finally done its work. He could think about the incident without flushing hot all over. He was too tired and too sorry for himself to be angry at anyone and with his new-found alcoholic objectivity he could see now where he had been in the wrong. Old Bloomgarten shouldn't have chewed him out in front of a customer like that. But what the hell? He shouldn't have sassed the customer, even if she was just a dumb broad who didn't know what she wanted. He managed to get undressed before he stumbled into bed. His last coherent thought before he fell into a drug sleep was that he'd better apologize in the morning. 820-18-3059-7848-A stayed off the board. At 1.18 a.m., the De Angelis flared to a 98.4, then started inching down again. The young reporter sat up, alert, from where he had been dozing. The loud clang of a bell had brought him awake. 
The older reporter glanced up from his cards and waved him down. Forget it, he said. Some wife just opened the door and saw lipstick on her husband's neck. Oh, honey, how could you? Fifty dollars, she was crying. Don't, mother. I thought I could make some money, some real money. The youngster looked sick. I had four nines, four nines. How could I figure him for a straight flush? He didn't have a thing showing. How could you? sobbed the mother. Oh, how could you? The book, Businessman, dealt the cards. The reporter picked his up and arranged them in his hand. He discarded one. The businessman ignored it and drew from the deck. He discarded. The reporter picked up the discard and threw away a card from his hand. The businessman drew from the deck and discarded the same card he'd drawn. The reporter picked it up, tapped it slowly in place with his elbow, placed his discard face down and spread his hand. Gin, he said. Rah, said the businessman. Damn it, you play good. You play real good. A light on the De Angelis flashed red and showed a reading of 65.4 on the dial. Can't beat skill, said the reporter. Count. 56, said the businessman. That's counting gin, he added. Game, the reporter announced. I'll figure the damage. You play good, said the businessman in disgust. You only say that because it's true, the reporter said. But it's sweet of you all the same. Shut up, said the businessman. The reporter looked up, concerned. You stuck? he asked solicitously. He seemed sincere. Certainly I'm stuck, the businessman snarled. Then stay stuck, said the reporter in a kindly tone. He patted the businessman on the cheek. The same light on the De Angelis flashed red. This time the dial registered 82. The operator chuckled and looked over at the gamblers, where the reporter was still adding up the score. "'How much you down, Bernie?' he asked the businessman. Four dollars and ninety-six cents,' the reporter answered. "'You play good,' Bernie said again. The De Angelis went back to normal, and the operator went back to his magazine. The bulb at the end of the second row turned from light pink to a soft rose. The needle on his dial finally flickered onto the scale. There were other lights on the board, but none called for action. It was still just a quiet night in the middle of the week. The room was filthy. It had a natural filth that clings to a cheap room, and a man-made careless filth that would disfigure the Taj Mahal. It wasn't so much that things were dirty, it was more that nothing was clean. Pittsburgh was no longer a smoky city. That problem had been solved before the mills had stopped belching smoke. Now with atomics and filters on every stack in every home, the city was clean. Clean as the works of man could make it, yet still filthy as only the minds of man could achieve. The city might be clean, but there were people who were not, and the room was not. Overhead the ceiling light still burned, casting its harsh glare on the trashy room, and the trashy, huddled figure on the bed. He was an old man, lying on the bed fully clothed, even to his shoes. He twisted fretfully in his sleep. The body tried to rise, anticipating nature even when the mind could not. The man gagged several times and finally made it up to a sitting position before the vomit came. He was still asleep, but his reaction was automatic. He grabbed the bottom of his sweater and pulled it out before him to form a bucket of sorts. When he finished being sick, he sat still, swaying gently back and forth, and tried to open his eyes. He could not make it. Still asleep, he ducked out of the foul sweater, made an ineffectual dab at his mouth, wadded the sweater in a ball, and threw it over in front of the bathroom door. He fell back on the bed, exhausted, and went on with his fitful sleep. At 4.15 in the morning, a man walked into the station house. His name was Henry Tilton. He was a reporter for the evening press. He waved a greeting to the desk sergeant and went over to Kibitz the card game. Both players looked up, startled. The reporter playing cards said, Hello, Henry. He looked at his watch. Whoosh! I didn't realize it was that late. He turned to the businessman. 
Hurry up, finish the hand. Got to get my beauty sleep. What do you mean, hurry up, said Bernie. You're into me for fifteen bucks. Get it back from Hank there, the reporter said. He nodded at the newcomer. Want this hand? You're fourteen points down. Lover boy's got sixty-eight on game, but you're a box up. Sure, said Tilton. He took the cards. The morning news reporters left. The businessman dealt a new hand. Tilton waited four rounds, then knocked with ten. Bernie slammed down his cards. You lousy reporters are all alike. I'm going home. He got up to put on his coat. I'll be back about ten. You still be here? Sure, said Tilton, with the score. He folded the paper and put it in his pocket. The businessman walked out, and Tilton went over to the DeAngelis board. Anything? he asked. Nah, said King. He pointed to the lights. Just lovers' quarrels tonight, all pink and peaceful. Tilton smiled and ambled back to the cell block. The operator put his feet up on the desk, then frowned and put them down again. He leaned toward the board and studied the light at the end of the second row. The needle registered sixty-six. The operator pursed his lips, then flicked a switch that opened the photo file. Every five minutes an automatic camera photographed the DeAngelis board, developed the film, and filed the picture away in its storage vault. King studied the photographs for quite a while, then pulled his logbook over and made an entry. He wrote, 820-93142-1X. The last three digits meant that he wasn't sure about the intensity, and the X signified a continuous reading. King turned to the audio controller. Do me a favor, Gus, but strictly unofficial. Contact everybody around us. Oakland, Squirrel Hill, Point Breeze, Lawrenceville, Bloomfield. Everybody in this end of town. Find out if they've got one low-intensity reading. That's been on for hours. If they haven't had it since before midnight, I'm not interested. Something up? the controller asked. Probably not, said the operator. I'd just like to pin this one down as close as I can. On a night like this, my screen shows nothing but milk. Give you a lift home? the older reporter asked. Thanks, said the cub, shaking his head. But I live out by the young hill Jenny River. So? the old man shrugged. Half hour flight, hop in. I don't understand, said the cub. What? Me offering you a lift? No, said the cub. Back there in the station house, you know. You mean the DeAngelis? Not that exactly, said the cub. I understand a DeAngelis board. Everybody broadcasts emotions, and if they're strong enough, they can be received and interpreted. It's the cops I don't understand. I thought any reading over 80 was dangerous and had to be looked into, and anything over 90 was plain murder and had to be picked up. Here they've been ignoring 80s and 90s all night long. You remember that children's story you wrote last Christmas about an Irish imp named Sean O'Claus, his companion asked him. Certainly, the cub said, scowling. I'll sell it some day. You remember the fashion editor killed it because she thought C.N. was a girl's name, and it might be sacrilegious. You're right, I remember, the cub said, his voice rising. Like to bet you didn't register over 90 that day? As a matter of fact, I'll head for the nearest precinct and bet you five you're over 80 right now. He laughed aloud and the young man calmed down. I had that same idea myself at first, about 90 being against the law. That's one of the main troubles, the law. Every damn state in the Dominion has its own ideas on what is dangerous. The laws are all fouled up. But what most of them boil down to is this. A man has to have a continuous reading of over 90 before he can be arrested. Not arrested, really. Detained. Just a reading on the board doesn't prove a thing. Some people walk around boiling at 90 all their lives, like editors. But the sweet old lady down the block, who's never sworn in her life, she may hit 65 and reach for a knife. And that doesn't prove a thing. Ninety sometimes means murder, but usually not. Up to a hundred and ten usually means murder, but sometimes not. And anything over one twenty always means murder. 
and it still doesn't prove a thing. And then again, a psychotic or a professional gun soul may not register at all. They kill for fun, or for business. They're not angry at anybody. It's all up to the De Angelis operators. They're the kingpins. They make the system work. Not Simon De Angelis who invented it, or the technician who installs it, or the police commissioner who takes the results to City Hall. The operators make it or break it. Sure, they have rules to follow, if they want. But a good operator ignores the rules, and a bad operator goes by the book, and he's still no damn good. It's just like radar was sixty, seventy years ago. Some got the knack, some don't. Then the De Angelis doesn't do the job, said the cub. Certainly it does, the older man said. Nothing's perfect. It gives the police a jump on a lot of crime. Premeditated murder, for one. The average citizen can't kill anyone unless he's mad enough. And if he's mad enough, he registers on the De Angelis. And ordinary robbers get caught. Their plans don't go just right, or they fight among themselves. Or, if they just don't like society, a good De Angelis operator can tell quite a bit if he gets a reading at the wrong time of day or night, or in the wrong part of town. But what about the sweet old lady who registers 65 and then goes berserk? That's where your operator really comes in. Usually that kind of a reading comes too late. Grandma's swinging the knife at the same time the light goes on in the station house. But if she waits to swing, or builds herself up to it, then she may be stopped. You know those poor operators are supposed to log any reading over 60 and report downtown with anything over 80. Sure they are. If they logged everything over 60, they'd have riders cramp the first hour they were on watch. And believe me, Sonny, any operator who reported downtown on every reading over 80 would be back pounding a beat before the end of his first day. They just do the best they can, and you'd be surprised at how good that can be. The old man woke up, but kept his eyes closed. He was afraid. It was too quiet, and the room was clammy with an early morning chill. He opened his eyelids a crack and looked out the window. Still dark outside. He lay there trembling and brought his elbows in tight to his body. He was going to have the shakes. He knew he'd have the shakes, and it was still too early. Too early. He looked at the clock. It was only a quarter after five. Too early for the bars to be open. He covered his eyes with his hands and tried to think. It was no use. He couldn't think. He sobbed. He was afraid to move. He knew he had to have a drink. And he knew if he got up, he'd be sick. Oh, Lord, he breathed. The trembling became worse. He tried to press it away by hugging his body with his arms. It didn't help. He looked wildly around and tried to concentrate. He thought about the bureau. No. The dresser. No. His clothes. He felt feverishly about his body. No. Under the bed. No. Wait. Maybe. He would brought some beer home. Now he remembered. Maybe there was some left. He rolled over on his stomach and groped under the bed. His tremulous fingers found the paper bag and he dragged it out. It was full of empty cans. The carton inside was ripped. He tore the sack open. Empty cans. No! There was a full one. Two full ones. He staggered to his feet and looked for an opener. There was one on the bureau. He stumbled over and opened his first beautiful, lovely can of beer. He put his mouth down close to the top so that none of the foam could escape. He'd be all right till seven now. The bars opened at seven. He'd be all right till seven. He did not notice the knife lying beside the opener. He did not own a knife and had no recollection of buying one. It was a hunting knife and he was not a hunter. The light at the end of the second row was growing gradually brighter. The needle traveled slowly across the dial. 68.2, 68.4, 68.6. King called over to the audio controller. They all report in yet? The controller nodded. Squirrel Hill's got your signal on. 
Same reading as you have. Bloomfield thinks they may have it. Oakland's not too sure. Everybody else is negative. The controller walked over. Which one is it? King pointed to the end of the second row. Can you get it on your screen? Hell yes, I've got him on my screen. King swiveled in his chair and turned on the set. The scope was covered with pale dots. Which one is he? There? He pointed to the left. That's a guy who didn't get the raise he wanted. There? He pointed to the center. That's the girl with bad dreams. She has them every night. There? That's my brother. He's in the veterans' hospital and wanted to come home a week ago. So don't get excited, said the controller. I only asked. I'm sorry, Gus, King apologized. My fault. I'm a little edgy. Probably nothing at all. Well, you got it narrowed down anyway, Gus said. If you've got it, and Squirrel Hill's got it, then he's in Shady Side. If Oakland doesn't have him, then he's on this side of Aiken Avenue. The controller had caught King's fever. The it had become a him. And if Bloomfield doesn't have him, then he's on the other side of Bomb Boulevard. Only Bloomfield might have him. Well, what the hell? You've still got him located in the lower half of Shady Side. Tell you what, I'll send a man up Ellsworth, get Bloomfield to cruise Bomb Boulevard in a scout car, and have Squirrel Hill put a patrol on Wilkins. We can triangulate. No, said King, not yet. Thanks anyway, Gus, but there's no point in stirring up a tempest in a teapot. Just tell them to watch it. If it climbs over 75, we can narrow it down then. It's your show, said Gus. The old man finished his second can of beer. The trembling was almost gone. He could stand and move without breaking out in a cold sweat. His hand ran through his hair and looked at the clock, 6.15, too early. He looked around the room for something to read. There were magazines and newspapers scattered everywhere. The papers all folded back to the sports section. He picked up a paper, not even bothering about the date, and tried to interest himself in the batting averages of the Intercontinental League. Yamamura was on top with point three eighty seven. The old man remembered when Yamamura came up as a rookie. But right now he didn't care. The page trembled and the type kept blurring. He threw the paper down. He had a headache. The old man got up and went over to the bathroom. He steadied himself against the door jamb and kicked the wadded sweater out of sight beneath the dresser. He went into the bathroom and turned on the water. He ran his hands over his face and thought about shaving, but he couldn't face the work involved. He managed to run a comb through his hair and rinse out his mouth. He came back into the room. It was 6.30. Maybe Freddy's was open. If Freddy wasn't, then maybe the grill. He'd have to take his chances. He couldn't stand it here any longer. He put on his coat and stumbled out. At eight o'clock, the watch was changed. Maitzik replaced King. Anything? asked Maitzik. Just this one, Chuck, said King. I may be a fool, but this one bothers me. King was a diplomat where Blaney was not. King showed him the entry. The dial now stood at 72.8. It's been on there all night since before I had the watch, and it's been climbing, just slow and steady, but all the time climbing. I locked a circuit on him, but I'll take it off if you want me to. No, said Matzik. Leave it on. That don't smell right to me neither. The old man was feeling better. He'd been in the bar two hours, and he'd had two pickled eggs and the bartender didn't bother him. The beer was all right, but a man needed whiskey when he was sick. He'd have one, maybe two more, and then he'd eat some breakfast. He didn't know why, but he knew he mustn't get drunk. At nine o'clock, the needle on the dial climbed past 75. Maitzik asked for coverage. That meant the two patrolmen would be tied up, doing nothing but searching for an echo and it might be a wild goose chase. He was complaining to the captain, but the captain wasn't listening. He was looking at the photographs in the DeAngelis file. You don't like this? the captain asked. 
Maitzik said he didn't like it. And King said he didn't like it? King thinks the same way I do. He's been on there too damn long and too damn consistent. Pick him up, the captain turned and ordered the audio controller. If we can't hold him, we can at least get a look at him. It's not too clear yet, said Maitzik. It'll take a spread. I know what it'll take, the captain roared. Don't tell me my job. Put every available man on this. I want the guy brought in. The old man walked back to his room. He was carrying a dozen cans of beer, but the load was light, and he walked upright. He felt fine, like a million dollars, and he was beginning to remember. When he entered the room, he saw the knife, and when he saw the knife, he smiled. A man had to be smart, and a man had to be prepared. They were smart, wicked and smart, but he was smarter. He'd bought the knife a long, long time ago, in a different world. They couldn't fool him that way. They were clever, all right. They fooled the whole world. He put his beer on the bureau, then walked into the bathroom and turned on the water in the tub. He came back out and started to undress. He was humming to himself. When he finished undressing, he went over to the bureau and opened a can of beer. He carried it back into the bathroom, put it beside the tub, and lowered himself into the water. Ah, that was the ticket. Water and being clean. Clean and being water. Being water and being candy and being smart. They fooled the whole world, but not him. The whole wide world, but they couldn't fool him. He was going to fool them. All pretty and innocent. Ha! Innocent, he knew. They were rotten. They were rotten all the way through. They fooled the whole world, but they were rotten. Rotten. And he was the only one who knew. He finished the beer and stood up in the tub. The water ran off his body in greasy runlets. He didn't pull the plug. He stepped out of the tub and over to the bathroom mirror. His face looked fine, not puffy at all. He'd fooled them. He sprinkled himself with lilac water, put the bottle to his lips, and swished some of it in his mouth. Oh, yes, he'd fool them. A man couldn't be too clever. They were clever, so he had to be clever. He began to shave. The captain was on an audio circuit talking to an assistant commissioner. Yes, sir. I know that. Yes, sir. It could be, but it might be something else. Yes, sir. I know Squirrel Hill has problems, but we need help. Yes. Commissioner, it's over ninety now. The captain signaled wildly to Maitzik. Maitzik held up four fingers, then two. Ninety-four point two and still going up. No, sir, we don't know. Some guy gonna quit his job or kill his boss. Maybe he found out his wife is cheating on him. We can't tell until we pick him up. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you, sir. The captain hung up. I hate politicians, he snarled. Watch it, captain, said Maitzik. I'll get you on my board. Get me on at hell, the captain said. I've never been off. The old man finished dressing. He knotted his tie and brushed off the front of his suit with his hand. He looked fine. He'd fool them. He looked just like everybody else. He crossed to the bureau and picked up the knife. It was still in the scabbard. He didn't take it out. He just put it in his pocket. Good. It didn't show. He walked out on the street. The sun was shining brightly, and the heat waves were coming up from the sidewalk. Good. Good. This was the best time. People, the real people, would be working or lying down asleep. But they'd be out. They were always out, out all sweet and innocent in the hot sun. He turned down the street and ambled toward the drug store. He didn't want to hurry. He had lots of time. He had to get some candy first. That was the ticket, candy. Candy worked. Candy always worked. Candy was good, but candy was wicked. He was good, but they were wicked. Oh, you had to be smart. That has to be him, Maitzik said. The screen was blotched and milky, 
but a large splash of the light in the lower left-hand corner outshone everything else. He's somewhere around Negley Avenue. He turned to the captain. Where do you have your men placed? In a box, the captain said. Fifth and Negley, Aiken and Negley, Sender and Aiken, and Sender and Negley, and three scout cars overhead. The old man walked up Ellsworth to the Liberty School. There were always lots of young ones around Liberty School. The young ones were the worst. I'm losing him. Where are you? Sender and Aiken. Anybody getting him stronger? Yeah, me, Negley and Fifth. Never mind, never mind, we've got him. We see him now. Where? Bellafond and Ivy, Liberty School. She was a friendly little thing and pretty, maybe five, maybe six, and her mommy had told her not to talk to strangers. But the funny old man wasn't talking. He was sitting on the curb, and he was eating candy, and he was offering some to her. He smiled at the little girl, and she smiled back. The scout car settled to earth on automatic. Two officers climbed out of the car and walked quietly over to the old man, one on either side. They took an arm and lifted him gently to his feet. Hello there, old timer. Hi, little girl. The old man looked around, bewildered. He dropped his candy and tried to reach his knife. They mustn't interfere. It was no use. The officers were very kind and gentle, and they were very, very firm. They let him off as though he were an old, old friend. One of the officers called back over his shoulder, Bye-bye, little girl. The little girl dutifully waved by. She looked at the paper sack on the sidewalk. She didn't know what to do, but the nice old man was gone. She looked around, but no one was paying any attention. They were all watching the softball game. Suddenly she made a grab and clutched the paper bag to her body. Then she turned and ran back up the street to tell her mommy how wonderful, wonderful lucky she was. End of Section 9 Section 10 of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wind by Charles L. Fontenay When you have an engine with no fuel, and fuel without an engine, and a life and death deadline to meet, you have a problem indeed, unless you are a stubborn Dutchman, and Jan van Artveld was the stubbornest Dutchman on Venus. Jan Wilhelm van Artveld claimed descent from William of Orange. He had no genealogy to prove it, but on Venus there was no one who could disprove it either. Jan Wilhelm van Artveld smoked a clay pipe, which only a Dutchman can do properly, because the clay bit grates on less stubborn teeth. Jan needed all his Dutch stubbornness, and a good deal of pure physical strength besides, to maneuver the roach-flat ground car across the tumbled terrain of Delhorn into the teeth of the howling gale that swept from the west. Huge wheels twisted and jolted against the rocks outside, and Jan bounced against his seat belt, wrestled the steering wheel, and puffed at his pipe. The mild aroma of here and by tabac filled the airtight ground car. There came a new swain that was not the roughness of the terrain. Through the thick windshield, Jan saw all the ground about him buckle and heave for a second or two before it settled to rugged quiescence again. This time he was really heaved about. Jan mentioned this to the ground car radio. That's about the third time in a half an hour, he commented. The place tosses like the Uselmere on a rough day. You just don't forget it isn't the Zwiederzee, retorted Heemskerk from the other end. You sink there and you don't come up three times. Don't worry, said Jan. I'll be back on time, with a broom at the masthead. This I shall want to see, chuckled Hemskerk, a logical reaction, considering the scarcity of brooms on Venus. Two hours earlier the two men had sat across a small table playing chess, with little indication there would be anything else to occupy their time before blast-off of the stubby gravity boat. It would be their last chess game for many months, 
for Jan was a member of the Dutch colony at Oostport in the northern hemisphere of Venus, while Hemskirk was a pilot of the G-boat from the Dutch spaceship Vanderdecken, scheduled to begin an earthward orbit in a few hours. It was near the dusk of the 485-hour Venerian day, and the twilight gale already had arisen, sweeping from the comparative chill Venerian nightside into the superheated dayside. Oostport, established near some outcroppings that contained uranium ore, was protected from both the dawn gale and the twilight gale, for it was in a valley in the midst of a small range of mountains. Jan has just figured out a combination by which he hoped to cheat Hemskirk out of one of his nights, when Decker, the burgomaster of Oostport, entered the spaceport ready room. There's been an emergency radio message, said Decker. They've got a passenger for the earth ship over at Rathole. Rathole, repeated Hemskirk. What's that? I didn't know there was another colony within two thousand kilometers. This isn't a colony, in the sense Oostport is, explained Decker. The people are the families of a bunch of laborers left behind when the colony folded several years ago. It's about eighty kilometers away, right across the Horn, but they don't have any vehicles that can navigate when the wind's up. Hemskirk pushed his short-billed cap back on his close-cropped head, leaned back in his chair, and folded his hands over his comfortable stomach. Then the passenger will have to wait for the next ship, he pronounced. The Vanderdecken has to blast off in thirty hours to catch Earth at the right orbital spot, and the G-boat has to blast off in ten hours to catch the Vanderdecken. This passenger can't wait, said Decker. He needs to be evacuated to Earth immediately. He's suffering from the Venus shadow. Jan whistled softly. He had seen the effects of that disease. Decker was right. Jan, you're the best driver in Oostport, said Decker. You'll have to take a ground car to Rathole and bring the fellow back. So now Jan gripped his clay pipe between his teeth and piloted the ground car into the teeth of the twilight gale. Denhorn was a comparatively flat desert sweep that ran along the western side of the Oost Mountains, just over the mountain from Oostport. It was a thin, fault area of planet whose crust was particularly subject to earthquakes, particularly at the beginning and end of each long day when temperatures of the surface rocks changed. On the other side of it lay Rat Hole, a little settlement that eked out a precarious living from the Venerian vegetation. Jan had never seen it. He had a little difficulty driving up and over the mountain, for the Dutch settlers had carved a rough road through the ravines. But even the two-and-a-half-meter wheels of the ground car had trouble amid the tumbled rocks of Denhorn. The wind hit the car in full strength here, and though the body of the ground car was suspended from the axles, there was constant danger of its being flipped over by a gust if not handled just right. The three earth shocks that had shaken Denhorn since he had been driving made his task no easier, but he was obviously lucky at that. Often he had to detour far from his course to skirt long, deep cracks in the surface, or steep breaks where the crust had been raised or dropped several meters by past quakes. The ground car zigzagged slowly westward. The tattered violet and indigo clouds boiled low above it but the wind was as dry as the breath of an oven. Despite the heavy cloud cover, the afternoon was as bright as an earth day. The thermometer showed the outside temperature to have dropped to 40 degrees centigrade in the west wind and was still going down. Jan reached the edge of a crack that made further progress seem impossible. A hundred meters wide, of unknown depth, it stretched out of sight in both directions. For the first time he entertained serious doubts that Denhorn could be crossed by land. After a moment's hesitation, he swung the ground car northward and raced along the edge of the chasm as fast as the car would negotiate the terrain. He looked anxiously at his watch. Nearly three hours had passed since he left Oostport. He had seven hours to go, and he was still at least sixteen kilometers from Rathole. His pipe was out, and he could not take his hands from the wheel to refill it. He had driven at least eight kilometers before he realized that the crack was narrowing. 
At least as far again, the two edges came together, but not at the same level. A sheer cliff three meters high now barred his passage. He drove on. Apparently it was the result of an old quake. He found a spot where rocks had tumbled down, making a steep, rough ramp up the break. He drove up it and turned back southwestward. He made it just in time. He had driven less than three hundred meters when a quake more severe than any of the others struck. Suddenly behind him the brake reversed itself, so that where he had climbed up coming westward he would now have to climb a cliff of equal height returning eastward. The ground heaved and buckled like a tempestuous sea. Rocks rolled and leaped through the air, several large ones striking the ground car with ominous force. The car staggered forward on its giant wheels like a drunken man. The quake was so violent that at one time the vehicle was hurled several meters sideways and almost overturned, and the wind smashed down on it unrelentingly. The quake lasted for several minutes, during which Jan was able to make no progress at all and struggled only to keep the ground car upright. Then, in unison, both earthquake and wind died to absolute quiescence. Jan made use of this calm to step down on the accelerator and send the ground car speeding forward. The terrain was easier here, nearing the western edge of Denhorn, and he covered several kilometers before the wind struck again, cutting his speed down considerably. He judged he must be nearing Rat Hole. Not long thereafter, he rounded an outcropping of rock and it lay before him. A wave of nostalgia swept over him. Back at Oostport, the power was nuclear, but this little settlement had made use of the cheapest, most obviously available power source. It was dotted with more than a dozen windmills. Windmills! Tears came to Jan's eyes. For a moment he was carried back to the flatlands around Gravenheg. For a moment he was a tow-headed, round-eyed boy again, clumping in wooden shoes along the edge of the tulip fields. But there were no canals here. The flat land, stretching into the darkening west, was spotted with patches of cactus and leather-leaved venerian plants. Amid the windmills, low domes protruded from the earth, indicating that the dwellings of Rathole were, appropriately, partly underground. He drove into the place. There were no streets as such, but there were avenues between lines of heavy chains strung to short iron posts, evidently as handholds against the wind. The savage gale piled dust and sand in drifts against the domes, then, shifting slightly, swept them clean again. There was no one moving abroad. Just inside the community, Jan found half a dozen men in a group, clinging to one of the chains and waving to him. He pulled the ground car to a stop beside them, stuck his pipe into a pocket of his plastic Venus suit, donned his helmet and got out. The wind almost took him away before one of them grabbed him, and he was able to grasp the chain himself. They gathered round him. They were swarthy, black-eyed men with curly hair. One of them grasped his hand, "'Benvenido, senor,' said the man. Jan recoiled and dropped the man's hand. All the orange men blood he claimed protested in outrage. "'Spaniards! All these men were Spaniards!' Jan recovered himself at once. He had been reading too much ancient history during his leisure hours. The hot monotony of Venus was beginning to affect his brain." It had been five hundred years since the Netherlands revolted against Spanish rule. A lot of water over the dam since then. A look at the men around him, the sound of their chatter, convinced him that he need not try German or Hollandish here. He fell back on the international language. Do you speak English? he asked. The man brightened but shook his head. No hablo inglés, he said. Pero el médico lo habla. Venga conmigo. He gestured for Ian to follow him and started off, pulling his way against the wind along the chain. Jan followed, and the other men fell in behind in single file. A hundred meters farther on, they turned, descended some steps, and entered one of the half-buried domes. 
A gray-haired, bearded man was in the well-lighted room, apparently the living room of a home, with a young woman. El medico, said the man, who had greeted Jan, gesturing, El hable inglés. He went out, shutting the airlock door behind him. You must be the man from Oostport, said the bearded man, holding out his hand. I am Dr. Sanchez. We are very grateful you have come. I thought for a while I wouldn't make it, said Jan ruefully, removing his Venus helmet. This is Miss Murillo, said Sanchez. The woman was a Spanish blonde, full-lipped and beautiful, with golden hair and dark liquid eyes. She smiled at Jan. Encantada de Concilio, senor, she greeted him. This is the patient, doctor, asked Jan, astonished. She looked in the best of health. No, the patient is in the next room, answered Sanchez. Well, as much as I'd like to stop for a pipe, we'd better start at once, said Jan. It's a hard drive back, and blast-off can't be delayed. The woman seemed to sense his meaning. She turned and called, Diego. A boy appeared in the door, a dark-skinned, sleepy-eyed boy of about eight. He yawned. Then, catching sight of the big Dutchman, he opened his eyes wide and smiled. The boy was healthy-looking, alert, but the mark of the Venus shadow was on his face. There was a faint mottling, a criss-cross of dead-white lines. Mrs. Murillo spoke to him rapidly in Spanish, and he nodded. She zipped him into a Venus suit and fitted a small helmet on his head. "'Good luck, amigo,' said Sanchez, shaking Jan's hand again. "'Thanks,' replied Jan. He donned his own helmet. "'I'll need it, if the trip over was any indication.' Jan and Diego made their way back down the chain to the ground car. There was a score of men there now, and a few women. They let the pair go through, waved farewell as Jan swung the ground car around and headed back eastward. It was easier driving with the wind behind him, and Jan hit a hundred kilometers an hour several times before striking the rougher ground of Denhorn. Now, if he could only find a way over the bluff raised by that last quake. The ground of Denhorn was still shivering. Jan did not realize this until he had to break the ground car almost to a stop at one point, because it was not shaking in severe, periodic shocks as it had earlier. It quivered constantly, like the surface of quicksand. The ground far ahead of him had a strange color to it. Jan watched for the cliff he had to skirt and scale, had picked up speed over some fairly even terrain, but now he slowed again, puzzled. There was something wrong ahead. He couldn't quite figure it out. Diego, beside him, sat quietly so far, peering eagerly through the windshield, not saying a word. Now suddenly he cried out in a high, thin tenor. Cuidado, cuidado, un abismo. Jan saw it at the same time and hit the brake so hard the ground car would have stood on its nose had its wheels been smaller. They skidded to a stop. The chasm that had caused him such a long detour before had widened, evidently in the big quake that had hit earlier. Now it was a canyon, half a kilometer wide. Five meters from the edge he looked out over blank space at the far wall and could not see the bottom. Cursing choice Dutch profanity, Jan wheeled the ground car northward and drove along the edge of the abyss as fast as he could. He wasted half an hour before realizing that it was getting no narrower. There was no point in going back southward. It might be a hundred kilometers long or a thousand, but he never could reach the end of it and thread the tumbled rocks of Denhorn to Oostport before the G-boat blast off. There was nothing to do but turn back to Rathull and see if some other way could not be found. Jan sat in the half-buried room and enjoyed the luxury of a pipe filled with some of Theodorus Niemeyer's mild tobacco. Before him, Dr. Sanchez sat with crossed legs, cleaning his fingernails with a scalpel. Diego's mother talked to the boy in low, liquid tones in a corner of the room. Jan was at a loss to know how people whose technical knowledge was as skimpy as it obviously was in Rathall were able to build these semi-underground domes to resist the earth shocks that came from Denhorn. 
but this one showed no signs of stress. A religious print and a small pencil sketch of Signora Murillo, probably done by the boy, were Ari on the inward curving walls, but that was all. Jan felt justifiably exasperated at the Spanish-speaking people. If some effort had been made to take the boy to Oosport from here, instead of calling on us to send a car, Denhorn could have been crossed before the crack opened, he pointed out. An effort was made, replied Sanchez quietly. Perhaps you do not fully realize our position here. We have no engines except the stationary generators that give us current for our air conditioning and our utilities. They are powered by the windmills. We do not have gasoline engines for vehicles, so our vehicles are operated by hand. You push them? demanded Jan incredulously. No, you've seen pictures of the pump cars that once were used on terrestrial railroads? Ours are powered like that but we cannot operate them when the Venerian wind is blowing. By the time I diagnosed the Venus shadow in Diego, the wind was coming up, and we had no way to get him to Ostport. Hmm, grunted Jan. He shifted uncomfortably and looked at the pair in the corner. The blonde head was bent over the boy protectingly, and over his mother's shoulder Diego's black eyes returned Jan's glance. If the disease has just started... "'The boy could wait for the next earth ship, couldn't he?' asked Jan. "'I said I had just diagnosed it. "'Not that it had just started, Signor. corrected Sanchez. "'As you know, the trip to earth takes 145 days, "'and it can be started only when the two planets are at the right position in their orbits. "'Have you ever seen anyone die of the Venus shadow?' "'Yes, I have,' replied Jan in a low voice. He had seen two people die of it, and it had not been pleasant. Medical men thought it was a deficiency disease, but they had not traced down the deficiency responsible. Treatment by vitamins, diet, antibiotics, infrared and ultraviolet rays, all were useless. The only thing that could arrest and cure the disease was removal from the dry, cloud-hung surface of Venus and return to a moist, sunny climate on Earth. Without that treatment, once the typical model's texture of the skin appeared, the flesh rapidly deteriorated and fell away in chunks. The victim remained unfevered and agonizingly conscious until the deterioration reached a vital spot. If you have, said Sanchez, you must realize that Diego cannot wait for a later ship, if his life is to be saved. He must get to earth at once." Jan puffed at the Hiran by Tabak and cogitated. The place was aptly named. It was a ratty community. The boy was a dark-skinned little Spaniard of Mexican origin, perhaps, but he was a boy and a human being. A thought occurred to him. From what he had seen and heard, the entire economy of Rathole could not support the tremendous expense of sending the boy across the millions of miles to Earth by spaceship. Who's paying his passage, he asked. The Dutch Central Venus Company isn't exactly a charitable institution. Your Signor Decker said that it would be taken care of, replied Sanchez. Jan relit his pipe silently, making a mental resolution that Decker wouldn't take care of it alone. Salaries for the Venerian service were high, and many of the men at Oostport would contribute readily to such a cause. "'Who is Diego's father?' he asked. "'He was Ramon Murillo, a very good mechanic,' answered Sanchez, with a sliding, sidelong glance at Jan's face. "'He has been dead for three years.' Jan grunted. "'The copters at Oostport can't buck this wind,' he said thoughtfully, "'or I'd come in one of those in the first place, instead of trying to cross Denhorn by land.' If you have any sort of aircraft here, it might make it downwind, if it isn't wrecked on takeoff. I'm afraid not, said Sanchez. Too bad. There's nothing we can do then. The nearest settlement west of here is more than a thousand kilometers away, and I happen to know they have no planes either. Just copters, so that's no help. Wait, said Sanchez, lifting the scalpel and tilting his head. I believe there is something, though we cannot use it. This was once an American naval base, and the people here were civilian employees who refused to move north with it. 
There was a flying machine they used for short-range work, and one was left behind, probably with a little help from the people of the settlement. But... What kind of machine? Copter or plane? They call it a flying platform. It carries two men, I believe. But, senor... I know them. I've operated them before I left Earth. Man, you don't expect me to try to fly one of those things in this wind. They're tricky as they can be, and the passengers are absolutely unprotected. Senor, I have asked you to do nothing. No, you haven't, muttered Jan, but you know I'll do it. Sanchez looked into his face, smiling faintly and a little sadly. I was sure you would be willing, he said. He turned and spoke in Spanish to Mrs. Morillo. The woman rose to her feet and came to them. As Jan arose, she looked up at him, tears in her eyes. Gracias, she murmured, un million de gracias. She lifted his hands in hers and kissed them. Jan disengaged himself gently, embarrassed. But it occurred to him, looking down on the bowed head of the beautiful young widow, that he might make some flying trips back over here in his leisure time. Language barriers were not impassable, and feminine companionship might cure his neurotic, history-born distaste for Spaniards, for more than one reason. Sanchez was tugging at his elbow. Senor, I've been trying to tell you, he said. It is generous and good of you, and I wanted Senora Murillo to know what a brave man you are. But have you forgotten that we have no gasoline engines here? There is no fuel for the flying platform. The platform was in a warehouse which, like the rest of the structures in Rat Hole, was a half-buried dome. The platform's ring-shaped base was less than a meter thick, standing on four metal legs. On top of it, in the center, was a railed circle that would hold two men, but would crowd them. Two small gasoline engines sat on each side of this railed circle, and between them on a third side was the fuel tank. The passengers entered it on the fourth side. The machine was dusty and spotted with rust. Jan, surrounded by Sanchez, Diego, and a dozen men, inspected it thoughtfully. The letters USNSES were painted in white on the platform itself, and each engine bore the label Hiller. Jan peered over the edge of the platform at the twin ducted fans in their plastic shrouds. They appeared in good shape. Each was powered by one of the engines, transmitted to it by heavy rubber belts. Jan sighed. It was an unhappy situation. As far as he could determine, without making tests, the engines were in perfect condition. Two perfectly good engines, and no fuel for them. You're sure there's no gasoline anywhere on Rat Hole? He asked Sanchez. Sanchez smiled ruefully, as he had once before, at Jan's appellation for the community. The inhabitants' term for it was simply La Ciudad Nuestra, our town. But he made no protest. He turned to one of the other men and talked rapidly for a few moments in Spanish. None, senor, he said, turning back to Jan. The Americans, of course, kept much of it when they were here but the few things we take to Ostport to trade could not buy precious gasoline. We have electricity in plenty, if you can power the platform with it. Jan thought that over, trying to find a way. No, it wouldn't work, he said. We could rig batteries on the platform and electric motors to turn the propellers. But batteries big enough to power it all the way to Ostport would be so heavy the machine couldn't lift them off the ground. If there were some way to carry a power line all the way to Oostport, or to broadcast the power to it. But it's a light load machine, and must have an engine that gives the necessary power from very little weight. Wild schemes ran through his head. If they were on water instead of land, he could rig up a sail. He could still rig up a sail, for a ground car, except for the chasm out on Den Horn. The ground car... Jan straightened and snapped his fingers. Doctor, he exclaimed, send a couple of men to drain the rest of the fuel from my ground car, and let's get this platform above ground and tie it down until we can get it started. Sanchez gave rapid orders in Spanish. Two of the men left at a run, carrying five-gallon cans with them. 
Three others picked up the platform and carried it up a ramp outside. As soon as they reached ground level, the wind hit them. They dropped the platform to the ground, where it shuddered and swayed momentarily, and two of the men fell successfully on their stomachs. The wind caught the third and somersaulted him half a dozen times before he skidded to a stop on his back with outstretched arms and legs. He turned over cautiously and crawled back to them. Jan, his head just above ground level, surveyed the terrain. There was flat ground to the east, clear in a fairly broad valley for at least half a kilometer before any of the domes protruded up into it. This is as good a spot for takeoff as we'll find he said to Sanchez. The men put three heavy ropes on the platform's windward rail and secured it by them to the heavy chain that ran by the dome. The platform quivered and shuddered in the heavy wind, but its base was too low for it to overturn. Shortly the two men returned with the fuel from the ground car, struggling along the chain. Jan got above ground in a crouch, clinging to the rail of the platform, and helped them fill the fuel tank with it. He primed the carburetors and spun the engines. Nothing happened. He turned the engines over again. One of them coughed, and a cloud of blue smoke burst from its exhaust, but they did not catch. "'What is the matter, Signor?' asked Sanchez from the dome entrance. "'I don't know,' replied Jan. "'Maybe it's that the engines haven't been used in so long. I'm afraid I'm not a good enough mechanic to tell.' "'Some of these men were good mechanics when the Navy was here,' said Sanchez. "'Wait.' He turned and spoke to someone in the dome. One of the men of Rathole came to Jan's side and tried the engines. They refused to catch. The man made carburetor adjustments and tried again. No success. He sniffed, took the cap from the fuel tank and stuck his finger inside. He withdrew it, wet and oily, examined it, he turned and spoke to Sanchez. He says your ground car must have a diesel engine, Sanchez interpreted to Jan. Is that correct? Why, yes, that's true. He says the fuel will not work then, senor. He says it is low-grade fuel and the platform must have high-octane gasoline. Jan threw up his hands and went back into the house. I should have known that, he said unhappily. I would have known if I had thought of it. "'What is to be done, then?' asked Sanchez. "'There's nothing that can be done,' answered Jan. "'They may as well put the fuel back in my ground car.' Sanchez called orders to the men at the platform. While they worked, Jan stared out at the furiously spinning windmills that dotted rat hole. "'There's nothing that can be done,' he repeated. "'We can't make the trip overland because of the chasm out there in Denhorn.' and we can't fly the platform because we have no power for it. Windmills. Again, Jan could imagine the flat land around them as his native Holland, with the sweeter sea sparkling to the west, where here the desert stretched under darkling clouds. Jan looked at his watch, a little more than two hours before the G-boat's blast-off time, and it couldn't wait for them. It was nearly eight hours since he had left Oostport, and the afternoon was getting noticeably darker. Jan was sorry. He had done his best, but Venus had beaten him. He looked around for Diego. The boy was not in the dome. He was outside, crouched in the lee of the dome, playing with some sticks. Diego must know of his ailment, and why he had to go to Oostport. If Jan was any judge of character, Sanchez would have told him that. Whether Diego knew it was a life or death matter for him to be aboard the Vanderdecken when it blasted off for Earth, Jan did not know. But the boy was around eight years old, and he was bright, and he must realize the seriousness involved in a decision to send him all the way to Earth. Jan felt ashamed of the exuberant foolishness which had led him to spout ancient history and claim descent from William of Orange. It had been a hobby— an artificial topic for conversation that amused him and his companions, a defense against the monotony of Venus that had begun to affect his personality perhaps a bit more than he realized. He did not dislike Spaniards. He had no reason to dislike them. They were all humans, the Spanish, the Dutch, the Germans, the Americans, even the Russians, 
fighting a hostile planet together. He could not understand a word Diego said when the boy spoke to him, but he liked Diego and wished desperately he could do something. Outside, the windmills of Rathole spun merrily. There was power, the power that lighted an air-conditioned Rathole, power in the air all around them. If he could only use it! But to turn the platform on his side and let the wind spin the propellers was pointless. He turned to Sanchez. Ask the men if there are any spare parts for the platform, he said. Some of those legs it stands on, transmission belts, spare propellers. Sanchez asked. Yes, he said, many spare parts but no fuel. Jan smiled a tight smile. Tell them to take the engines out, he said. Since we have no fuel, we may as well have no engines. Peter Heemskerk stood by the ramp to the stubby G-boat and checked his watch. It was X-15, minus fifteen, fifteen minutes before blast-off time. Heemskerk wore a space suit. Everything was ready, except climbing aboard, closing the airlock and pressing the firing pin. What on Venus could have happened to Van Artefelt? The last radio message they had received more than an hour ago had said he and the patient took off successfully in an aircraft. What sort of aircraft could he be flying that would require an hour to cover 80 kilometers with the wind? Heemskerk could only draw the conclusion that the aircraft had been wrecked somewhere in Denhorn. As a matter of fact, he knew that preparations were being made now to send a couple of ground cars out to search for it. This, of course, would be too late to help the patient Van Artfeld was bringing, but Heemskerk had no personal interest in the patient. His worry was all for his friend. The two of them had enjoyed chess and a good beer together on his last three trips to Venus, and Heemskerk hoped very sincerely that the big blond man wasn't hurt. He glanced at his watch again, X-12. In two minutes, it would be time for him to walk up the ramp into the G-boat. In seven minutes, the backward count before blast-off would start over the area loudspeakers. Heemskerk shook his head sadly, and Van Artfeld had promised to come back triumphant, with a broom at his masthead. It was a high, thin whine borne on the wind, carrying even through the walls of his space helmet, that attracted Heemskerk's attention and caused him to pause with his foot on the ramp. Around him, the rocket mechanics were staring up at the sky, trying to pinpoint the noise. Heemskerk looked westward. At first he could see nothing. Then there was a moving dot above the mountain, against the indigo umbrella of clouds. It grew, it swooped, it approached and became a strange little flying disc with two people standing on it, and something sticking up from its deck in front of them. A broom? No. The platform hovered and began to settle nearby, and there was Van Artfeld leaning over its rail and fiddling frantically with whatever it was that stuck up on it, a weird, angled contraption of pipes and belts topped by a whirling blade. A boy stood at his shoulder and tried to help him. As the platform descended to a few meters above ground, the Dutchman slashed at the contraption. The cut ends of belts whipped out wildly, and the platform slid to the ground with a rush. It hit with a clatter, and its two passengers tumbled prone to the ground. Jan, boomed Heemskerk, forcing his voice through the helmet diaphragm and rushing over to his friend. I was afraid you were lost. Jan struggled to his feet and leaned down to help the boy up. Here's your patient, Pieter, he said. Hope you have a spacesuit in his size. I can find one, and we'll have to hurry for blast-off. But first, what happened? Even that damn thing ought to get here from Rathole faster than that. Had no fuel, replied Jan briefly. My engines were all right, but I had no power to run them, so I had to pull the engines and rig up a power source. Heemskerk stared at the platform. On its railing was rigged a tripod of battered metal pipes atop which a big four-blade propeller spun slowly in what wind was left after it came over the western mountain. Over the edges of the platform, running from the two propellers in its base, hung a series of tattered transmission belts. Power source, repeated Heemskirk. That? Certainly, replied Jan with dignity. 
the power source any good Dutchman turns to in an emergency. A windmill. End of section 10「Section 11 of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. – Exile by H. B. Fife The Dome of Eyes made it almost impossible for Terence to reach the world of Tepoct. For those who did land there, there was no returning, only the bitterness of respect and justice. The Depoctan student, whose blue robe in George Kinton's opinion clashed with the dull purple of his scales, twiddled a three-clawed hand for attention. Kinton nodded to him from his place on the dais before the group. Then can you give us no precise count of the stars in the galaxy, George? Kinton smiled wryly and ran a wrinkled hand through his graying hair. In the clicking Depoctan speech, his name came out more like George. Questions like this had been put to him often during the ten years since his rocket had hurtled through the meteorite belt and down to the surface of Tepoc, leaving him the only survivor. Barred off as they were from venturing into space, the highly civilized Tepoctans constantly displayed the curiosity of dreamers in matters related to the universe. Because of the veil of meteorites and satellite fragments swirling about their planet, their astronomers had acquired torturous skills but only scraps of real knowledge. As I believe I mentioned in some of my recorded lectures, Kenton answered in their language, the number is actually as vast as it seems to those of you peering through the dome of eyes. The scientists of my race have not yet encountered any beings capable of estimating the total. He leaned back and scanned the faces of his interviewers, Faces that would have been oddly humanoid were it not for the elongated snouts and pointed, sharp-toothed jaws. The average Tepoctan was slightly under Kenton's height of five feet ten, with a long, supple trunk. Under the robes their scholars affected, the shortness of their two bowed legs was not obvious, but the sight of the short, thick arms carried high before their chests still left Kenton with a feeling of misproportion. He should be used to it after ten years, he thought, but even the reds or purples of the scales or the big teeth seemed more natural. I sympathize with your curiosity, he added. It's a marvel that your scientists have managed to measure the distance of so many stars. He could tell that they were pleased by his admiration, and wondered yet again why any little show of approval by him was so eagerly received. Even though he was the first stellar visitor in their recorded history, Kenton remained conscious of the fact that in many fields he was unable to offer the Tepoctans any new ideas. In one or two ways, he believed, no Terran could teach their experts anything. Then will you tell us, George, more about the problems of your first space explorers? Came another question. Before Kenton had formed his answer, the golden curtains at the rear of the austerly simple chamber parted. Claft, the Tepoctan, serving the current year as Kenton's chief aide, hurried toward the dais. The twenty-odd members of the group fell silent on their polished stone benches, turning their pointed visages to follow Claft's progress. The aide reached Kenton and bent to hiss and cluck into the latter's ear in what he presumably considered an undertone. The Terran laboriously spelled out the message inscribed on the limp, satiny paper held before his eyes. Then he rose and took one step toward the waiting group. "'I regret I shall have to conclude this discussion,' he announced. "'I am informed that another ship from space has reached the surface of Tepoc. My presence is requested in case the crew are of my own planet.' Claft excitedly skipped down to lead the way up the aisle, but Kenton hesitated. Those in the audience were scholars or officials to whom attendance at one of Kenton's limited number of personal lectures was awarded as an honor. They would hardly learn anything from him directly that was not available in recordings made over the course of years. The Tepoctan scientists, historians, and philosophers had respectfully but eagerly gathered every crumb of information Kenton knowingly had to offer, and some he thought he had forgotten. Still, he sensed the disappointment at his announcement. 
"'I shall arrange for you to await my return here in town,' Kenton said, and there were murmurs of pleasure. Later, aboard the jet helicopter that was basically like those Kenton remembered using on Terra twenty light years away, he shook his head at Claff's respectful protest. "'But, George, it was enough that they were present when you received the news. They can talk about that the rest of their lives.' You must not waste your strength on these people who come out of curiosity. Kenton smiled at his aide's earnest concern. Then he turned to look out the window as he recalled the shadow that underlay such remonstrances. He estimated he was about forty-eight now, as nearly as he could tell from the somewhat longer revolutions of Teapot. The time would come when he would age and die, whose wishes would then prevail. Maybe he was wrong, he thought. Maybe he shouldn't stand in the way of their biologists and surgeons. But he'd rather be buried, even if that left them with only what he could tell them about the human body. To help himself forget the rather preoccupied manner in which some of the Tepoctan scientists occasionally eyed him, he peered down at the big dam of the hydroelectric project being completed to Kenton's design. Power from this would soon light the town built to house the staff of scientists, students, and workers assigned to the Institute, organized about the person of Kenton. Now, there was an example of their willingness to repay him for whatever help he had been, he reflected. They hadn't needed that for themselves. In some ways, compared to those of Terra, the industries of Tepoc were underdeveloped, in the first place, the population was smaller and had different standards of luxury. In the second, a certain lack of drive resulted from the inability to break out into interplanetary space. Kenton had been inexplicably lucky to have reached the surface even in a battered hulk. The shell of the meteorites was at least a hundred miles thick and constantly shifting. We do not know if they have always been meteorites, the Tepoctans had told Kenton or whether part of them come from a destroyed satellite, but our observers have proven mathematically that no direct path through them may be predicted more than a very short while in advance. Kenton turned away from the window as he caught the glint of Teapock's son on the hull of the spaceship they also had built for him. Perhaps, would it be fair to encourage the newcomer to attempt the barrier? For ten years, Kenton had failed to work up any strong desire to try it. The Tepoctans called the ever-shifting lights of the dome eyes after a myth in which each tiny satellite bright enough to be visible was supposed to watch over a single individual on the surface. Like their brothers on Terra, the native astronomers could trace their science back to a form of astrology and Kenton often told them jokingly that he felt no urge to risk a physical encounter with his own personal eye. The helicopter started to descend, and Kenton remembered that the city named in his message was only about twenty miles from his home. The brief twilight of Teapot was passing by the time he set foot on the landing field, and he paused to look up. The brighter stars visible from this part of the planet twinkled back at him, and he knew that each was being scrutinized by some amateur or professional astronomer. Before an hour had elapsed, most of them would be obscured by the tiny moonlets, some of which could already be seen. These could easily be mistaken for stars or the other five planets of the system, but in a short while the tinier ones in groups would cause a celestial haze resembling a miniature Milky Way. Claft, who had descended first, leaving the pilot to bring up the rear, noticed Kenton's pause. "'Glory glitters till it is known for a curse,' he remarked, quoting a Tepoctan proverb often applied by the disgruntled scientist to the Dome of Eyes. Kenton observed, however, that his aide also stared upward for a long moment. The Tepoctans loved speculating about the unsolvable." They had even found clubs to argue whether two satellites had been destroyed or only one. Half a dozen officials hastened up to escort the party to the vehicle awaiting Kenton. Claft succeeded in quieting the lesser members of the delegation, so that Kenton was able to learn a few facts about the new arrival. The crash had been several hundred miles away, 
but someone had thought of the hospital in this city which was known to have a doctor rating as an expert in human physiology. The survivor, only one occupant of the wreck, alive or dead, had been discovered, had accordingly been flown here. With a clanging of bells, the little convoy of ground cars drew up in front of the hospital. A way was made through the chittering crowd around the entrance, Within a few minutes, Kenton found himself looking down at a pallet upon which lay another Terran. A man, he thought, then curled a lip wryly at the sudden, unexpected pang of disappointment. Well, he hadn't realized until then what he was really hoping for. The spaceman had been cleaned up and bandaged by the native medicos. Kenton saw that his left thigh was probably broken. Other dressings suggested cracked ribs and lacerations on the head and shoulders. The man was dark-haired but pale of skin, with a jutting chin and a nose that had been flattened in some earlier mishap. The flaring set of his ears somehow emphasized an overall leanness. Even in sleep, his mouth was thin and hard. Thrown across the controls after his belt broke loose, Kenton guessed. "'I bow to your wisdom, George,' said the plump, Tepoctan doctor who appeared to be in charge. Kenton could not remember him, but everyone on the planet addressed the Terran by the sound they fondly thought to be his first name. "'This is Dr. Chuxelkey,' murmured Claft. Kenton made the accepted gesture of greeting with one hand and said, "'You seem to have treated him very expertly.' Chuxelkey ruffled the scales around his neck with pleasure." I have studied Terran physiology, he admitted complacently. From your records and drawings, of course, George, for I have not yet had the good fortune to visit you. We must arrange a visit soon, said Kenton. Claft will. He broke off at the sound from the patient. A Terran, mumbled the injured man. He shook his head dazedly, tried to sit up, and subsided with a groan. Why, he looked scared when he saw me, thought Kenton. "'You're all right now,' he said soothingly. "'It's all over, and you're in good hands. "'I gather there were no other survivors of the crash.' "'The man stared curiously. "'Kenton realized that his own language sputtered clumsily from his lips after ten years. "'He tried again. "'My name is George Kenton. "'I don't blame you if I'm hard to understand. "'You see, I've been here ten years without ever having another Terran to speak to.' The spaceman considered that for a few breaths, then seemed to relax. Al Birkin, he introduced himself laconically. Ten years? A little over, confirmed Kenton. It's extremely unusual that anything gets through to the surface, let alone a spaceship. What happened to you? Birkin's stare was suspicious. Then you ain't heard about the new colonies. Nah, you must have come here when all the planets were open. We had a small settlement on the second planet, Kenton told him. You mean there are new Terran colonies? Yeah, jet hoppers spreading all over the other five. None of the land-hungry poops figured a way to set down here, though, or they'd be creeping around this planet, too. How did you happen to do it? Run out of fuel? The other eyed him for a few seconds before dropping his gaze. Kenton was struck with sudden doubt. The outposts of civilization were followed by less desirable developments as a general rule, prisons, for instance. He resolved to be wary of the visitor. You might say I was exploring, Birkin replied at last. That's why I come alone. Didn't want anybody else hurt if I didn't make it. Say, how bad am I banged up? Kitten realized guiltily that the man should be resting. He had lost track of the moments he had wasted in talk while the others with him stood attentively about. He questioned the doctor briefly and relayed the information that Birkin's leg was broken, but that the other injuries were not serious. They'll fix you up, he assured the spaceman. They're quite good at it, even if the sight of one does not make you think a little of an iguana. Rest up now, and I'll come back again when you're feeling better. For the next three weeks, Kenton flew back and forth from his own town nearly every day. He felt that he should not neglect the few meetings which were the only way he could repay the Tepoctans for all they did for him. On the other hand, 
the chance to see and talk with one of his own kind drew him like a magnet to the hospital. The doctors operated upon Birkin's leg, inserting a metal rod inside the bone by a method they had known before Kenton described it. The new arrival expected to be able to walk, with care, almost any day, although the pin would have to be removed after the bone had healed. Meanwhile, Birkin seemed eager to learn all Kenton could tell him about the planet, Teapot. About himself, he was remarkably reticent. Kenton worried about this. I think we should not expect too much of this Terran, he warned Claft uneasily. You, too, have citizens who do not always obey your laws, who sometimes, that is, who are born to die under the axe, as we say, interrupted Claft, as if to ease the concern plain on Kenton's face. In other words, criminals. You suspect this Alberkin is such a one, George? It is not impossible, admitted Kenton unhappily. He will tell me little about himself. It may be that he was caught in Teapock's gravity while fleeing from justice. To himself, he wished he had not told Birkin about the spaceship. He didn't think the man exactly believed his explanation of why there was no use taking off in it. Yet he continued to spend as much time as he could visiting the other man. Then, as his helicopter landed at the city port one gray dawn, the news reached him. The other Terran has gone, Claft reported, turning from the breathless messenger as Kenton followed him from the machine. Gone? Where'd they take him? Claft looked uneasy, embarrassed. Kenton repeated his question, wondering about the group of armed police on hand. In the night, Claft hissed and clucked when none would think to watch him. They tell me, and quite rightly, I think. Get on with it, Claft, please. In the night, then, Alberkin left the chamber in which he lay. He can walk some now, you know, because of Dr. Chuxelkey's metal pin. He, he stole a ground car and is gone. He did? Kenton had an empty feeling in the pit of his stomach. Is it known where he went? I mean... He has been curious to see some of Teapot. Perhaps he stopped, his own words braying in his ears. Claft was clicking two claws together, a sign of emphatic disagreement. Al Birkin, he said, was soon followed by three police constables in another vehicle. They found him heading in the direction of our town. Why did he say he was traveling that way? asked Kenton, thinking to himself of the spaceship. Was the man crazy? He did not say, answered Claft expressionlessly. Taking them by surprise, he killed two of the constables and injured the third before fleeing with one of their spears. Clinton felt his eyes bulging with dismay. Yes, for they carried only the short spears of their authority, not expecting to need fire weapons. Kenton looked from him to the messenger, noticing for the first time that the latter was an under-officer of police. He shook his head distractedly. It appeared that his suspicions concerning Birkin had been only too accurate. Why was it one like him who got through, he asked himself in silent anguish. After ten years, the Tabachtans had been thinking well of Terrans, but now... He did not worry about his own position. That was well enough established whether or not he could again hold up his head before the purple-scaled people who had been so generous to him. Even if they had been aroused to a rage by the killing, Kenton told himself he would not have been concerned about himself. He had reached a fairly ripe age for a spaceman. In fact, he had already enjoyed a decade of borrowed time. But they were more civilized than that wanton murderer, he realized. He straightened up, "'forcing back his early morning weariness. "'We must get into the air immediately,' he told Claft. "'Perhaps we may see him before he reaches.' "'He broke off at the word spaceship, "'but he noticed a reserved expression on Claft's pointed face. "'His aide had probably reached a conclusion similar to his own. "'They climbed back into the cabin "'and Claft gave brisk orders to the lean young pilot.' A moment later, Kenton saw the ground outside drop away. 
Only upon turning around did he realize that two armed Tepoctans had materialized in time to follow Claft inside. One was a constable, but the other he recognized for an officer of some rank. Both wore slung across their chests weapons resembling long-barreled pistols with large, oddly indented butts to fit Tepoctan claws. The constable, in addition, carried a contraption with a quadruple tube for launching tiny rockets, no thicker than Kinton's thumb. These, he knew, were loaded with an explosive worthy of respect on any planet he had heard of. To protect him, he wondered, or to get Birkin. The pilot headed the craft back toward Kinton's town in the brightening sky of early day. Long before the buildings of Kinton's Institute came into view, they received a radio message about Birkin. He has just been seen on the road passing the dam, Claft reported soberly after having been called to the pilot's compartment. He stopped to demand fuel from some maintenance workers, but they had been warned and fled. Couldn't they have seized him? demanded Kenton, his tone sharp with the worry he endeavored to control. He has that spear, I suppose, but he is only one and injured. Claft hesitated. Well, couldn't they? The aide looked away, out one of the windows at some sun-dyed clouds ranging from pink to orange. He grimaced and clicked his showy teeth uncomfortably. Perhaps they thought you might be offended, George, he answered at last. Kenton settled back in the seat especially padded to fit the contours of his Terran body, and stared silently at the partition behind the pilot. In other words, he thought, he was responsible for Birkin, who was a Terran, one of his own kind. Maybe they really didn't want to risk hurting his feelings, but that was only part of it. They were leaving it up to him to handle what they considered his private affair. He wondered what to do. He had no actual faith in the idea that Birkin was delirious, or acting under any influence but that of a criminally self-centered nature. I shouldn't have told him about the ship, Kenton muttered, gnawing the knuckle of his left thumb. He's on the run, all right. Probably scared the colonial authorities will trail him right down through the dome eyes. Wonder what he did. He caught himself and looked around to see if he had been overheard. Claft and the police officers peered from their respective windows in calculated withdrawal. Kenton, disturbed, tried to remember whether he had spoken in Terran or Tepoctan. Would Birkin listen if he tried reasoning, he asked himself. Maybe if he showed the man how they had proved the unpredictability of the openings through the shifting dome of eyes. An exclamation from the constable drew his attention. He rose, and room was made for him at the opposite window. In the distance, beyond the town landing field they were now approaching, Kenton saw a halted ground car. Across the plain, which was colored a yellowish tan by short, grass-like growth, a lone figure plodded toward the upthrust bulk of the spaceship that had never flown. "'Never mind landing at the town,' snapped Kenton. "'Go directly out to the ship.' Claft relayed the command to the pilot. The helicopter swept a descending curve across the plain toward the gleaming hull. As they passed the man below, Birkin looked up. He continued to limp along at a brisk pace with the aid of what looked like a short spear. "'Go down,' Kinton ordered. The pilot landed about a hundred yards from the spaceship. By the time his passengers had alighted, however, Birkin had drawn level with them, about fifty feet away. "'Birkin!' shouted Kenton. "'Where do you think you're going?' Seeing that no one ran after him, Birkin slowed his pace, but kept walking toward the ship. He watched them over his shoulder. "'Sorry, Kenton,' he shouted with no noticeable tone of regret. "'I figure I better travel on for my health.' "'It's not so damn healthy up there,' called Kenton. "'I told you how there's no clear path.' "'Yeah, yeah, you told me. "'That don't mean I gotta believe it. "'Wait, don't you think they tried sending unmanned rockets up? "'Everyone was struck and exploded.' "'Birkin showed no more change of expression "'than if the other had commented on the weather. "'Kenton had stepped forward six or eight paces, "'irritated despite his anxiety "'at the way Birkin persisted in drifting before him. 
Kenton couldn't just grab him, bad leg or not. He could probably break the older man in two. He glanced back at the Tapoctans beside the helicopter, Claft, the pilot, the officer, the constable with the rocket weapon. They stood silently looking back at him. The call for help that had arisen to his lips died there. Not their party, he muttered. He turned again to Birkin, who still retreated toward the ship. But he'll only get himself killed and destroy the ship. Or if some miracle gets him through, that's worse. He's nothing to turn loose on a civilized colony again. A twinge of shame tugged down the corners of his mouth as he realized that keeping Birkin here would expose a highly cultured people to an unscrupulous criminal who had already committed murder the very first time he had been crossed. Birkin, he shouted, for the last time, do you want me to send them to drag you back here? Birkin stopped at that. He regarded the motionless Tepoctans with a derisive sneer. They don't look too eager to me, he taunted. Kenton growled a Tepoctan expression, the meaning of which he had deduced after hearing it used by the dam workers. He whirled to run toward the helicopter. Hardly had he taken two steps, however, when he saw startled changes in the carefully blank looks of his escort. The constable half raised his heavy weapon, and Claft sprang forward with a hissing cry. By the time Kenton's aging muscles obeyed his impulse to sidestep, the spear had already hurtled past. It had missed him by an error of over six feet. He felt his face flushing with sudden anger. Birkin was running as best he could toward the spaceship, and had covered nearly half the distance. Kenton ran at the Topotkins, brushing aside the concerned Claft. He snatched the heavy weapon from the surprised constable. He turned and raised it to his chest. Because of the shortness of Tepotkin arms, the launcher was constructed so that the butt rested against the chest with the siding loops before the eyes. The little rocket tubes were above head height to prevent the handlers catching the blast. The circles of the sights weaved and danced about the running figure. Kitten realized to his surprise that the effort of seizing the weapon had him panting. Or was it the fright at having a spear thrown at him? He decided that Birkin had not come close enough for that, and wondered if he was afraid of his own impending action. It wasn't fear, he complained to himself. The poor slob only had a spear, and a man couldn't blame him for wanting to get back to his own sort. He was limping, hurt. How could they expect him to realize? Then, abruptly, his lips tightened to a thin line. The sight steadied on Birkin as the ladder approached the foot of the ladders leading to the entrance port of the spaceship. Kenton pressed the firing stud. Across the hundred-yard space streaked four flaring little projectiles. Kenton, without exactly seeing each, was aware of the general lines of flight diverging gradually to bracket the figure of Birkin. One struck the ground beside the man just as he set one foot on the bottom rung of the ladder— and skittered away past one fin of the ship before exploding. The others burst against the hull, scattering metal fragments. Another puffed on the upright of the ladder just above Birkin's head. The spaceman was thrown back from the ladder. He balanced on his heels for a moment with outstretched fingers reaching toward the grips from which they had been torn. Then he crumpled into a limp huddle on the yellowing turf. Clinton sighed. The constable took the weapon from him, reloaded deftly, and proffered it again. When the Terran had not reached for it, the officer held out a claw hand to receive it. He gestured silently, and the constable trotted across the intervening ground to bend over Birkin. "'He is dead,' said Claft, when the constable straightened up with a curt wave. "'Will—will will you have someone see to him, please?' Kenton requested, turning toward the helicopter." "'Yes, George,' said Claft. "'George?' "'Well?' "'It would be very instructive. "'That is, I believe Dr. Shuxelke would like to—' "'All right,' yielded Kenton, "'surprised at the harshness of his own voice. "'Just tell him not to bring around "'any sketches of the various organs for a few months.' "'He climbed into the helicopter and slumped into his seat. "'Presently he was aware of Claft "'edging into the seat across the aisle.' 
He looked up. The police will stay until cars from town arrive. They are coming now, said his aide. Kenton stared at his hands, wondering at the fact that they were not shaking. He felt dejected, empty, not like a man who had just been at a high pitch of excitement. Why did you not let him go, George? What? Why? Why, he would have destroyed this ship you worked so hard to build. There is no safe path through the dome of eyes. No predictable path, Claft corrected. But what then? We should have built you another ship, George, for it was you who showed us how. Kenton flexed his finger slowly. He was just so good. You know the murder he did here. We can only guess what he did among my own, among Terran's. Should he have a chance to go back and commit more crimes? I understand, George, the logic of it, said Claft. I meant, it's not my place to say this, but you seem unhappy. Possibly, grunted Kenton Riley. We too have criminals, said the aide, as gently as was possible in his clicking language. We do not think it necessary to grieve for the pain they bring upon themselves. No, I suppose not, sighed Kenton. I, it's just... He looked up at the pointed visage, at the strange eyes regarding him sympathetically from beneath the sloping, purple-scaled forehead. It's just that now I'm lonely, again, he said. End of section 11「Section 12 of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Outbreak of Peace by H. B. Fife When properly conducted, a diplomatic mission can turn the most smashing of battle successes into a fabulous Peric victory. It was a great pity. Space Marshal Wilbur Hennings reflected, as he gazed through the one-way glass of the balcony door, that the local citizens had insisted upon decorating the square before their capital with the hulk of the first spaceship ever to have landed on Pollux V. A hundred and fifty years probably seemed impressive to them, amid the explosive spread of Terran colonies and federations. Actually, in the Marshal's opinion, it was merely long enough to reveal such symbols as more than antiquated but less than historically precious. "'I presume you have a plan to have me march past that heap,' he complained, tugging at the extremely historical sword that completed the effect of his dazzling white and gold uniform. Commodore Miller, his aide, stiffened nervously. "'Around to the right of it, sir,' he gestured. As you see, the local military are already keeping the route clear of onlookers. We thought it would be most impressive if your party were to descend the outer stairway from the palace balcony here, to heighten the importance of, to draw out the pomp and circumstance of opening the conference? Well, sir, and then across the square to the conference hall of the Capitol, outside which you will pause for a few gracious words to the crowd." and that will probably be my last opportunity to enjoy the morning sunlight. Oh, well, it seems much too bright here in any case. The Commodore absently reached out to adjust a fold in his chief's sky-blue sash, and the Marshal as absently parried the gesture. I shall be hardly less than half an hour crossing the square, he predicted sourly. With the cheering throngs they have undoubtedly arranged, and the sunlight reflecting from all that imitation marble, it will be no place to collect one's thoughts. He turned back to the huge chamber constituting the office of the suite supplied him by his Paluxian hosts. The skeleton staff of men and women remaining occupied chairs and benches along only one wall, since the bulk of the delegation had been sent out to make themselves popular with the local populace. Hennings presumed the bulk of the local populace to be consisted of Paluxians, assigned to making themselves popular with his Ursan Federation delegation. His people would be listening politely to myriad reasons why the Paluxians had a natural right to occupy all the star systems from here to Castor, a dozen light years farther from Terra. No one would mention the true motive— their illogical choice in naming themselves the Twin Empire. Well now, he said crisply, 
once more over the main points of the situation. No, Commodore, not the schedule of experts that will accompany me to the table. I rely upon you to have perfected that. But have there been any unforeseen developments in the actual fighting? A cluster of aides, mostly in uniform, but including a few in discreetly elegant civilian attire, moved forward. Each one was somehow followed within arm's reach by an aide of his own, so that the advance presented overtones of a small sortie. Hennings first nodded to the first, a youngish man whose air suggested technical competence more than the assurance of great authority. The officer placed his briefcase upon the glistening surface of a large table and touched a switch on the flap. "'It's as well to be sure, sir,' the Commodore approved." Our men have been unable to detect any devices, but the walls may have ears. They won't scan through this scrambler, sir, asserted the young officer. Hennings accepted a seat at the table and looked up to one of the others. Myrelli Starr, an older officer, reported briskly. The same situation prevails, with both sides having landed surface troops in force upon Myrelli II, Myrelli III, and Myrelli V the fourth planet being inhabited by a partly civilized, non-human race protected under the Terran Convention. Recent engagements? No, sir. Maneuvering continues, but actual encounters have declined in frequency. Casualties are modest and evenly matched. General Nielsen on Myrelli III continues to receive Paluxian agents seeking his defection. I never thought to ask, murmured Hennings. Is he really a distant connection of the Paluxian Nielsen family? It is improbable, sir, but they are polite enough to accept the pretense. Of course, he rejects every offer in a very high-minded manner and seems to be making an adequate impression of chivalry. He stepped back at Hanning's nod to be replaced by another officer. One minor space skirmish in the Agoki system to report, sir. The admiral in command appears to have recouped after the error of two days ago, when that Paluxian detachment was so badly mauled. He arranged the capture of three of our cruisers. Was that not a trifle rash? demanded Hennings. Intelligence is inclined to think not, sir. The ships were armed only with weapons listed as general knowledge items. The crews were not only trained in prisoner-of-war tactics, but also well supplied with small luxuries. The Paluxian fleet in that system is known to have been in space for several months, so a friendly effect is anticipated. Hennings considered the condensed report proffered for his perusal. He noted that the Paluxians had been quite gentlemanly about notifying Ursan headquarters of the capture and of the complete lack of casualties. He also saw that while the message was ostensibly directed to the Federation flagship, it had been beamed in such a fashion as to be conveniently intercepted by the secret Ursan Federation headquarters on Agoki 7. That was a bit rude of them, he commented. We have never dragged their secrets into the open. On the other hand, sir, the Commodore suggested, it may be an almost sophisticated method of permitting us to enjoy our superior finesse. I am just as pleased to have the reminder, said Hennings. It will serve to alert us all the more when we sit down with them over there. An elegant civilian, a large man with patient, drooping features, stated that nothing had occurred to change the economic situation. Another reported that unofficial channels of information were holding up as well as could be expected. A uniformed officer summarized the battle situation in two more star systems. Those are positions we actually desire to hold, are they not? Hennings asked. Is action to be taken there? Plans call for local civilian riots at the height of the conference, sir. But can we lay no groundwork sooner than that? Sometime in the foreseeable future, at least. Take it up with propaganda. Blauvelt. It seems to me that the briefing mentioned an indigenous race on one of these planets. Blauvelt dropped his eyes momentarily, equivalent in that gathering to a blush of intense embarrassment. Hennings coughed apologetically. Well, now, 
I should not pry into arrangements I must later be able to deny convincingly with a clear conscience. I can only plead, my dear Blavelt, the tenseness of the past several days. The officer murmured inaudibly, fumbled with his papers, and edged to the rear rank. Someone, at Commodore Miller's fluttering, obtained a vacuum jug of ice water and a glass for the marshal, but Hennings chose instead to produce a long cigar from a pocket concealed beneath his resplendent collection of medals. My apologies to all of you, he said thoughtfully. I fear that any of you who may expect contact with the local population had better see Dr. Ibn Talal about the hypnosis necessary to counteract my little indiscretion. And now, what remains? Nothing but the prisoner exchange, sir, Commodore Miller announced after collecting the eyes of the principal officers. Hennings got his cigar going. He listened to confirmation of a previous report that had massive exchange of sick and wounded prisoners had been accomplished, and learned that the Ursons now suspected that they had accepted unknowingly about as many secret agents as they had sent the Paluxians. Oh, well, he sighed, as long as the amenities were preserved. We must be as friendly as possible about that sort of thing, or run the risk of antagonizing them. Seeing that the Commodore was tense with impatience, the Marshal rose to his feet. An aide deftly received the cigar for disposal, and the party drifted expectantly toward the balcony doors. From among that part of the staff which would remain to man headquarters, an officer was dispatched to alert the Paluxian honor guard. One more touch before the die is cast, thought the Marshal, as two young officers opened the balcony doors to admit the blare of trumpets. Chairs rolled successively across the square, rising like distant waves from somewhere beneath the gigantic banner that draped the capital opposite with fiery letters spelling out Peace Conference. With a dramatic gesture, Hennings held up the sheaf of reports they had just reviewed. Smiles disappeared in response to his own serious mien. So much for the hostiles, he snapped. He tossed the reports to the officer who would remain in charge. Now for the actual war. Pivoting on his heel, he led them smartly out to the ornate balcony stairway that curved down into the sea of cheering Paluxians. End of section 12《Section 13 of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A World by the Tail by Seton McKettrick This is about the best-hated author on earth, who was necessarily pampered and petted because of his crime against humanity. Exactly three minutes after the Galactic left the New York apartment of Professor John Hamish MacLeod, Ph.D., S.C.D., a squad of UBI men pushed their way into it. MacLeod heard the door chime, opened the door, and had to back up as eight men crowded in. The one in the lead flashed a fancily engraved I.D. card and said, Union Bureau of Investigation, your Professor MacLeod. It was a statement, not a question. No, MacLeod, said flatly, I am not. I've never heard of such a name. He waited while the UBI man blinked once, then added, If you're looking for Professor MacLeod, I'm he. It always irritated him when people mispronounced his name, and in this case there was no excuse for it. All right, Professor MacLeod, said the UBI agent, pronouncing it properly this time. However you want it. Mind if we ask you a few questions? McLeod stared at him for half a second. Eight men, all of them under thirty-five, in top physical condition. He was fifteen years older and the oldest and had confined his exercise, in the words of Chauncey Depew, to acting as a pallbearer for my friends who take exercise. Not that he was really in poor shape, but he certainly couldn't have argued with eight men like these. Come in, he said calmly, waving them into the apartment. Six of them entered, the other two stayed outside in the hall. Five of the six remained standing. The leader took the chair that MacLeod offered him. 
"'What are your questions, Mr. Jackson?' McLeod asked. Jackson looked very slightly surprised, as if he were not used to having people read the name on his card during the short time he allowed them to see it. The expression vanished almost instantaneously. "'Professor,' he said, "'we'd like to know what subjects you discussed with the Galactic who just left.' McLeod allowed himself to relax back in his chair. "'Let me ask you two questions, Mr. Jackson. One, what the hell business is it of yours? Two, why do you ask me when you already know?' Again there was only a flicker of expression over Jackson's face. "'Professor McLeod, we are concerned about the welfare of the human race. Your, uh, cooperation is requested.' "'You don't have to come barging in here with an armed squad just to ask my cooperation,' McLeod said. "'What do you want to know?' Jackson took a notebook out of his jacket pocket. "'We'll just get a few facts straight first, Professor,' he said, leafing through the notebook. "'You were first approached by a galactic four years ago, on January 12, 1990. Is that right?' McLeod, who had taken a cigarette from his pack and started to light it, stopped suddenly and looked at Jackson as though the UBI man were a two-headed embryo. "'Yes, Mr. Jackson, that is right,' he said slowly, as though he were speaking to a low-grade moron. "'And the capital of California is Sacramento. Are there any further matters of public knowledge you would like to ask me about? Would you like to know when the War of 1812 started, or who was buried in Grant's tomb?' Jackson's jaw muscles tightened, then relaxed. There's no need to get sarcastic, Professor. Just answer the questions. He looked back at the notebook. According to the record, you, as a zoologist, were asked to accompany a shipment of animals to a planet named, uh, Galakin. You did so. You returned after 18 months. Is that correct? To the best of my knowledge, yes, McLeod said, with heavy, biting sarcasm and the date of the Norman Conquest was A.D. 1066. Jackson balled his fist suddenly and closed his eyes. McLeod, stop it! He was obviously holding himself under rigorous restraint. He opened his eyes. There are reasons for asking these questions, Professor. Very good reasons. Will you let me finish? McLeod had finished lighting his cigarette. He snapped his lighter off and replaced it in his pocket. "'Perhaps,' he said mildly, "'may I make a statement first? Jackson took a deep breath, held it for a moment, then exhaled slowly. "'Go ahead.' "'Thank you.' There was no sarcasm in McLeod's voice now, only patience. First, for the record, I'll say that I consider it impertinent of you to come in here, demanding information without explanation. "'No, Jackson, don't say anything.' You said I could make a statement. Thank you. Second, I will state that I'm perfectly aware of why the questions are being asked. No reaction, Mr. Jackson? You don't believe that? Very well. Let me continue. On January 12, 1990, I was offered a job by certain citizens of the Galactic Civilization. These citizens of the Galactic Civilization wanted to take a shipload of terrestrial animals to their own planet, Galakian. They knew almost nothing about the care and feeding of terrestrial animals. They needed an expert. They should have taken a real expert, one of the men from the Bronx Zoo, for instance. They didn't. They requested a zoologist. Because the request was made here in America, I was the one who was picked. Any one of seven other men could have handled the job, but I was picked. So I went, thus becoming the first Earthman ever to leave the solar system. I took care of the animals. I taught the Galactics who were with me to handle and feed them. I did what I was paid to do, and it was a hard job. None of them knew anything about the care and feeding of elephants, horses, giraffes, cats, dogs, eagles, or any one of the other hundred of terrestrial life forms that went aboard that ship. All of this was done with the express permission of the Terrestrial Union government. I was returned to Earth on July 17, 1991. I was immediately taken to UBI headquarters and subjected to rigorous questioning. Then I was subjected to further questioning while connected to a polyelectroencephalograph. 
then i was subjected to hearing the same questions over again while under the influence of various drugs in sequence and in combination the consensus at that time was that i was not lying nor had i been subjected to what is commonly known as brainwashing my memories were accurate and complete i did not know then nor do i know now the location of the planet galatkin this information was not denied me by the galactics i simply could not understand the terms they used all i can say now and all i could say then is that Galakian is some 3.5 kiloparsecs from Sol in the general direction of Sagittarius. You don't know any more about that now than you did then, Jackson interrupted, suddenly and quickly. That's what I said, McLeod snapped, and that's what I mean. Let me finish. I was handsomely paid for my work in galactic money. They use the English word credit but I'm not sure the English word has exactly the same meaning as the galactic term. At any rate, my wages, if such I may call them, were confiscated by the Earth government. I was given the equivalent in American dollars, after 80% income tax had been deducted. I ended up with just about what I would have made if I had stayed home and drawn my salary from Columbia University and the American Museum of Natural History. Please, Mr. Jackson... I only have a little more to say. I decided to write a book in order to make the trip pay off. Interstellar Arc was a popularized account of the trip that made me quite a nice piece of change because every literate and half-literate person on Earth is curious about the Galactics. The book tells everything I know about the trip and the people. It is a matter of public record. Since that is so, I refuse to answer a lot of darn fool questions by which I mean that I refuse to answer any more questions that you already know the answers to. I'm not being stubborn. I'm just sick and tired of the whole thing. Actually, the notoriety that had resulted from the trip and the book had not pleased McLeod particularly. He had never had any strong desire for fame, but if it had come as a result of his work in zoology and the related sciences, he would have accepted the burden. If his The Ecology of Martian Polar Regions had attracted a hundredth of the publicity and sold a hundredth of the number of copies that Interstellar Arc had sold, he would have been gratified indeed. But the way things stood, he found the whole affair irksome. Jackson looked at his notebook as if he expected to see answers written there instead of questions. He looked back up at McLeod. All right then, Professor. What about this afternoon's conference? That isn't a matter of public record. And technically, it isn't any of your business either, McLeod said tiredly. But since you have the whole conversation down on tape, I don't see why you bother asking me. I'm well aware that you can pick up conversations in my apartment. Jackson pursed his lips and glanced at another of the agents, who raised his eyebrows slightly. McLeod got it, in spite of the fact that they didn't intend him to. His place was bugged, all right, but somehow the Galactic had managed to nullify their instruments. No wonder they were in such a tizzy. McLeod smiled, pleased with himself and with the world for the first time that afternoon. He decided, however, that he'd better volunteer the information before they threatened him with the Planetary Security Act. That threat would make him angry, he knew, and he might say something that would get him in real trouble. It was all right to badger Jackson up to a certain point, but it would be foolish to go beyond that. However, he went on with hardly a break. Since, as you say, it is not a matter of public record, I'm perfectly willing to answer any questions you care to ask. Just give us a general rundown of the conversation, Jackson said. If I have any questions, I'll uh, ask them at the proper time. McLeod did the best he could to give a clear picture of what the Galactic had wanted. There was really very little to it. The Galactic was a member of a race that McLeod had never seen before. A humanoid with red skin, fire engine, not a merry Indian, and rather a pleasant-looking face, in contrast to the rather crocodilian features of the Galactic resident. 
He had introduced himself by an unpronounceable name, and then had explained that since the name meant mild or merciful in one of the ancient tongues of his planet, it would be perfectly all right if MacLeod called him Clement. Within minutes it had been Clem and Mac. MacLeod could see that Jackson didn't quite believe that. Galactics of whatever race were aloof, polite, reserved, and sometimes irritatingly patronizing. Never buddy-buddy. MacLeod couldn't help what Jackson might think. What was important was that it was true. What Clem wanted was very simple. Clem was, after a manner of speaking, a literary agent. Apparently, the galactic system of book publishing didn't quite work the way the terrestrial system did. Clem took his commission from the publisher instead of the author, but was considered a representative of the author, not the publisher. McLeod hadn't quite understood how that sort of thing would work out, but he let it pass. There were a lot of things he didn't understand about galactics. All Clem wanted was to act as McLeod's agent for the publication of Interstellar Arc. And what did you tell him? Jackson asked. I told him I'd think it over. Jackson leaned forward. How much money did he offer? He asked eagerly. Not much, McLeod said. That's why I told him I'd think it over. He said that, considering the high cost of transportation, relaying, translation, and so on, he couldn't offer me more than one thousandth of the one percent royalties. Jackson blinked. One what? One thousandth of one percent. If the book sells a hundred thousand copies as a credit copy, they will send me a nice, juicy check for one lousy credit. Jackson scowled. They're cheating you. Clem said it was the standard rate for a first book. Jackson shook his head. Just because we don't have interstellar ships and are confined to our own solar system, they treat us as though we were ignorant savages. They're cheating you high, wide, and handsome. Maybe, said MacLeod, but if they really wanted to cheat me, they could just pirate the book. There wouldn't be a thing I could do about it. Yeah, but to keep up their facade of high ethics, they toss us a sop, and we have to take whatever they hand out. You will take it, of course. It was more of an order than a question. I told him I'd think it over, MacLeod said. Jackson stood up. Professor MacLeod, the human race needs every galactic credit it can lay its hands on. It's your duty to accept the offer, no matter how lousy it is. We have no choice in the matter. And a galactic credit is worth ten dollars American, four pounds UK, or forty rubles Soviet. If you sell a hundred thousand copies of your book, you can get yourself a meal in a fairly good restaurant, and Earth will have one more galactic credit stashed away. If you don't sell that many, you aren't out anything. I suppose not, MacLeod said slowly. He knew that the government could force him to take the offer. Under the Planetary Security Act, the government had broad powers, very broad. Well, that isn't my business right now, Jackson said. I just wanted to find out what this was all about. You'll hear from us, Professor MacLeod. I don't doubt it, said MacLeod. The six men filed out the door. Alone, MacLeod stared at the wall and thought. Earth needed every galactic credit it could get, that was certain. The trouble came in getting them. The Earth had absolutely nothing that the galactics wanted. Well, not absolutely, maybe, but so near as made no difference. Certainly there was no basis for trade. As far as the galactics were concerned, the Earth was a little backwater planet that was of no importance. Nothing manufactured on the planet was of any use to galactics. Nothing grown on Earth was of any commercial importance. They had sampled the animals and plants for scientific purposes, but there was no real commercial value in them. The government had added a few credits to its meager collection when the animals had been taken, but the amount was small. MacLeod thought about the natives of New Guinea and decided that on the galactic scale, Earth was about in the same position. Except that there had at least been gold in New Guinea. The galactics didn't have any interest in Earth's minerals. 
the elements were much more easily available in the asteroid belts that nearly every planetary system seemed to have. The galactics were by no means interested in bringing civilization to the barbarians of Earth either. They had no missionaries to bring new religion, no do-gooders to elevate the cultural level of the natives. They had no free handouts for anyone. If Earthmen wanted anything from them, the terms were cash on the barrel head. Earth's credit rating in the galactic equivalent of Dun and Bradstreet was triple Z, zero. A galactic Earth ship had, so to speak, stumbled over Earth fifteen years before. Like the English explorers of the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries, the galactics seemed to feel that it was necessary to install one of their own people on a newfound planet, but they were not in the least interested in colonization, nor in taking over Earth's government. The galactic resident was not in any case a royal governor, and could hardly even be called an ambassador. He and his staff, a small one, kept more for company than for any necessary work, lived quietly by themselves in a house they'd built in Hawaii. Nobody knew what they did, and it didn't seem wise to ask. The first galactic resident had been shot and killed by some religious nut. Less than twenty-four hours later, the Galactic Space Navy, if that was the proper term, had come to claim the body. They came in a spaceship that was easily visible to the naked eye long before it hit the atmosphere, a sphere three kilometers in diameter. The missiles with the thermonuclear warheads that were sent up to intercept the ship were detonated long before they touched the ship, and neither Galactics nor Earthmen ever mentioned them again. It had been the most frightening display of power ever seen on Earth, and the Galactics hadn't even threatened anyone. They just came to get a body. Needless to say, there was little danger that they would ever have to repeat the performance. The national governments of Earth had organized themselves hurriedly into the Terrestrial Union. Shaky at first, it had gained stability and power over the years. The first thing the Union government had wanted to do was to send an ambassador to the Galactic government. The Galactic resident had politely explained that their concept of government was different from ours, that ambassadors had no place in that concept, and anyway, there was no capital to send one to. However, if Earth wanted to send an observer of some kind, Earth did. Fine. A statement of passenger fares was forthcoming, naturally. There was no regular passenger ship stopping at Earth, and there would not be in the foreseeable future, but doubtless arrangements could be made to charter a vessel. It would be expensive, but... If a New Guinea savage wants to take a passage aboard a Qantas airliner, what is the fare in cowrie shells? As far as MacLeod knew, his book was the first thing ever produced on Earth that the Galactics were even remotely interested in. He had a higher opinion of the ethics of the Galactics than Jackson did, but a thousandth of a percent seemed like pretty small royalties. And he couldn't for the life of him see why this book would interest a Galactic. Clem had explained that it gave Galactics a chance to see what they looked like through the eyes of an Earthman, but that seemed rather weak to MacLeod. Nevertheless, he knew he would take Clem's offer. Eight months later, a shipload of galactic tourists arrived. For a while, it looked as though Earth's credit problem might be solved. Tourism has always been a fine method for getting money from other countries, especially if one's own country is properly picturesque. Tourists always had money, didn't they? And they spent it freely, didn't they? No, not in this case. Earth had nothing to sell to the tourists. Ever hear of baylets? The Malaysians of the South Pacific consider it a very fine delicacy. You take a fertilized duck egg and you bury it in the warm earth. Six months later, when it's nice and overripe, you dig it up again, knock off the top of the shell the way you would a soft-boiled egg, and eat it. Then you pick the pin feathers out of your teeth. Baylets. Now you know how the greatest delicacies of Earth restaurants affected the Galactics. Earth was just a little too picturesque. The tourists enjoyed the sights, but they ate aboard their ship, which was evidently somewhat like a Caribbean cruise ship. And they bought nothing. They just looked. 
and laugh. And, of course, they all wanted to meet Professor John Hemish MacLeod. When the news leaked out and was thoroughly understood by Earth's population, there was an immediate reaction. Editorial in Pravda The stupid book written by the American J. H. MacLeod has made Earth a laughing stock throughout the galaxy. His inability to comprehend the finer nuances of galactic socialism has made all Earthmen look foolish. It is too bad that a competent Russian zoologist was not chosen for the trip that MacLeod made, a man properly trained in the understanding of the historical forces of dialectic materialism would have realized that any galactic society must of necessity be a communist state, and would have interpreted it as such. The petty bourgeois mind of MacLeod has made it impossible for any Earthman to hold up his head in the free socialist society of the galaxy. Until this matter is corrected. News from Manchester Guardian Professor James H. MacLeod, the American zoologist whose book has apparently aroused a great deal of hilarity in galactic circles, admitted today that both Columbia University and the American Museum of Natural History have accepted his resignation. The recent statement by a university spokesman that Professor MacLeod had besmirched the honor of Earthmen everywhere was considered at least partially responsible for the resignations. See Editorial. Editorial Manchester Guardian It is a truism that an accepted wit has only to say, pass the butter, and everyone will laugh. Professor MacLeod, however, far from being an accepted wit, seems rather to be in the position of a medieval court fool, who is laughed at rather than with. As a consequence, all Earthmen have been branded as fools. Statement made by the American Senator from Alabama He has made us all look like jackasses in the eyes of the Galactics, and at this precarious time in human history, it is my considered opinion that such actions are treasonous to the human race and to Earth, and should be treated and considered as such. Book Review Literary Checklist Helvar III Borneus Cluster Interstellar Arc An Earthman's View of the Galaxy Translated from the Original Tongue by Vonus Delph, circa 5.00 this inexpensive little book is one of the most highly entertainingly funny publications in current print. The author, one John MacLeod, is a member of a Type 3-7b race inhabiting a planet in the outer fringes. As an example of the unwitting humor of the book, we have only to quote the following. I was shown to my quarters shortly before takeoff. Captain Benarly had assigned me a spacious cabin which was almost luxurious in its furnishings. The bed was one of the most comfortable I have ever slept in. Or the following. I found the members of the crew to be friendly and cooperative, especially Nern Kronzel, the ship's physician. It is our prediction that this little gem will be enjoyed for a long time to come, and will be a real money-maker for its publishers. They haven't hanged me yet, MacLeod thought. He sat in his apartment alone and realized that it would take very little effort to get him hanged. How could one book have aroused such wrath? Even as he thought it, MacLeod knew the answer to that question. It wasn't the book. No one who had read it in two and a half years before had said anything against it. No, it wasn't the book. It was the galactic reaction to the book. Already feeling inferior because of the standoffish attitude of the beings from the stars, the Homeric laughter of those same beings had been too much. It would have been bad enough if that laughter had been generated by one of the Galactics. To have it generated by an Earthman made it that much worse. Against an Earthman, their rage was far from impotent. Nobody understood why the book was funny, of course. The joke was over their heads, and that made human beings even angrier. He remembered a quotation from a book he had read once. A member of some tribal taboo culture, African or South Pacific, he forgot which, had been treated at a missionary hospital for something or other and had described his experience. The white witch doctor protects himself by wearing a little round mirror on his head which reflects back the evil spirits. 
Could that savage have possibly understood what was humorous about that remark? No, not even if you explain to him why the doctor used the mirror that way. Now what? thought MacLeod. He was out of a job and his bank account was running low. His credit rating had dropped to zero. MacLeod heard a key turn in the lock. The door swung open and Jackson entered with his squad of UBI men. Hey, said MacLeod, jumping to his feet. What do you think this is? Shut up, MacLeod, Jackson growled. Get your coat. You're wanted at headquarters. MacLeod started to say something, then thought better of it. There was nothing he could say. Nobody would care if the UBI manhandled him. Nobody would protest that his rights were being ignored. If MacLeod got his teeth knocked in, Jackson would probably be voted a medal. MacLeod didn't say another word. He followed orders. He got his coat and was taken down to the big building on the East River, which had begun its career as the United Nations building. He was bundled up to an office and shoved into a chair. Somebody shoved a paper at him. Sign this. What is it? McLeod asked, finding his voice. A receipt. For two thousand dollars. Sign it. McLeod looked the paper over, then looked up at the burly man who had shoved it at him. Fifty thousand galactic credits? What's this for? The royalty check for your unprintably qualified book has come in, funny man. The government is taking ninety-eight percent for income taxes. Sign. McLeod pushed the paper back across the desk. No, I won't. You can confiscate my money. I can't stop that, I guess. But I won't give it legal sanction by signing anything. I don't even see the two thousand dollars this is supposed to be a receipt for. Jackson, who was standing behind McLeod, grabbed his arm and twisted. Sign! His voice was a snarl in McLeod's ear. Eventually, of course, he signed. No beer, Mac? asked the bartender with a friendly smile. Yeah, Leo, thanks. McLeod pushed his quarter across the bar with one hand and scratched negligently at his beard with the fingers of the other. Nobody questioned him in this neighborhood. The beard, which had taken two months to grow, disguised his face, and he had given his name as McCaffrey, allowing his landlord and others who heard it to make the natural assumption that he was of Irish descent. He was waiting. He had been forced to move from his apartment. Nobody wanted that dirty so-and-so, Professor MacLeod, around. Besides, his money was running short. He had never seen the two thousand. You'll get that when the Galactic Bank cashes your royalty check, he had been told. He was waiting. Not hiding, no, that was impossible. The UBI could find him easily when they wanted him. There was no place he could have hidden from them for very long. A man needs friends to stay hidden from an efficient police organization for very long, and John Hamish MacLeod had no friends. Jack McCaffrey had since he was a pleasant kind of fellow who made friends easily when he wanted them. But he had no illusions about his new friends. Let them once suspect, however faintly, that good old Jack McCaffrey was really the Professor MacLeod, and the game would be up. The UBI would find him again all right, whenever it wanted him. And MacLeod hoped it would be soon, because he was down to his last hundred bucks. So he waited and thought about 50,000 galactic credits. The mathematics was simple, but it conveyed an awful lot of information. To make 50,000 credits from one thousandth of one percent royalties on a book selling at five credits the copy, one must need sell a billion copies. Nothing to it. Five times minus ten to the minus fifth power equals five point ten to the fourth power. Ergo, X equals ten to the ninth power. McLeod drew the equation on the bar with the tip of a wet forefinger, then rubbed them out quickly. A billion copies in the first year. He should have seen it. He should have understood. How many planets were there in the galaxy? How many people on each planet? Communication, even at ultralight velocities, would be necessarily slow. The galaxy was just too big to be compassed by the human mind, or even by the mind of a galactic, MacLeod suspected. How do you publish a book for galactic, 
for galaxy-wide consumption. How long does it take to saturate the market on each planet? How long does it take to spread the book from planet to planet? How many people were there on each planet who would buy a good book? Or, at least, an entertaining one? McLeod didn't know, but he suspected that the number was huge. McLeod was a zoologist, not an astronomer. But he had read enough on astronomy to know that the estimated number of Earth-type planets alone, according to the latest theory, ran into the tens of millions or hundreds of millions. The... A man sat down on the stool next to McLeod and said something loud enough and foul enough to break the zoologist's train of thought. Give me a shot, Leo, he added in an angry voice. Sure, Pete, the bartender said. What's the trouble? Taurus, Pete said with a snarl. Laughing at us all the time, like we was monkeys in a zoo. Bunch em come in today. He downed his whiskey with a practiced flip of the wrist and slammed it down on the bar. Leo refilled it immediately. I shouldn't gripe, I guess. Got a half a credit off him. He slapped down a five-dollar bill as though it had somehow been contaminated. The bar became oddly quiet. Everyone had heard Pete. Further, everyone had heard another shipload of galactics had landed and were at the moment enjoying the sights of New York. A few of them knew that Pete was the bell captain in one of the big midtown hotels. McLeod listened while Pete expounded on the shame he had to undergo to earn half a credit, a lousy five bucks. McLeod did some estimating. Tourists, the word had acquired an even more pejorative sense than it had before, and now applied only to galactics, bought nothing, but they tipped for services, unless the services weren't wanted or needed. Pete had given them information that they hadn't had before, where to find a particular place. All in all, the group of fifteen galactics had given out five or six credits in such tips. Say half a credit apiece. There were, perhaps, a hundred galactics in this shipload. That meant fifty credits. Hmm. They didn't need anyone to carry their bags. They didn't need anyone to register them in hotels. They didn't need personal service of that kind. All they wanted to do was look. But they wouldn't pay for looking. They had no interest in Broadway plays or the acts in the nightclubs. At least, not enough to induce them to pay to see them. This particular group had wanted to see a hotel. They had wandered through it, looking at everything and laughing to fit to kill at the carpets on the floor and the electric lighting and such. But when the management had hinted that payment for such services as letting them look should be forthcoming, they had handed half a credit to someone and walked out. Then they had gone to the corner of 51st and Madison and looked for nothing. Fifty credits for a shipload. Three shiploads per year. Hell, give them the benefit of the doubt and say ten shiploads a year. In a hundred years, they'd add another fifty thousand to Earth's resources. McLeod grinned and waited. They came for him eventually, as McLeod had always known they would. But they came long before he had expected. He had given them six months at the least. They came for him at the end of the third month. It was Jackson, of course. It would have to be Jackson. He walked into the cheap little room McLeod had rented, followed by his squad of men. He tossed a peculiar envelope on the bed next to McLeod. A letter came for you, humorist. Open it. McLeod sat on the edge of the bed and read the letter. The envelope had already been opened, which surprised him none. It looked very much like an ordinary business letter, except that whatever they used for paper was whiter and tougher than the paper he used. He was reminded of the time he had seen a reproduction of a 13th century manuscript alongside the original. The copy had been set up in a specially designed type and printed on fine paper. The original had been handwritten on vellum. McLeod had the feeling that if he used a microscope on this letter, the lines and edges would be just as precise and clear as they appeared to the naked eye, instead of the fuzziness that ordinary print would show. The way you could tell a synthetic ruby from a natural ruby is to look for flaws. The synthetic doesn't have any. This letter was a galactic imitation of a Terran business letter. It said, 
Dear Mac, I am happy to report that your book, Interstellar Arc, is a smash hit. It looks as though it is on its way to becoming a bestseller. As you already know by your royalty statement, over a billion copies were sold the first year. That indicates even better sales over the years to come as the reputation of the book spreads. Naturally, our advertising campaign will remain behind it all the way. Congratulations. Speaking of royalty checks, there seems to be some sort of irregularity about yours. I am sorry, but according to regulations, the check must be validated in the presence of your galactic resident before it can be cashed. Your signature across the back of it doesn't mean anything to our bankers. Just go to your galactic resident and he'll be happy to take care of the matter for you. That's what he's there for. The next check should come through very shortly. All the best, Clem. Better and better, McLeod thought. He hadn't expected to be able to do anything until his next royalty check arrived. But now... He looked up at Jackson. All right, what's next? Come with us. We're flying to Hawaii. Get your hat and coat. McLeod obeyed silently. At the moment, there was nothing else he could do. As a matter of fact, there was nothing he wanted to do more. It was no trouble at all for Professor McLeod to get an audience with the Galactic Resident. But when he was escorted in by Jackson and his squad, the whole group was halted inside the front door. The resident, a tall, lean being with a leathery gray face that somehow managed to look crocodilian in spite of the fact that his head was definitely humanoid in shape, peered at them from beneath pronounced supraorbital ridges. Is this man under arrest? he asked in a gravelly baritone. Er, no, said Jackson. No, he's merely in protective custody. He has not been convicted of any crime? No, sir, Jackson said. His voice sounded as though it were unsure of himself. That is well, said the resident. A convicted criminal cannot, of course, use the credits of society until he has become rehabilitated. He paused. But why protective custody? There are those, said Jackson, choosing his words with care, who feel that Professor McLeod has brought disgrace upon the human race, or the terrestrial race. There is reason to believe that his life may be in danger. McLeod smiled wryly. What Jackson said was true, but it was carefully calculated to mislead. I see, said the resident. It would appear to me that it would be simpler to inform the people that he has done no such thing. That indeed, his work has conferred immense benefits upon your race. But that is your own affair. At any rate, he is in no danger here. He didn't need to say anything else. Jackson knew the hint was an order and that he wouldn't get any farther with his squad. McLeod spoke up. Subject to your permission, sir, I would like to have Mr. Jackson with me. The galactic resident smiled. Of course, Professor. Come in, both of you. He turned and led the way through the inner door. Nobody bothered to search either of them, not even though they must know that Jackson was carrying a gun. McLeod was fairly certain that the gun would be useless to Jackson if he tried to assert his authority with it. If Clem had been able to render the UBI's eavesdropping apparatus inoperable, it was highly probable that the galactic resident would have some means of taking care of weapons. There are only a few formalities to go through, the resident said pleasantly, indicating chairs with a gesture. The room he had led them to didn't look much different from that which would be expected in any tastefully furnished apartment in New York or Honolulu. McLeod and Jackson sat down in a couple of comfortable easy chairs, while the resident went around a large desk and sat down in a swivel chair behind it. He smiled a little and looked at McLeod. Hmm. Ah, yes. Very good. It was as though he had received information of some kind on an unknown subject through an unknown channel, McLeod thought. Evidently that was true, for his next words were, You are not under the influence of drugs or hypnotic compulsion, I see. Excellent, Professor. Is it your desire that this check be converted to cash? He made a small gesture. You have only to express it, you see. It would be difficult to explain it to you, but rest assured that such an expression of will, while you are seated in that chair, 
is impressed upon the structure of the check itself and is the equivalent of a signature. Except, of course, that it is unforgeable. May I ask a few questions first? McLeod said. Certainly, Professor. I am here to answer your questions. The money. Is it free and clear? Or are there galactic taxes to pay? If the galactic residents had had eyebrows, it is likely that they would have lifted in surprise. My dear Professor, aside from the fact that we run our government in an entirely different manner, we would consider it quite immoral to take what a man earns without giving services of an exact kind. I will charge you five credits for this validation, since I am rendering a service. The bank will take a full tenth of a percent in this case because of the inconvenience of shipping cash over that long distance. The rest is yours to do with as you see fit. Fifty-five credits out of fifty-five thousand, McLeod thought. Not bad at all. Aloud, he asked, could I, for instance, open a bank account or buy a ticket on a starship? Why not? As I said, it's your money. You have earned it honestly. You may spend it honestly. Jackson was staring at McLeod, but he said nothing. Tell me, sir, McLeod said, how does the success of my book compare with the successes of most books in the galaxy? Quite favorably, I understand, said the resident. The usual income from a successful book is about 5,000 credits a year. Some run even less than that. I'm not too familiar with the publishing business, you understand, but that is my impression. You are, by galactic standards, a very wealthy man, Professor. Fifty thousand a year is by no means a median income. Fifty thousand a year? Yes, about that. I understand that in the publishing business one can depend on a life income that does not vary much from the initial period. If a book is successful in one area of the galaxy, it will be equally successful in others. How long does it take to saturate the market? McLeod asked with a touch of awe. Saturate the... Oh, I see. Yes, well, let's see. Most publishing houses can't handle the advertising and marketing on more than a thousand planets at once. The job becomes too unwieldy. That would indicate that you sold an average of a million copies per planet, which is unusual but not uh, miraculous. That is why you can depend on future sales, you see. Over a thousand planets, the differences in planetary tastes averages out. Now, if your publishers continue to expand the publication at the rate of a thousand planets a year, your book should easily last for another century. They can't really expand that rapidly, of course, since the sales on the planets they have already covered will continue with diminishing success over the next several years. Actually, your publishers will continue to put a billion books a year on the market and expand to new planets at a rate that will balance the loss of sales on the planets where it has already run its course. Yes, Professor, you will have good income for life. What about my heirs? Heirs? The galactic resident blinked. I'm afraid I don't quite follow you. My relatives. Anyone who will inherit my property after my death. The resident still looked puzzled. What about them? How long can they go on collecting? When does the copyright run out? The galactic resident's puzzlement vanished. Oh, my dear professor, surely you see that it is impossible to, er, inherit money one hasn't earned. The income stops with your death. Your children or your wife have done nothing to earn the money. Why should it continue to be paid out after the earner has died? If you wish to make provisions for such persons during your lifetime, that is your business, but the provisions must be made out of money you have already earned. Who does get the income, then? McLeod asked. The galactic resident looked thoughtful. Well, the best I can explain to you without going into arduous detail is to say that our government gets it. Government is not really the proper word in this context since we have no government as you think of it. Let us merely say that such monies pass into a common exchequer from which, or public servants like myself, are paid. McLeod had a vision of a British crown officer trying to explain to a New Guinea tribesman what he meant when he said that taxes go to the crown. The tribesman would probably wonder why the chief of the English tribe kept cowrie shells under his hat. I see, 
"'And if I am imprisoned for crime?' he asked. "'The payments are suspended until the rehabilitation is complete. "'That is, until you are legally released. "'Is there anything else that can stop the payments?' "'Not unless the publishing company fails, which is highly unlikely. "'Of course, a man under hypnotic compulsion or drugs is not considered legally responsible.' so he cannot transact any legal business while he is in that state, but the checks are merely held for him until that impediment is removed. I see, McLeod nodded. He knew perfectly well that he no more understood the entire workings of the galactic civilization than that New Guinea tribesmen understood the civilization of Great Britain, but he also knew that he understood more of it than Jackson, for instance, did. MacLeod had been able to foresee a little of what the resident had said. "'Would you do me the service, sir,' MacLeod said, "'of opening a bank account for me in some local bank?' "'Yes, of course. "'As resident, I am empowered to transact business for you at your request. "'My fees are quite reasonable. "'All checks will have to go through me, of course. "'But, um, I think in this case a twentieth of a percent would be appropriate.' you'll be handling fairly large amounts. If that is your wish, I shall so arrange it. Hey, Jackson found his tongue. The Earth Union government has a claim on that. McLeod owes 49,000 galactic credits in income taxes. If the galactic resident was shocked at the intimation that the galactic government would take earned money from a man, the announcement that Earth's government did so was no surprise to him at all. If that is so, I am certain that Professor MacLeod will behave as a law-abiding citizen. He can authorize a check for that amount, and it will be honored by his bank. We have no desire to interfere with local customs. I am certain that I can come to an equitable arrangement with the Earth authorities, said MacLeod, rising from his chair. Is there anything I have to sign, or... No, no, you have expressed your will. Thank you, Professor MacLeod. It is a pleasure to do business with you. Thank you. The pleasure is mutual. Come on, Jackson. We don't need to bother the resident any more just now. But, come on, I said. I want a few words with you, MacLeod insisted. Jackson sensed that there would be no point in arguing any further with the resident, but he followed MacLeod out into the bright Hawaiian sunshine with a dull glow of anger burning his cheeks. Accompanied by the squad, they climbed into the car and left. As soon as they were well away from the residence, Jackson grabbed MacLeod by the lapel of his jacket. All right, humorist. What was the idea of that? Are you trying to make things hard for yourself? No, but you are, MacLeod said in a cold voice. Get your hands off me. I may get you fired anyway, just because you're a louse. But if you keep acting like this, I'll see that they toss you into solitary and toss the key away. What are you talking about? But he released his hold. Just think about it, Jackson. The government can't get its hands on that money unless I permit it. As I said, we'll arrive at an equitable arrangement, and that will be a damn sight less than 98% of my earnings, believe me. If you refuse to pay, we'll... He stopped suddenly. Throw me in jail? McLeod shook his head. You can't get money while I'm in jail. We'll wait, said Jackson firmly. After a little while in a cell, you'll listen to reason and we'll sign those checks. You don't think very well, do you, Jackson? To sign a check, I have to go to the galactic resident. As soon as you take me to him, I authorize a check to buy me a ticket for some nice planet where there are no income taxes. Jackson opened his mouth and shut it again, frowning. Think about it, Jackson, McLeod continued. Nobody can get that money from me without my consent. Now it so happens that I want to help Earth. I have a certain perverse fondness for the human race, even though it is inconceivably backward by galactic standards. We have about as much chance of ever becoming of any importance on a galactic scale as the Australian Aborigine has of becoming important in world politics, but a few thousand years of evolution may bring out a few individuals who have the ability to do something. I'm not sure, but I'm damned if I'll let the boneheads run all over me while they take my money. I happen to be, at the moment, and through sheer luck, 
Earth's only natural resources as far as the galaxy is concerned. Sure, you can put me in jail. You can kill me if you want. But that won't give you the money. I am the goose that lays the golden eggs. But I'm not such a goose that I'm going to let you boot me in the tail while you steal the gold. Earth has no other source of income. None. Tourists are few and far between, and they spend almost nothing. As long as I am alive, and in good health and out of prison, Earth will have a nice steady income of 50,000 galactic credits a year. Earth, I said, not the government, except indirectly. I intend to see that my money isn't confiscated. He had a few other plans, too, but he saw no necessity of mentioning them to Jackson. If I don't like the way the government behaves, I'll simply shut off the source of supply. Understand, Jackson? Mm-hmm, said Jackson. He understood. He didn't like it. And he didn't know what to do about it. One of the first things we're going to do is start a little information flowing, McLeod said. I don't care to live on a planet where everybody hates my guts. So, as the resident suggested, we're going to have to start a propaganda campaign to counteract the one that denounced me. For that, I'll want to talk to someone a little higher in the government. You'd better take me to the head of the UBI. He'll know who I should speak to for that purpose. Jackson still looked dazed, but it had evidently penetrated that McLeod had the upper hand. What, uh, what did you say, sir? He asked, partially out of coming out of his daze. McLeod sighed. Take me to your leader, he said patiently. End of section 13